adventures in time and space, told in future tense. Dimension X. Can you predict the future? Can you tell what will happen in a hundred years? Or in ten? Or in the next minute? Can you look beyond the known dimensions of time and space? Into the unknown, dimension X. Tonight we have a strange story to tell. A sweet, blood-curdling little story that is really only two sentences long. The last man on earth sat alone in a room. There was a knock on the door. (laughs) Think it over. Suppose you were the last man alive on Earth. In the universe, for that matter. The last man sitting alone in a room. And suddenly, there was a knock on the door. What knocked on the door? You wonder, don't you? Your mind, faced with the unknown, supplies something vaguely horrible. But it isn't horrible, really. You'll see. The last man on Earth sat alone in a room. There was a knock on the door. Hmm? What? Oh, what's that? Good morning, man. What? What? Who are you? You have regained consciousness. Well, who are you? I am Azan. Maybe if I close my eyes, it'll go away. I will not go away, man. No, no, I, I guess I am awake. Who? What are you? I am Azan. Well, what's that? Azan is intelligent life. Well, I don't... What happened? Where are you from? From planet seven in the third galaxy in the fourth quadrant. Where? It is not necessary to repeat information which is correct in the original statement. Planet 7? You mean I'm not on Earth? You are still on your planet. Well, then what are you doing here? The Zans have annexed your world. You mean you've conquered Earth? Yes, that is correct. We will now prepare your planet for habitation by the Zan. How about the people? There is no longer any use for large numbers of lower life forms. Therefore, we have dispensed with them. Dispensed with... You mean you've... When did all this happen? Two days ago. You have been unconscious until now. You really mean I'm the last man on Earth? That is correct. Identify yourself now. Uh, What? Kindly provide data as to your position in the elementary social order of your planet. Oh, oh, uh... Well, I'm Walter Phelan... Associate Professor of Anthropology at Nathan University. How how is it you speak English? We have deciphered your written and recorded records. It is not difficult to reconstruct your language. Very type of auditory communication. Oh. Is there anything you want to complete your natural habitat? You mean I'm a prisoner? That is correct. What will you want further in your room? Well, do I have to stay here? Yes. The rest of my life? Forever. Then you better bring in my books, uh, uh... I gotta call you something. Do you, do you mind if I call you, uh, George? It is immaterial. All right then, George. You know, I, I can't really believe this. That is a characteristic of low life form. I'm trying to take this in without going off balance completely. I will be back, Associate Professor of Anthropology. It's all right, George. Just call me Walter. Very well, Walter. I will be back with your books. All right, George. I'll be seeing you around. You will not be around, Walter. You will be here. Yes, the last man on Earth sat alone in a room. A rather peculiar room. He just noticed how peculiar it was. And he'd been studying out the reason for its peculiarity. His conclusion didn't horrify him, but it annoyed him. There was a knock on the door. Come in. Oh, hello, George. Hello, Walter. What can I do for you? Point one, you will please henceforth sit with your chair pointed the other way. I thought so. 
That plain wall is different from the other sides, isn't it? That is correct. It is transparent. That's what I thought. I'm in a zoo. Right? That is correct. I knew it. And if I persist in sitting with my back to it, what then? You'll kill me, I ask, hopefully? No, we will not kill you. It's too bad. George, face the bars and perform for the people. I, I mean for the Zahns. How many other animals do you have here in the zoo, George? 216, a male and female each of 108 kinds. Male and female of... of all the animals? There is a female of your species among the collection. Anyone I know? Never mind, it doesn't matter anyway. Well, George, you started out with point one. I suppose there's a point two kicking around somewhere. What is it? Something we do not understand. Two of the other animals sleep and do not wake. They are cold. What is wrong with them, Walter? Well, they must be dead. Dead? That means stopped. But nothing stopped them. Each was alone. Sure, they, 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 they just died. But I have told you they were alone. Nothing stopped them. George, do you mean to tell me that you don't know what natural death is? Death is when a being is killed, stopped from living. Maybe these animals just died of old age. Old age. I do not understand. George, how old are you? Your planet went around the sun about 7,000 times since I was born. 7,000 years? Yes, I'm still young. Now look, George, you've got something to learn about this planet you've hijacked. Here on Earth, we, we've got somebody that's a stranger where you come from. Down here, our people and animals live until the Grim Reaper stops them. This uh, Grim Reaper stopped the two animals? That's right. He will stop more? Oh, he gets us all, George. This is a new factor we have not considered. But you can consider it. Because when the Grim Reaper gets through, there won't be very much left of your zoo. You mean he will stop more animals soon? Well, with your lifespan, it won't seem like a minute. We'll all be gone. Oh, it looks like you made a mistake, George. I don't think there's very much you can do about it. That is not correct. The Zahn is a logical being. We will take action. <laughs> taking me, George. We will be there shortly. You mean, uh, it's moving day? That is correct. We are here now. You will live here now, Walter. It is a larger room. Well, be it ever so humble. Go inside. Uh, be careful with those books, George. Don't, don't lose... Excuse me. Who are you? What are you doing here? Well, I guess George didn't explain. George tries to be polite, but he hasn't quite caught on yet. I'm Walter Phelan. My name is Grace Evans, Mr. Phelan. What is all this about? Why did they bring me here? I think I know why. Why? You see, I, I, I've been talking to George. George? Well, that's what I call them, all of them. There's no way to tell them apart anyway. There aren't many of them here yet. They come from outside the solar system, sort of a... Sort of an advanced scouting party. Yes, I saw their spaceship. It's as big as a mountain. They're moving in on us. They cleaned off the Earth with some kind of vibration that destroys all sorts of animal life. They killed everybody. Oh, no. I was afraid. Well, the cheerful note is that you and I and 200-odd other animals were picked up beforehand as specimens for the zoo. You know that this is a zoo, don't you? Yes. I suspected it. But I don't remember anything about being captured. I just woke up here. Well, they solved a lot of problems for us. Housing shortages. Wars. I don't suppose the human race, you and I, that is, have to worry about anything now. It's awful. Only they made one mistake. They overestimated us. I don't understand. They thought we were immortal. That we were what? Immortal, like they are. Oh, they can, they can be killed. But the Zans don't know what natural death is. They didn't know anyway until they lost two of us yesterday. You mean there are more than two of us? No, no, no more of our species. The, the, these were merely brother animals. A rabbit and a canary. And by the Zans' way of figuring time, the rest of us are only good for a few minutes apiece anyway. That's a joke on them. They figured they had permanent specimens here in their zoo. But didn't they know that we'd all die eventually? No, I don't think so. 
See, George told me he was 7,000 years old and he's supposed to be young. When they learned how quickly we die, well, they were probably shocked to the core. If they have cause. How can you talk that way about it? Academic detachment. I learned it at faculty tees. At any rate, they've decided to reorganize their zoo. Two by two. Oh. Sure, they figure we'll last longer collectively, if not individually. But if they think... That is, if you think for one minute... No, no, don't, don't, don't worry. I don't. But are they going to keep us locked up together in this one little room? I'm afraid so. It's horrible. I agree with you perfectly, my dear. But all personal considerations aside, the least favor we can do the human race is to let it end with us. I don't see much point in continuing it just for an exhibition in a zoo. How can you just sit here and and lecture? Have it, have it. But we've got to do something. Why? I don't know. It, it just seems we owe it to the human race to do something. You got a suggestion? There must be some way. They can be killed, you said. I think that anything that would kill one of us would kill one of them. You see, I, 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 I figured it out, I think. George cut his... Well, I suppose you'd call it his hand when he brought in my books. It started to bleed, red blood, but I could see the cut closing just as he stood there. And by the time he left, it was healed. I don't understand. Don't you see, whatever factor there is in man that makes him grow old is missing in the Zahn. They just go on and on and on until... Well, until they're stopped. Yes. Yeah. But suppose we... killed one. There must be some way. Well, but what would be the use? They wouldn't even punish us. They'd just give us our food through a trap door and put a sign out saying, Beware of the man. Dangerous. I don't think they'd have to bother in your case. Hmm. <laughs> I don't see anything funny. I'm sorry. <laughs> Just reminds me of Martha. Martha? My wife. She died two years ago. I'm sorry. No. Not at all. Oh, that'll be George with my books. Come in. Hello, George. Hello, Walter. Point one, I have brought your books. Point one, hmm? Well, what else is on your mind? Point two, another creature sleeps and will not wake. A small feathered one called a duck. It happens, George, I warned you, old man death, the grim reaper, I told you all about him. Walter, the Council of Zahn has met. It has been decided logically that the only intelligent life to escape the vibration is you. Therefore, the logical conclusion is you are stopping these animals by some means unknown to us. George, you're off your trolley. You will tell me now how this is done. You boys are afraid you're going to lose the whole zoo? It is necessary to save the remaining specimens as long as possible. If we do not get information, we may be forced to dispense with your species entirely. Now, wait a minute. This means you, Walter, and the female. Now, wait a minute, George. Don't go off half-cocked. Let me take a look at these animals that won't wake up. I will take you there now. Go first, Walter. After you, my dear George. This is the weasel. You should have got him in the winter, George. The fur's worth more then. Then it's an ermine. This is the reptile cage. Here are the ducks. This is the male. The female has been stopped. <laughs> Lucky girl. What's the matter, fellow? You lonely down there? Walter, you will tell me how you stopped the female duck. You got me, George. I didn't do it. Maybe she died of the Dutch elm blight. Walter, you are not being logical. We have concluded you are stopping these animals. Tell us how it is done. I told you, George, I haven't the foggiest notion. Very well. We will have to take further action. Well, what are you going to do, George? We have methods of action you will know soon. We will go back now to your room. What happened, Mr. Phelan? You can call me Walter. After all, George does, and... We have more in common. Oh, please, what happened? Just a duck, a dead duck. George thinks I killed her by remote control. He thinks I'm holding out on him. Good. What? Well, at least we can get back at them. At least we can do something to them. Well, why? After all, George isn't a bad fellow. If you like an ant, 
mentality. How can you say that? They've wiped out the whole human race. They've murdered everybody. I suppose they have, but we can't change that now, so why think about it? Well, we can't just sit here and do nothing. I fail to see how we can do anything else. Oh, of all the men in the world they had to pick, don't you want to fight back? Don't you want to keep on fighting until the end? It hadn't occurred to me. But we've got to, Walter. Why? Well, I, 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 I can't really explain, but... Walter, if there was any good in man at all, it was that he kept on struggling against nature and in the end even against himself. But at least he, he kept on fighting for what he thought was right and, and we're all that's left. Walter, we just can't, can't end it by, by giving up. We've got to keep on fighting. You, know, you do remind me of Martha. Oh, look, there isn't much left for us, but we could beat them in this one small thing. We can pretend that there's a secret about death, and we could refuse to tell them anything. But there isn't anything to tell. Well, they don't know that. Promise me you won't give in. I suppose the worst they can do is to kill us. Oh, Walter. All right, Miss Evans. Hello, George. Hello, Walter. Now, you will tell us how these animals are stopped? George, this may come as a great shock to you. But I've decided not to tell you. Why? Well, call it a romantic attachment to lost causes. My grandfather was a Confederate officer. Walter, you are not being logical. But that is expected in lower life forms. You will come with me now, Walter. Where are you taking him? To the second level. Come now, Walter. You won't tell them. I can't guarantee anything, but as of now, I don't intend to. We've got to fight. Remember that, Walter. We've got to go out fighting. I think you're right. Come now, Walter. Goodbye. It's been a pleasure, Sevens. I am waiting. Come now, Walter. After you, my dear George. Tell us now, Walter. That was the first level of vibration. There are many more. However, we have calculated that none of them exceed your threshold of unconsciousness. Oh, very clever, George. Of course. You will tell us now, how do you stop these animals? You will tell us now? As of now, no. However, I'm not very brave if that encourages you, George. You are not being logical, Walter. You're telling me. We will now use vibration level two. You will tell us now? You know, George, I can't figure it out myself, but I'm stubborn. Maybe it has something to do about the dignity of man, the civilization such as it was that you wiped out. I do not understand. I didn't think you would. So go ahead. Vibrate. Vibration level two. It will be very painful, Walter. <laughs> Walter? Walter? You are still conscious. Let me alone, George. You will tell us now. You will tell us how you stop the animals. Let me alone. We have had vibration levels one through ten. There are still fifteen more before your threshold of unconsciousness. No, 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 let me alone. Walter, listen to me. Another creature sleeps and will not wake. We must know now. That's tough. You better start vibrating again, George. No. What? It would not be logical. We have calculated that no further level of vibration will overcome your irrational psychological block. We conclude you will not tell. You mean you're going to let me go? That is correct. That's real nice of you, George. I, uh, I appreciate it. We have calculated that the resistance of the female of your species will be lower. We will now place her under the vibrations. Oh, no, no, George, you can't do that. Why not, Walter? It is the logical plan. No, 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 she, she couldn't take it. Yes, that is what we expect. Therefore, we will go and bring the woman here. No, now listen to me, George. There is no secret. Do you understand that? There's no secret. Those animals died from natural causes. And I'm telling you the truth. That is not a logical answer. We will get the woman. Well, I've told you the truth. Can't you understand? We must know now. The female animal caged next to the duck has been stopped. We must preserve the survivor. The animal next to the duck? We will bring the woman here. She will tell us after the vibration. No, no, listen, George. George, do you want... You want the truth? You want to know how to save the mates of the animals that have been stopped? You will tell us now? Yes, yes, I'll tell you. Take me to that stopped animal. 
And I'll tell you how to save its mate. Very well, Walter. You are being logical now. We will go. Walter, are you all right? Yeah, just, just, just let me catch my breath a minute. What happened? Well, after a while, I told them what they wanted to know. You didn't? Sure, as George pointed out, it seemed to be the logical thing at the time. You gave up? I suppose you can call it that. Look, I'm, I'm, I'm buried. Yes. Uh, something might turn up, Martha. But, it, but they've beaten us completely, then. There isn't anything we can do except of the human race. And we give up. We don't even die fighting. Uh, you call me? Hmm? Oh, I must have said Martha. I, I, I'm sorry. The Council of the Zan has met. Something wrong? Uh, she, she was my wife. She died two years ago. What were you saying? Nothing. Nothing. It doesn't matter. It's too late. It's too late. The whole... What now, George? Zan has been stopped. What? Zan is dead? That is correct. You didn't believe me, George. But you can die. You can really die. You'll have to get used to that if you're going to stay here. The council has decided. A, you have in some way stopped this Zan. B, you and the woman must be eliminated. Oh, uh, you got it wrong, George. I didn't stop that Zan. It's just death. It gets all of us here. You will be eliminated now. But, George, it won't do any good to kill us. It won't save you. Everything that lives on Earth must die. That is not logical. But it's true. The council has decided. This time, you will have the full vibration. This time? Walter, what did they do to you? They have a rather effective third degree. They tortured you, Walter? Yes, yes. And I... Walter, it was all my fault. I wouldn't even have tried without you. I suppose we have a last chance now to end with some dignity. I think you're a very brave man. Well, there isn't much else to do. Do we go now, George? Now, Walter. Wait, what's that? I have been told another Zahn has died. Now. Now will you believe me? The Council of the Zahn meets now. Two gone already, and you were with me, George. You know I didn't kill this one. What stopped him then? I told you it's old man death. You came to the wrong planet, George. Your immortality doesn't go down here. He can stop you, but you can't stop him. And you'll all die if you stick around. Now, the council has decided this is a place of death. We will leave your planet. Leave? You mean you're giving up? It is not safe for the sun. Walter, they're leaving. They're really going. Go on then, George, and don't hurry back. It would not be logical to do so. We are leaving the earth now. Goodbye, Walter. Goodbye, George. <laughs> Wonderful to feel the wind and the sun again. Close the hatches. Walter, is it safe for us to be out here? Sure, they're not interested in us any longer. They only want to get away. And I want to see this grace, the Zahn leaving Earth forever. Now they're blasting off. There they go. Yes, it's over now. Well, I suppose we might as well go back in. I still don't understand, Walter. What made them go? Oh, I uh, just told them the facts of life. Of death, you mean? No, no, no. No, of life. After all, I thought George was old enough to know at 7,000 years he was getting to be a pretty big boy. I wish you'd stop joking and tell me what happened. Uh, look out for the step. Well... Do you remember when the first animals died? Yes, the rabbit and the canary. Mm -hmm, and their mates just started to pine and waste away. Yes. Well, that worried the Zahn. They wanted to keep the last specimens alive if they could. And so, finally, I broke down and told them about... affection. Affection? Mm-hmm. And then I, I introduced Donald. 
Donald, who's that? Here we are. Oh. Come here. Grace, I want you to meet Donald. Oh, Walter, please. What does affection have to do with it? Well, that's what the Zahn wanted to know. I told him it was love that made the world go round. That having lost his mate, Donald would die immediately unless he had affection and constant petting. Petting? Mm-hmm. I even showed him how. Come here, fella. Come here. Come here. <laughs> Yes, I held Donald in my arms and petted him a while, and then... Then I let the Zahn take over with the animal in the next cage. What animal? Take a look. Hey, watch out. Don't go Water. too close. It's a rattlesnake. Yes, it's a rattlesnake. The Zahn's metabolism made it impossible for them to die of old age, but I had a hunch they could be poisoned. And it was the snake that killed the two Zahn. They never even knew what bit them. Then you outwitted them, Walter. I suppose. And I thought you'd just given up. Oh, Walter, I'm so proud of you. You don't have to be. I had given up. I probably wouldn't have fought at all if you hadn't pushed me. Uh, Well. Well. We've got a world to plan, a whole new world, Grace. I know. We'll have to decide which animals to... Let out of the zoo, which ones would be safer to keep in, but first, there's a much bigger problem. What's that? The human race. Oh. Yeah, we've got to make a decision about that. It's a pretty important one. Uh, yes, uh, but... It hasn't been a bad race. Of course, it may go backward for a while until it gets its breath, but... Well, we can save the books and all the most important things and get it started ahead once more. Please, Walter. It's, it's the Garden of Eden. Oh, don't be ridiculous. All ridic- over again. Don't be ridiculous, Walter. <laughs> Funny. Even blush like Martha. Oh, 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 only you're stronger than she was. And prettier, too. I wish you'd forget about Martha. I think I will, my dear, if you'll only give me a little time. Now, Walter Fairley, you listen to me. If you think for one minute that, that we... I, I, I thought it would never happen to me again. But it is love that makes the world go round. And so, Grace, if you could only... I wouldn't marry you if you were the last man on earth. But that's exactly what I am. I don't care. I don't even want to talk about it. I'm going out. Well, all right, my dear, but but think it over and, and please come back. You see, I told you. It wasn't really so horrible, our story. Remember how it goes. The last man on earth sat alone in a room. And then there was a knock on the door. Come in. Come in. Come in. My dear... You see, it wasn't horrible at all. You have just heard the Frederick Brown story entitled Knock, an adventure in time, space, and the unknown world of the future. The world of... Dimension X, 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 X. Now, about next week. Next week, we tell the story of a robot. But a robot that was almost human. Tonight's adventure in Dimension X was adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. Arnold Moss was heard as Walter Phelan, Louis Van Ruten as the Zahn, and Joan Alexander as Grace Evans. Your narrator was Norman Rose. Music by Albert Berman, engineer Bill Chambers. Dimension X is produced by Van Woodward and directed by Edward King. Suspense. An hour of suspense. 
A full 60 minutes at this time with the distinguished actor-director, Mr. Robert Montgomery, as your host. Tonight, our star, Mr. John McIntyre. Our story, Donovan's Brain. A suspense play produced, edited, and directed William Spear. (laughs) Mr. Montgomery. The man across the table was talking about shaved heads and electricity, and I was listening. I'll have to admit it, I'm pretty much of a layman when it comes to things like that. I imagine you are, too. But the man I was talking with was a specialist. I sought him out after we decided on our suspense play for tonight. As you know, we're doing Donovan's Brain. And the man across the table who discussed shaved heads and electricity with such final authority was an eminent brain surgeon. Now, I don't know very much about the human brain. I have one, and I use it occasionally, I hope. But I leave the clinical knowledge up to the brain specialists, like the man across the table. To this man of science, I pose the momentous question, what about the brain? And he started in. Your brain, he said, is something less than two and a half percent of your total body weight. There's no relation between the weight of your brain and your intelligence. There's no relation between the size of your brain and your intelligence. So we threw out size and weight and talked about what you could tell about a person's intelligence simply by looking at his brain. And it develops, you can tell quite a lot, by looking. An intelligent person's brain is more complex in appearance than a stupid person's. It has more grooves and depressions, convolutions, he called them. Well, that was all right with me. I was nodding my head in agreement when it occurred to me quite suddenly that this didn't mean very much, not really. Because I can't look at somebody's brain, even if I wanted to. You can't either. We have to depend on other ways of judging people's intelligence, on how they act, what they say, what they do. The brain specialist told me about that, too. He said the brain acts as a storehouse for our knowledge. It also is the power that directs that knowledge. So when we act, we are merely putting direction to what we know. How a man acts, the direction he takes, is his own decision. It's an individual matter. And that interests me. The highly intelligent, highly moral lawyer and the deceptively crafty, highly immoral crook may well have the same amount of knowledge, but the way each directs his knowledge is entirely different. Why? Psychological fiber. That's what the brain man called it. Your psychological fiber is either weak or it's strong, so far as the pressures of living are concerned. If it's strong, the worries, the fears, the tragedies of life can't throw you off your course can't influence your direction. But if it's weak, these same worries and fears and tragedies take on exaggerated proportions. You lose your sense of direction, and the result is fixation or obsession or insanity. Our play tonight is concerned with a brain, the man who directs it, and what happens to his psychological fiber. It is the story of Dr. Patrick Corey and Donovan's brain. A tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense! As I sit now outside my laboratory door writing under the heading Experiment 87, this final entry in my casebook. I know that these are the last words I shall ever write upon this earth. I neither ask nor expect forgiveness now or hereafter. And for those who seek some explanation, I refer them simply to this casebook. Let them read it carefully. From its first entry on that ill-starred day of December the fifth. December 5th. Today I bought a small capuchin monkey from an organ grinder. The animal trembled with fear when I took it into my laboratory, and when I tried to pet it, it bit me. But I had to make it trust me completely. Fear causes an excess secretion of adrenaline, resulting in an abnormal condition of the bloodstream which would throw off my observations. So, I fed it bananas and raw egg, and finally, the creature laid its head against my shoulder. I stabbed it with a surgical lancet between the occipital bone 
and the first cervical vertebra. It died instantly. Well, David, what do you think of it? Well, it's... Well, it's pretty amazing, all right. You see what I've done, don't you? Well, I... I think so. You think so? Good Lord, don't you know? <laughs> well, after all that, I'm only a second-year medical student. Well, what of it? When I was a second-year medical student... At... Who is it? It's me, Dennis. Patrick, Dr. Schrott is here to see you. Oh. Well, let him come in. Uh, come in, doctor. Thank you. Patrick didn't realize who it was... You know my son, David, of course. Oh, of course, of course. How are you, my boy? Fine, thanks, Doctor. Well, Patrick, how did work as usual, Patrick, I see? Patrick, you didn't eat the lunch I sent him to you. Or the breakfast, either. I tried to get him to, Mother. Well, I've been terribly busy, Janice. Yeah, but you've got to eat that. I know, I know. Uh, what, uh, what is it this time, Patrick? A brain. What? A brain, a brain, a monkey's brain. Oh. Uh, well, uh, what about the brain? Well, I'm trying to see how long I can keep the tissues alive. Is uh, is that it? In that jar? Mm-hmm. Considerably more to it than just a jar, though. You want to see how it works? Yeah. Well, is it still alive? In a way, yes. It's a fairly simple device, actually, Doctor. It's a variation on Carell's mechanical heart. See, the brain lies in a bath of blood serum. These, uh, these rubber arteries are fixed to the vertebral and internal carotid arteries. Of the brain, and the blood substance is forced through the cycle of Willis to feed the tissues. Mm. And uh, over here, I've installed a small pressure pump that forces the blood circulation. See? But how do you know it's alive? Well, that's very easy to determine. The brain, when functioning, gives off infinitesimal electrical impulses, and they can be measured. As a matter of fact, I've hooked the encephalograph to a small amplifying system. The brain impulses can actually be heard here. Turn it on. <laughs> Quite effective, isn't it? Yes. Yes, it's effective, and it's it's wrong, Patrick. It's it's terribly wrong. I've tried to tell him, Dr. Schrott. He's trying to discover things that that no man should discover. It's warping his whole nature. He's in here night and day. We hardly even see him anymore. Mother's right in the way, Dad. You're killing yourself with these... Will you leave us, please, Janice? You too, David. Oh, Dad. If you please, David. All right. Come on, Mother. It's wrong. It's wrong. In heaven's name, what's wrong with it? Oh, you and your mechanistic philosophy. Trying to reduce life to a mere matter of chemicals and test tubes. The origin of life is from a higher domain than that, Patrick. And you're... You're you're profaning it. Your hands are shaking. Yeah. Do you have another hard night, Doctor? Oh, you can taunt me if you like. I've made a mess of my life, that's true. But I wouldn't have a part of what you're doing for all the success in the world. Oh, nonsense. You can't stop the progress of science. Every discovery of whatever kind is a step forward. If I can prove that the brain can perform certain functions outside the body, who knows where we may be able to go from there. How, how do you know that, that thing in there doesn't feel pain? How do you know it isn't writhing in agony? Brain tissue itself is insensitive. You know that, Doctor. But as to the feeling, look. I'll switch on the encephalograph. Notice the faintness of the amplified alpha rays? Notice the comparatively slow rate of pulsation? Now, notice what happens when I tap on the glass jar. It feels. It thinks. Well, I wouldn't go so far as to say that, but it certainly shows marked reaction to an external stimulus. I, I wouldn't believe it possible. Well, the trouble with you is, Schrott, you really don't believe in science. Yeah. Uh, well, have it your own way, Patrick. But uh, when you can manufacture love and sympathy and kindness in a test tube, well, uh, I'll be back. Are you leaving? Yes, yes. Patrick. Yes? Uh, uh, do me a favor. Shut off the pump and let that poor thing in there die. <laughs> let it die? Yes, yes. Why, if it were within my power to grant, that little brain would live forever. December 10th. I'm utterly exhausted from lack of sleep, but the events of the past five days have been of such tremendous importance 
that I must set them down while every last detail is still fresh in my mind. For I've had no time to make an entry in this second, in this record, since the day last week, and it seems months ago now, when I had my first partial success with the brain of the capuchin monkey. At that time, however, it seemed that I was doomed to disappointment. In spite of all my efforts, the brain of the monkey ceased to live at 12.14 at night. Tired and disheartened, I lay down to sleep on the cot in my laboratory. But at that very moment, fate was contriving an occurrence which now seems destined to have the most profound effect not only upon my own existence, but perhaps upon that of all mankind. Come in, come in. What's the matter? It's Dr. Schrott. Schrott? Well, what in the world does he want? It's two o'clock in the morning. Well, there's been an accident or something. He's pretty upset. What, what of it? Where is he? Well, he went outside again. He's at the laboratory door. Well? All right. Patrick. Oh. Oh, thanks heaven, my boy. Thank heaven. Well, what's the matter? There's... There's been a plane crash on the mountains. Oh, only one of them left alive. I, I brought him this far, but he, he needs immediate operation. And That's your job. You're county physician. Patrick. Patrick, it's multiple fractures of both legs. The arteries are severed. The, the legs will have to be amputated. Uh, well, you're not in any shape to do the job. Well, that's not my fault. Take him to the Phoenix Hospital. I'm not going to take the responsibility. It's too far. we would never get there in time. Oh, Patrick, please, please. It may mean a man's life and... and, 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 yes, and, and, and... Your job as county physician, huh? I'm not thinking of that. But he's an important man. William H. Donovan. Donovan? The Wall Street Donovan? Yes. Oh, you've got to help me, Patrick. Uh, uh, well, what are his chances? Oh, uh, about even, if we hurry. Well, bring him in. Oh, thank you, Patrick. Thank you, my boy. Uh, you better get some things on, David. You may have to help. Oh, sure, Dad. Oh, uh, David. Thanks. David. Yes, Dad. Uh... Don't say anything to your mother. I don't wish her to be disturbed. Oh, sure, I know. We'll use the laboratory table. Before you go, put the instruments to the sterilizer. And don't forget the Geely saw. Oh, right. Oh, but... But what? Oh, I... I thought the Geely saw was only used for... for brain surgery or not always? No, hurry. They're bringing him in from the car now. Okay, oh, hurry up. Here, here. In here now. Here, here. Careful, please. Put him right there on that table, please. Yes, doctor. Easy. Hit. Better get yourself a gown and gloves, Doctor. Uh, right over there. You won't have time to scrub. Uh, thanks, Patrick. Thanks. Well. Bad, isn't he? Yeah. Pulse rapid? Yeah. Heart very faint? Yeah. I wasn't sure we'd even make it to here. Oh, David. Oh, uh, yes, Dad. Half cc of adrenaline, David. One to one thousand intravenous. Right. Yeah. You men can go now. Is there anything else? No, no, do? thank you. Hey, Patrick, Patrick. I'd rather we were alone, if you don't mind. Uh, Good night, then, Dr. Yeah. Good, Good night, and, and thank you. Thank now, David. David, if you'll remove the blanket from his legs. That's it. Uh-huh. There, you see? Fortunately, a forest ranger got to him right after the crash and had sense enough to put a tourniquet on each leg. But even so... <laughs> What's that he's saying? Uh, something like, sure, sure, sure. He, he said it over and over. Well, that's funny. He's got a foreign accent. Uh, he's an Armenian, I think. He changed his name to Donovan. Uh, I haven't realized he was deformed. Well, it doesn't show as much in his pictures. Now, uh, Patrick, I, I think we ought to begin. There's no use amputating those legs. No use? He'll be dead anyway by morning. Well, won't he? Well, I, 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 I suppose you're right, Patrick. You but, know I'm right. Uh, but still, we ought to try. Uh, we can't refuse to operate just because... We uh, are going to operate. Syringe, please, David. The large one. Here you are, Dad. Anesthetic. Will you give it, Dr. Yeah, right, right. Scalpel, please, David. And the Geely saw. Geely saw? Patrick! Well? No. No, I won't let you. After your performance tonight? <laughs> but he's still alive. Precisely. My mistake with the monkey was that he was dead. I don't intend to make it again. Come, come, David, the scalpel. Are you out of your mind? You're taking a man's life. I'm giving him life. 
Donovan won't die anyway. I mean, he would die, of course. But for a while, at least. Donovan's brain will live. You better hurry. They'll be coming for the body pretty soon. You can go now, David. Well, I, I think I will, then. David, uh, you understand, of course. Yes, I understand. Not a word to your mother or to anyone. I understand. Patrick, will the skull... I bandaged the whole cranium. It didn't look like any head injury. Uh, I hope nobody gets any ideas about an autopsy. Oh, the coroner, you can stop that. You drive a hard bargain, don't you, Patrick? Better sign the death certificate before they get here. You know this is blackmail. Want a drink? You don't have to do that. I'll sign it. I'm sorry, but it was a chance that comes once in a lifetime. William Donovan has one of the greatest minds, has one of the greatest brains in the world today. And now you have it. It's madness, Patrick. You think I won't succeed? Succeed in what? Turn on the encephalograph. Yeah, simple alpha waves, no different from the monkeys. You can't take a human brain out of its body and expect it to function. Did it ever occur to you that the brain might simply be asleep? Asleep? Certainly. Operation like this is a severe shock. Now, tap on the glass. Good Lord, Patrick. Delta waves, it was asleep. You woke it up. It's actually conscious. Yes. There are three of us conducting this experiment now, Shrout. You and me and William Horace Donovan. December 17th. I moved my bed into my laboratory, but I scarcely slept in six days. There can no longer be any doubt that the brain responds like a sensitive seismograph to vibrations near it, including the sound of my voice. Yet I found no method of communication with it. I've devised a simplified Morse code consisting of taps on the glass container together with voice vibrations. Perhaps we can teach the brain. December 22nd. Shrout has come to stay with me, half out of the feeling that he shares with me a common guilt, half out of scientific curiosity. But I have scarcely seen him, and both David and Janice have been avoiding me. Not that I really care. I have been tapping out my code on the side of the brain's container endlessly, day and night, over and over a thousand times, so that a baby could learn it if the brain can learn. I sleep only when the brain itself falls into exhausted slumber. When it wakes again, I resume my tapping. Shrout! It's Shrout! Wake up! Yes, 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 Patrick. Get up! Hurry! Well, what's the matter? Come. Is something the matter? Come, I want you to see something. Oh, Patrick, you, you, you look like a ghost. Where, where are we going? Back to the laboratory. I can't believe it myself. I may have been dreaming. Delirious. What happened? What come, happened? come on. You hear that? The delta waves. Yeah, it seems disturbed. You've got to check my observations for me. If my reasoning is wrong. Tell me. I, I can't be sure of anything anymore. Yes, Patrick, yes. Now, now listen carefully, Doctor. You know I've been trying to communicate with the brain in code. Now, if I were able to cause a distinctive pattern of the brain's delta waves by a specific command in code, if the brain responded with the same pattern of sound each time I issued the command, it would prove that I had succeeded in communicating with the brain, wouldn't it? Yes, Patrick, yes. I, I think it would. Now... Listen. Donovan. Donovan. If you understand, think three times of the word talk. Three times. Talk. 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 It answered. It spoke. Try it yourself, just as I did the same word three times. Donovan. Talk. Talk. 
talk. Then I'm right. It's true. Patrick, this this thing has learned to talk. December 23rd. Schwartz romanticizing, of course. The Delta pattern is so infinitely complex that it would be utterly, utterly impossible ever to break it down into specific words. Yet that it understands me, that it's trying to communicate with me, is certain. Schwartz suggests mental telepathy, that I try to make my mind a blank, as the mediums call it, while at the same time increasing the energy content in the plasma that feeds the brain in the hope of stepping up the brain's electrical potential, as one would step up the power of a radio station. But naturally, telepathy is nonsense. But the feeding theory intrigues me. I shall try it. December 31st. Notice today, for the first time, two distinct nodules of new brain cells on the frontal lobex. Electrical potential is increased to 510 microvolts. I've begun smoking cigars. Although I've always hated them before. Nerves, I expect. January 6th. Nodule still growing. Electrical potential 1450. But with no observable results. Have lately felt a compelling urge to know more of Donovan's life. And have com collected every available scrap of information about him. Strange man. Ruthless. Actually evil in many ways. But... Nonetheless, an extraordinarily brilliant mind. Wake you up, Patrick. You were uh? moaning in your sleep and talking. Mm. Talking? What did I say? I'm, I'm not sure, but your voice was so strange that... Janice, uh, Janice uh, what's the matter? Oh, that's nothing. I was dreaming, that's all. Janice woke me up. Patrick. Patrick, let me see your hand. No, mm. no, 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 no. The other one. Well, what about it? You're, uh, you're not left-handed, are you? I well, know. Then why have you got ink on the fingers of your left hand? Uh -huh. I don't know. Well, were you writing anything tonight? No. Why, you must have been, Patrick. Here it is, right here on your desk. Nonsense. I... Wait. Let me, s let me see it. Well, you've been writing his name. William H. Donovan. Schrott! That's not my handwriting. It's... What? What? Well, don't you see what it means? The brain has communicated with me. Patrick, you don't mean... Look here. Hey, look at this man. Look at this magazine article. He's a reproduction of his signature. And he was left-handed, too. It says so here. It is. It's exactly the same. What a fool I've been. Look at this picture. Smoking a cigar with his left hand. I wondered why I'd suddenly started smoking cigars. And the, the same brand, too. Janice. Janice, try to remember what you heard me saying just before you woke me tonight. Now think. Patrick, I... I can't believe... Think, Janice. All I heard was something like, sure, sure, sure. Sure, of course. Don't you remember, Shot? He said it that night. It was the only thing we ever heard him say. It was an expression of his. It, it tells about it in one of the articles, too. It... it wasn't your voice, Patrick. You see? Aha, uh -huh, you were right, Shot. The brain has grown. And it's strong enough to influence not only the higher functions of the frontal lobe, but the speech centers, the motor centers of another brain. Patrick. Patrick, if this is true, then your experiment has been successful. It's ended. Ended? Why, it's only begun. Patrick! Don't you see what this means? Patrick, listen to me. What, Janice? What? You've got to stop. Stop? I can't stand it any longer. 
Can't you see where it's led you? When you cut yourself off from your family, when you neglected your health and began having fits of temper and were like, like someone I hardly recognize as the man I married. All that I tried to understand. But don't you see what you've done? You're a murderer, Patrick. A murderer! Janice! David told me the whole thing. The poor boy's half insane himself from worry. Insane? What do you mean by that? What I say! You killed Donovan. Maybe he wouldn't have lived anyway. But you killed him. And now this... This thing has gained such power over your mind that it can make you do things you don't even know about. Oh! For all you know, it could make you do... Anything. Anything! You've got to choose, Patrick. Janice, please. I I suppose you're right, but I'm utterly exhausted. I can't even think anymore. You've got to think. Give me until tomorrow. Let me sleep, and then tomorrow I'll do something, I promise. All right, Patrick. But if you don't do something, if you don't destroy that thing, I will! Listen! Listen! Oh, I hate it! Janice, it's almost as though it had heard you and were raging at you. <laughs> Way, please, Dr. Corey. <laughs> but, Patrick, why are we going in here? A psychiatric I told clinic? you I'd do something, darling, and I've got an idea. You mean having yourself psychoanalyzed? Something like that? Something like that. I'll tell you about it later, dear. First, I want to talk to this man alone. Dr. Zanger, this is Dr. Corey. Oh, how do you do, Dr. Corey? Oh, I've heard something of your work. Oh, yes. Oh, and uh, this is... Uh, Mrs. Corey. Oh, of course. Excuse me. Uh, I'm happy to meet you, Mrs. Corey. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, uh, won't you come into my office, Doctor? Uh, yeah, uh, Janice, would you mind waiting here in the reception room? I'll, I'll be out in just a moment. Why, certainly, mm. dear. Uh, in here, please. Well, Doctor, she seems quite normal. I had expected from what you told me on the phone. Yes, I know, but I... I can assure you, deeply as it pains me to do so, that she is quite insane. Oh, I see. Paranoia. She's always been a little jealous of my work, but lately she's developed a most extraordinary delusion. Hmm. She she thinks that I've created some sort of a monster in my laboratory that controls that, that, that controls my mind, my, my actions. Yeah, I have uh, heard of such cases. In- it was a great shock to me. I thought of you at once, of course. I'm putting her completely in your hands. Well, it is a little unusual, but since you are yourself a medical man... I know you do everything you can. Yes, you, you definitely wish, then, to commit her, huh? Yes. Yes. You have the paper. Uh, here they are. Uh, just your signature will be enough. Hmm. Uh, you are. Uh, you, <coughs> you keep me informed. Oh, well, naturally, naturally. Well, goodbye then, Dr. Corey. We will do what we can. Patrick? Uh, Mrs. Corey is staying with us, Miss Wilcox. Yes, Dr. Sanger. Patrick, come back. Oh, it's all right, Mrs. Corey. Patrick? Just come inside with me, please. Patrick! No, no, no. Where are you going? Come along, Mrs. Corey. Let me go. Oh, it's all right. Come Let on. me go! Oh, please. Patrick! Yes? About the bill, how do you wish it to be handled? Oh, sure, sure, sure. I'll take care of it by the week. The checks will be signed William H. Donovan. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> January 15th. It's nearly a week now since Janice went away. I cannot understand how she could have left me just when I needed her most. When I try to question Shrout or David about her, they only look at me straight and change the subject. Clearly, they too are in on the conspiracy. Sometimes, it seems, the only person I can trust is Donovan, the brain. It communicates with me more freely now each day. I know it has some great plan in mind for me, for both of us. And I'm waiting, patiently waiting.
Donovan. I'm listening, Donovan. Don't be angry, Donovan. I'm trying to understand. I'm, I'm listening, Donovan. I'm listening. In tonight's full hour of suspense, Mr. John McIntyre appears as Dr. Patrick Corey in William Spears' production of Donovan's Brain. Tonight's study in suspense. just a moment, we will return with Act Two of Suspense. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. And now, back to our Hollywood soundstage and your host for Suspense, Mr. Robert Montgomery. At the outset of Experiment 87, we were concerned with a man of science who had a wife and a son whom he loved and who loved him. He was a gifted scientist, dedicated to his work, and he signed his name with his right hand, Dr. Patrick Corey. That was before Donovan's brain. That was before his psychological fiber weakened against the force of a powerful obsession. And with this weakening, his power to direct his knowledge has become twisted. Now we look again at Dr. Patrick Corey, man of science. He has alienated friends and family. He has had his wife committed to an institution. His entire life has become a thing contained in a vat controlled by pounding electric waves, and he signs his name with his left hand, William H. Donovan. And now, with John McIntyre as Dr. Patrick Corey, and with Act Two of Donovan's Brain, we again hope to keep you in... Suspense! January 16th. It is now six weeks, exactly 42 days. For six weeks, by artificial means alone, I have kept alive a human brain. Completely detached from the body, floating in a bath of serum, nourished by a synthetic blood plasma fed through its arteries by an electric pump, it has remained alive. Not only alive, but I have succeeded in communicating with it. For I have even induced new growth of brain cells and so tremendously increased its mental faculties that by sheer brain power alone it is actually able to communicate its thoughts to me. And each day, my communion with that living, pulsing mass of gray matter that was the brain of William Donovan becomes stronger and stronger. Even now I sense it striving to reveal some plan to me. Something so truly world-shaking in its implications that only such an organism developed to a point thousands of years ahead of its time could ever have conceived it. So far I sense this only. But soon I shall know. Indeed, I shall be a partner in its execution. What a fool I was ever to have considered for a moment my wife's demands that I end the experiment. It's because I refused, of course, that Janice left me a week ago without so much as a word of explanation of farewell. Even my son David and my assistant Shrott are privy to this conspiracy to thwart me. For what I asked about Janice, they pretended to know nothing. Or s- seek to avoid my questions. But the brain will live. I can hear it now. Its delta waves, quite audible over the amplifying system I've arranged for it, almost as though it were calling to me, trying to speak to me. Yes, the brain will live. <laughs> Donovan. Donovan, what is it? What are you trying to tell me? Go on, Donovan. Go on. I'm listening. Go on. Who is it? It's me, Patrick and David. What do you want? We want to talk to you, Dad. I have no time to talk. I'm busy. Please open the door, Patrick. It's important. Go away. I tell you I'm busy. Please, Dad. Can't you leave me alone? But... All right. All right. There. Thanks. Now, what is it? Patrick, 
Won't you come into the study with us for a few minutes? Whatever you got to say, you can say right here. You know I can't leave the laboratory. Dad, it, it's only that we wanted to talk to you in, in private. Don't tell me that you're afraid of this poor mass of brain cells. Oh, no, it's not that, Dad. Never mind, David. At least turn that thing off then, will you, Patrick? <laughs> what difference would that make? It could still hear, couldn't it? All right, well, what is it? It's... it's about Mother. Oh. So she put you up to this, did she? I thought the truth would come out sometime. Dad, listen. She tried to stop this experiment from the beginning. She thought she could blackmail into quitting by leaving me. And she still does. And now she's using you as I a go-between. Think... Patrick, please, listen a minute. I've heard enough. We haven't heard a word from Janice. We don't know where she is. That's what we came in to talk about. Oh, have you? Well, how should I know where she is? Because... Because you were the last person seen with her, Dad. I was. Don't you remember, Patrick? You took her into town with you. You wouldn't tell any of us why. Oh, oh yes. Of course. For a moment I'd forgotten, but what of it? Don't you remember what happened then? Well, of course I remember. She left me, that's all. Well, where, Dad? Where did she leave you? What were you doing? I, I, I don't know. We were in some big public building. It's the city hall, courthouse, taxes or something. And the next thing I knew, she simply disappeared. Is that all? Didn't she say anything? Didn't she uh, Didn't she at least tell you why she was going? How do I remember what she said? It's been a week and more. I've hardly slept. Ben, you know I've been working night and day. Yes, that's just it, Patrick. What do you mean by that? Patrick, you say that this, the brain communicates with you. Tells you thing of, things about its past life. Suggests thoughts. Well, if the brain can make you think things, why can't it also make you forget things? Leave me alone. Dad, are you sure? Are you sure you don't know what's happened to Mother? No, no, I tell you. But no. don't you see what you might have done? In heaven's name, stop now while there's still time. Get out of while here. While there's still time to help Janice, if there is. While there's still time to help yourself, Patrick. Shut off the current. You... Let the brain die. Kill it, Patrick. Kill it. Get Kill out. it. Both of you. Get out. Get out! The brain continues to come more and more easily, but nothing further on what I have come to think of as the plan. I am now sleeping a great deal, but my dreams are becoming increasingly troublesome, although I am at a loss to analyze them. Most frequent is a sort of vast cosmic ballet presided over by the colossal figure of a young man who I seem to recognize, and yet I never see his face. It is as though the entire population of the earth were moving past him in review at his command. Well, Trot, he's faint. No, 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 David, don't let him touch oh, me. Don't let him touch me. It's all right now. Here, here's a glass of water. Yeah. Well, what's the matter? You're trembling all over. I, I can't. What are you looking at me that way for? You look frightened half to death. Dead? Well, what happened here anyway? I came in and found you on the floor with your hands around your own throat. If it hadn't been for me, what? Why's your luggage all packed? I, I was going to leave. Leave? In the middle of the night? Why? Because I... The fuse box. It's been opened. It was you, Shrot. You were going to shut off the current. You were going to kill that brain. Patrick, you tried to strangle me. What? It's true, Dad. That's why I had to slap you. But that's absurd. I came in here and I found Shrot with his hands around his own throat. He was strangling himself. Dad, please think a minute. Nobody can strangle himself. Look at these marks on my throat. You think I could have done that? What? No, it's not possible. And yet... It's true, Patrick, true, that I tried to shut off the current. I was afraid for you. But as I opened the fuse box, I heard the delta waves in the laboratory suddenly become stronger and louder than they'd ever been before. And then... And then I... Yes, yes. 
than the brain. You, you even spoke in Donovan's voice, Patrick. His voice? Yes, that recurring phrase of his, sure, 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 in his very tones, his very accent. You've created a monster, Patrick. It has the power to make me commit murder. Patrick, what about Janice? Shot you. You don't think I, I, I couldn't have done a thing like that? You couldn't have done what you did tonight if you'd been yourself? No, no, I... Even a hypnotist can't force a man to... Don't, don't worry about it now, Patrick. It's probably all right. We'll try to find it tomorrow. Uh, we'll do everything we can, but first... Dad, don't you see? Dr. Schrott was right. You've got to destroy... Uh, well, maybe... Maybe then I could remember it, yes. The brain must die. Pull the switch in the fuse box. It will only be a matter of seconds then. Yes. But... You've got to, Patrick. Shrot! David! Help me, I can't move! Come to me! Pull the switch! Hurry! Shrot! David! Go on! You! You do! It's... It's paralyzed us, Patrick! The brain won't let itself be killed! Then it has the power to live on, on, to command us as long as we live. To make us do anything it wants. To kill, murder, Dad. What are we going to do? Listen. The brain. It's, it's laughing. February 2nd. Shrout has left. He had to, of course, for his own protection, if nothing else. Before he left, I swore him to eternal secrecy. And he's going to try to find Janice. The very thought that any harm might have come to her through me is enough to drive me almost mad. As for David, he's strong enough to prevent any untoward accidents. And he's volunteered to stay with me. He'll sleep at night behind locked doors. We must devote every faculty we possess, together and independently, to finding a way of destroying the brain. Perhaps while it sleeps, although it seems to have developed tremendous powers of the subconscious which operate even in sleep. A recurring dream. The now oppressive sense of some further task to be performed continues. Oh, if Janice were only here, even her presence I know would help immeasurably to combat this fearful thing. A terrible thought crosses my mind. Could Schrott have left if the brain had not, for some reasons of its own, actually wanted him to leave? February 6th. My thoughts are less and less my own. The dream of the young giant bestriding the earth, the figure without a face, pursues me now, even in my waking hours. Increasingly, I seem to live in a world of evil fancy peopled and controlled by the mind of William Donovan. And worst of all is the obsession that there is some fateful role not yet revealed to me, but I have been assigned to play in it. But I've not given up hope. I must destroy the brain. The possibility has occurred to me. I must give it more thought. If Janice were only here. Janice, my darling. How are you, Patrick? Well, well enough. But Janice, where have you been? Where have I been? Yes, we well, had no idea. I've been half crazy worrying about you. Did Schrott finally find you? Uh-huh. Yeah, Schrott found me. Well, Janice, why did you leave me that day? Why didn't you at least tell me? Where, where did you go? I was with friends. Did Schrott tell you anything? No. N nothing special. Janice, I know I haven't been a very good husband these last months. 
I haven't been very kind or considerate or even civilized. I haven't been myself, Janice. I know. Patrick, my poor darling. But if you'd only known how I missed you after you left. How I needed you. I, I need your help, Janice. I know, Patrick. I came back to help you. But but what? Where's... Oh, he's asleep in the next room ever since... That is, lately he's... He's tried to make it a point to sleep only when I do. Keep an eye on things. Patrick, I'm going to help you all I can, any way I can. I'm going to. But first, I want to take David away. David? Because I don't think it's good for him to be here. I don't think that you... Then Schrott did tell you. Yes, Patrick, he did. Oh, Janice, Janice, Janice. I don't know what to do. My mind is only half my own. Lately, I don't even know what I'm... What I myself... Or whether I'm someone else. It's... It's like some frightful nightmare. Only I don't wake up. I'm afraid I'll never wake up. My poor dearest... Janice. You... You do love me still. Yes, Patrick. It's the only thing I have left, Janice. It's what I've counted on and clung to. And that somehow, out of your love, you'd find a way to help no one else can. I know. Poor old Schrott didn't even dare to come back. Yes, well, I can't blame him. Patrick, I don't want to torment you. It's only that perhaps we can find a way if we know all the facts. What, Janice? Don't you really know where I was? No, how could I? Don't you remember where you took me? Well, I took you? You took me to a psychiatric clinic, Patrick. You had me committed. Oh, Janice. No, Patrick. Not you. Donovan. It was because I tried to make you stop the experiment. Kill the brain. As you left me there, you even spoke in Donovan's voice. Sure, 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 you said. I thought they were the last words I would ever... Hear you speak. Oh, Janice, forgive me. Forgive. I couldn't persuade anyone. I was sane. After what you told them, everything I said only made them think I was mad. I'm not mad. Am I, Patrick? I'm not mad. <laughs> Janice will be gone for some three hours. I have sent her into town for Dr. Zanger, the psychiatrist. Maybe he can help. But now I'm overcome with the thought of the humiliation I shall have to suffer when other medical men become aware of the position I'm in. It will be the end of my career, my reputation, all my hopes. It's folly to think that Zanger would keep it to himself. Indeed, he would have no right to. I can bear it if I must. But another way... A possibility came to me yesterday, and I've been thinking it over. There's no harm in trying it in an event. I must try. I have three hours. David! David? Yes, Dad? David, what's your blood type, do you know? Oh, as a matter of fact, I don't think I do. Why? Well, no matter. We can easily find out. David, I think at last I know a way. To kill the brain? Yes, it's simple. Perfectly natural. And yet nine chances out of ten is something Donovan would never have known about. I do it myself, but unfortunately my blood type is the same as his. Oh, a transfusion? Of course. I have to replenish the blood substance periodically anyhow. It's about time to do it again. I've always used my own because it was the same type as his, but if yours is a different type, the right type. You mean the wrong type? Yes. Given the wrong type, the brain will die. Yes. It sounds possible. I'm sure of it. I know it. Oh, but, but suppose the brain knows. It, it knows other things. Yes, I thought of that. It's a chance we'll have to take. If you're willing. Oh, of course I am, Dad. Then we'll take a blood sample now. Come to the laboratory. If only I have the right type. Or rather, the wrong type. If you haven't, we'll find someone who has. Maybe Schrott. Now, just lie down there on the table. You want a tourniquet. On your arm? There. I'll, you. I'll put it on. This all, the small syringe will do it. Now. Uh, go ahead. I'm ready. Uh, David, don't watch me. It, it'll be easier if you don't for me. 
Well, that's a funny one. Coming from you. Well, doctors are never quite as steady with members of their own family, you know. Ready? Sure. <coughs> there we are. You all right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm all right. We'll be through in just a second. You getting it all right? Yeah, it's just a second now. Dad, I'm sleepy. I'll be over it in a moment. But what's the matter? Why am I so, so sleepy? You'll be all right. Sleepy. So sleepy. That is what anesthetic is for, to make you sleep. I was somewhat surprised to find the instrument sterilized and already lying out. But I worked more rapidly and skillfully than ever before in my life. I made an incision just below the hairline, laying back the scalp as far as the base of the skull. I trepanned the cranium at two centimeter intervals, working back and downwards to the upper edge of the occipital bone. With a GD saw, I cut through the connecting bone structure and removed the entire top of the cranium, placing it in saline solution to preserve it. I made a semicircular incision in the dura mater, laying it to one side, exposing the brain. As I dissected out the facial, auditory, and pneumogastric nerves to free the medulla oblongata, I became conscious of an insistent clamoring. Something like a mounting hysteria in the distant reaches of my mind. Almost as strong as the irresistible compulsion that drove me on. But my hand did not falter. With a sure stroke, I severed the spinal cord. Just below the first cervical nerve. <laughs> As I make this last entry, with that awful guilt upon my soul, even now I cannot fully comprehend how it has been possible for any man, by mortal or immortal means, to be driven to such a crime. Even the divinity himself did not demand of Abraham that final sacrifice of expiation, when he, with his only begotten son, ascended the Mount of Olives. Perhaps Shrat is right. Perhaps there is indeed in man some spark of the divine that will elude our test tubes and our laboratories until the end of time. Perhaps that is the one thing that even Donovan did not foresee. I only know that at the instant my son died under my own hand, I was set free. At that instant, I saw and understood for the first time that monstrous plan born in the brain of William Donovan of which I was to be the instrument. It was the plan I had glimpsed but never grasped in the recurring dream. Donovan did aspire to the domination of the world. And with those tremendous mental faculties that I myself had given him, it was literally within his power to become the absolute ruler of all mankind. Only one thing was lacking, a body. A young, strong body into which those ever-growing brain cells could graft and affix themselves and live on, perhaps, for centuries. He chose the body of my son. And now at last, too late, I am free to destroy this foul thing of my creation. I know it as surely as I know that my own life must be the forfeit. The brain also knows... I could hear the disturbed, erratic oscillations of the delta waves coming through the laboratory door. But there's no room left in me now for fear. I shall take the six steps from the desk where I am writing across to the laboratory door. How often I have taken them in happier times. I shall open the door, close it behind me for the last time, and write finis to the mortal life of Patrick Arthur Corey and the brain of William Horace Donovan. May others learn from the record I leave here 
the lesson I have learned so bitterly and profit by them. And for the things I have done, may God have mercy on my soul. Bodies of Dr. Patrick Arthur Corey and his son David were found in Dr. Corey's own laboratory early today. Young Corey had apparently died on the operating table as a result of a delicate brain operation performed by his father. In the case of Dr. Corey, there was nothing to indicate the cause of death. But medical authorities who viewed the body, including the famous Dr. Gustav Zanger, gave us their opinions that he might have died of a shock as the result of the unsuccessful operation on his son. A curious feature of the case was the fact that numerous pieces of tissue, identified as being from a human brain, were found scattered about the laboratory floor, while a larger section of brain was found in the midst of an elaborate apparatus, evidently part of a scientific experiment. Me medical authorities stated, however, that they were unable to explain the nature of the apparatus and that the brain itself was in such a state of decomposition as to indicate that it had been dead and slowly decaying for at least two months. Dr. Corey is survived by his wife, Janice. She was committed to the county asylum for the insane late this afternoon. Burial of Dr. Corey and his son will be at the Mount of Olives Cemetery. <laughs> For a superb performance as Dr. Corey, our appreciation and thanks to John McIntyre. Tell me something. If you were going to make a room in your home available for renting, would you accept this man? He's personable in manner and appearance, and he pays well. He's alone, no wife, no children, no pets. He owns a Bible, reads it, and quotes from it freely. He asks only to live undisturbed in a quiet room. There, I think that's about all. Uh, no, there is one thing more. He has one abiding dislike. He can't stand sin. Well, how about it? Would you rent him a room? I suggest you wait to answer. Yes, I strongly suggest you wait until next week when I appear at the home of Mr. and Mrs. Robert Bunting as the lodger from the famous novel by Mary Bella Lowndes. Mr. Montgomery may currently be seen in the Universal International production Ride the Pink Horse. John McIntyre may soon be seen in the 20th Century Fox production Northside 777. Donovan's Brain by Kurt Siodmak was adapted for suspense by Robert L. Richards and was produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. Lud Gluskin is our musical director and conductor, and Lucian Morrowek composes the original scores. Next week, hear Robert Montgomery as The Lodger on radio's outstanding theater of thrills, one hour of... Suspense! This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Why wasn't this news released? Because it would create public hysteria. There would be an absolute panic. Yes, I, I suppose you're right. There'd be riots in the streets. It would make an invasion from Mars seem like a Sunday school picnic. <laughs> Theater 5 presents The New Order. Come into my office, gentlemen. Oh, thank you, Mr. 
Garth. Thank you. I'm John Clements, and this is my assistant, Sam Winston. How do you do? As you know, we're from the National Board. And what can we at Robots Unlimited do for you? Well, of course, you're aware that there's a new investigation of robotry. <laughs> there's always a new investigation of robots and robots unlimited, gentlemen. I just hope I haven't accidentally broken the rules of the charter. No, no, nothing like that. In fact, we wish all government departments were run as efficiently as this one. Well, thank you. Actually, we're here, Mr. Garson, because people are, well, they're getting very worried about robotry. Worried? It goes even deeper than that. They're afraid of the newest robot. Well, there's no reason to fear robots. I doubt we can convince people of that. At one time, a robot was a mechanical man with flashing lights for eyes, antennae for ears, and, well, he was obviously a robot. But now you can't tell a mechanical man from a human, except through dissection. No, there is another way, gentlemen. A robot is different from a human being because it does not know how to hate. And most important, it cannot bring harm to any human. Now, this is an integral part of the robot makeup. In fact, it's the first law of robotics. And that's precisely why we're here, Mr. Oh, oh excuse me. Yes, Garson here. Mr. Garson, Adam C. is ready for testing. Have Adam C. wait, please. Yes. Gentlemen, would you like to see an interesting test? What kind of test? Well, Adam C. is an R4 robot. I thought all R4s were supposed to be destroyed. Yes, that is, the charter states that when a robot type becomes obsolete, it should be destroyed. Why hasn't that been done? Well, the charter also gives a time limit for a possible modification. So I've been working on the R4. You see, there are two basic differences between the R4s and the r 5 The R4 voice was metallic, and it had a sort of built-in echo. But the R5 voice is as human as yours or mine. The other difference is, well, I'll call it the nervous system, connecting the brain to the voice box. Well, in the R4, the working of the brain was not attuned to the voice box. The R4 could solve problems, but could not transmit the answers vocally. This, of course, made the R4 a worker with a very limited capacity and range. The R5, however, solves problems and then gives the answers. Or it transmits the answers into action, just as a human would. And have you managed to alter the R4 enough to meet the new specifications? Yes, yes. Adam C. will be the 15th XR4 I've tested. The others have all met the new specifications. According to the terms of the charter, if Adam C. passes his tests, I'll have the right to modify all other R4s. There's a total of 528 of them. Well, gentlemen, would you like to see the test? Yes, I would. And so would I. Good. I'm sure you'll find it quite absorbing. Oh, please send Adam C. in. Yes, Mr. Garson. Oh, gentlemen, would you like a cigarette? Oh, thank you. No, thanks. I'm, uh, I'm going to introduce you to Adam C. as I would a, a human. I, I ask you to cooperate. Are you trying to tell us that robots have feelings? Well, not as we know feelings, no. But their tuning can be upset by, well, unexpected rudeness, for example. Oh, come in. Adam C. reporting as ordered, Mr. Gotham. Oh, Adam C. This is Mr. Clements and Mr. Winston. They are government investigators. I'm honored to know you gentlemen. Uh... Uh, how do you do? Pleased to meet you. Now, Adam C.? Yes, Mr. Garson. Do you understand why you're here? Yes, sir. Tell me, please. I was an R4 robot. You have had me modified to meet the specifications of the R5 robot. If I do not meet all the specifications, I will be destroyed along with all other R4 robots. All right. Now, the first test is memory retention. Now, I'm going to open this book. You will read the page on the right-hand side. You will have only three seconds. Ready? Yes, Mr. Garson. Start reading. All right. now. Adam C., in your opinion, what kind of book is this? It seems to be a work of fiction. Now, be more specific, please. I cannot be more specific, Mr. Garson. It seems to be a work of fiction. However, it could also be a biography, or it could be history done in a fictional style. Very good. And now I want you to read from memory... The 19th and 20th lines on that particular page. The lines are a piece of dialogue, quote, 
I don't like the idea of Ferguson and Martin meeting as equals, Kramer declared, adding in a low voice, their ideologies are simply not compatible, unquote. Fine. And now, gentlemen, would you like to see the page? Yes. All right. Here's the book, Mr. Clements. Page 47. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Let's see. That's right. Count down to the 19th line. I think you'll find that Adam C. read word for word that line and the one that follows. You know, this is amazing. It's not just amazing. It's completely incredible. Incredible? No, no, Mr. Winston. You see, the robot's brain is uncluttered with irrelevancies. What's the next test, Mr. Garson? Mental arithmetic. Uh, may I give Adam C. the problem? Oh, by all means. Please do. Um, can I have that piece of blank paper on your desk? Oh, surely. There you are. Thank you. Adam C.? Yes, Mr. Clements. I want you to solve this arithmetic problem for me. Yes, sir. Um, multiply 7,927 by 4,684. And then I want you to divide the total by 424. That is the problem, Mr. Clements? Yes. The answer is 87,570 plus the fraction 97,106. <laughs> well, Mr. Clements, I, uh, I haven't figured it out for myself yet. Well, I'm sure you'll find that Adam C.'s answer is correct. Well, here's the total of the multiplication. 37,130,068. Correct, Mr. Clements. You, uh, you can prove the answer quite simply by... Yes, that. yes, I know how, Mr. Garson. Well, Adam C., if Mr. Clements finds your answer to be correct, you may return to the waiting room for further instruction. Yes, Mr. Garson. Uh, well, the answer is correct, all right. That'll be all, Adam C. Goodbye, Mr. Garson. Gentlemen, being with you has been a pleasure... Well, I'll be darned. It makes one feel rather inferior, doesn't it? Uh, Mr. Garson, before this uh, test, we were speaking about the first law of robotics. Oh, yes, yes, so we were. Well, I think we're all aware of the fact that without this safeguard of the first law, Robots Unlimited would never have been granted a charter. In fact, the manufacture of human-type robots would not have been permitted. That's true. However... There is one man who can alter this first law, Professor Albert Dean, inventor of the human-type robot. And Professor Dean has been missing for the past five days. Missing? He disappeared from his home five days ago. Why wasn't this news released? Because the newspapers would pull out all the stops. There'd be panic. For the same reason, we didn't release another fact. That Professor Dean had been experimenting with a new robot... One to which the first law of robotics does not apply. You can imagine what the newspapers would do with that. Yes. This new robot type, did you know that Professor Dean was working on it? Yes, I did. Well, at least there was a rumor to that effect. Mm, And uh, did you approve? Well, it makes small difference how I felt, Mr. Clemens. The matter was out of my hands. Professor Dean wasn't and isn't under my supervision. Yes, well, that's true enough. He was our responsibility. Mr. Garson, you were selected as general manager of Robots Unlimited because of your excellent record in government service. Your background of loyalty is impeccable. Thank you, but what is it you're trying to say, Mr. Clement? We're expecting that you cooperate with us in this matter. Well, of course. Just tell me what it is that you want me to do. Well, at the moment, Winston and I would like the run of this building and the grounds. Very well. Feel free to go anywhere. Then, later on today, we'll probably have another talk with you. Anytime at all. Good. I don't think I have to tell you how important it is that we find Professor Dean as soon as possible. Now, that's rather obvious, Mr. Clemens. The professor's knowledge of robotics can be a very dangerous thing if... For instance, you were kidnapped by a foreign power. Exactly. Well, thank you for everything. Uh, gentlemen, if there's anything else that you need, just let me know. We will, and uh, thanks again. Thank you. Gosh.
Carson here calling Frank B. This is Frank B., Mr. Carson. Did you monitor my conversation with the government investigator? Yes, sir. Do you have any orders concerning them? Just this. Cooperate with them in every way. But watch them carefully. Very carefully. could get lost in this maze of passages. Yep. What's that? What? Yep, tapping. Tapping? Yep, there it is again. It's coming from behind this wall. Mr. Garson, there's someone behind this wall. Oh, I'm sorry you felt you had to come down here, Mr. Clements. I insist that you... There's no me. need to insist. There are rooms behind this wall. How do we get to them? Simply by moving this panel. It's a cell. Who, who's that? Come along, Mr. Clements. Meet Professor D. As you can see, the professor is unharmed. Why do you have him tied and gagged? Because he knows certain words that activate the robot. Oh. Here they come now. Mr. Garson. I insist that you release Professor Dean. I'm sorry. No. I order you to. Come now. Put away that gun. What do you want us to do, Mr. Garson? Take Mr. Clements to a cell. No. No, they can't carry out that order. Why not, Mr. Clements? Because of the first law of robotics. Robots aren't permitted to harm humans. But they don't intend to harm you. Hey, let me go. See? They're gentle, but very strong. Take him away, please. You... I have a good answer for all this, Carson. Well, I think I do. Yes, Professor Dean. Oh, believe me, we don't enjoy keeping you prisoner. And we'll set you free just as soon as you change your mind. Oh, no. No. Well, I'm a patient man, Professor. The emergency alarm. Mr. Garson... Please come to your office. Yes, Frank B., what is it? We found Agent Winston in the file room. How did he get in there? It must have happened while you were downstairs with Mr. Clements. I detailed some R5s to help you. There was a mistake in the assignments, and the file room was left unguarded for a moment. He must have slipped in. Where is he now? In the waiting room. <laughs> Mr. Garson, I think you better tell these robot friends of yours to let me go. I'm afraid that's not possible, Mr. Winston. Now look, the kid gloves are off. I suggest that you cooperate and tell us all you know. It'll go a lot easier with you. You see, I had a good look through your file. So? I found a lot of information on Professor Dean, incidentally. Uh, do we have to speak in front of these robots? Why? Do they make you nervous, Mr. Winston? Yes. They do. Why? Have you forgotten the first law of robotics? They can't harm you. However, if you insist, I'll ask them to leave. Oh, Frank B., if you don't mind. Not at all, Mr. Garson. We'll go. Now, Mr. Winston, we were speaking about Professor Dean in the files. Please go on. After I read through certain papers in the files, it looked to me like a fantastic plot was taking form. A plot? Against our government in particular and against humanity in general. Well, that is fantastic, Mr. Wilson. Oh, please don't act so charmingly coy, Mr. Garson. You're part of it. You've got to be. How could Robots Unlimited be plotting against the government? Our our fives are unable to harm humans. Well, the first law of robotics is an inherent part of their makeup. And don't forget, 
If we were using robots to overthrow the government, well, we'd have the army to contend with. The first law would operate against them. Mm -hmm. That's what you want people to think. Yes, the R-5s obey the first law. And while the first law applies, you can't carry out your plan. That's where Professor Dean comes in. Oh? The professor was working on a new robot model when he disappeared. A model that does not obey the first law. A robot that would carry out an order to kill. Ah, now we begin to see the ramifications of this fantastic plot. Huh? You have 800 R5s and more than 500 R4s that you're modifying. Now, that doesn't take into account the robots you're probably manufacturing in secret. In secret? Oh, you didn't see that in the files. Well, I saw enough to put you on trial for treason. If I'm to be executed as a traitor, why should I help you? I told you. We can make it easier for you. <laughs> By we, I assume you mean Mr. Clements and yourself. That's huh? right. Ah, uh, but I'm afraid Mr. Clements is in no position to help anyone. What do you mean? Listen. Garson here. Connect me with Mr. Clements' cell, please. Cell? You're connected, Mr. Garson. Clements? Clements, this is Garson. Garson, listen to me. If you don't let me out of this cell, so help me out. Well, I trust that convinces you, Mr. Winston. You see, your friend Clements made the mistake of wandering into a restricted area, just as you did. Who's giving the orders? You or Professor Dean? Professor Dean is in the cell next to Clements. I should have known. You kidnapped him. Yes. The professor was not amenable to my plan. You see, Professor Dean not only made a robot that did not obey the first law, but in doing so, he found a way to nullify the first law in other robots. And has he told you how to do it? He can't have. Not if you've got him in a cell. He will. And then I'll nullify the first law in all robots. And as they're tuned to my voice, they will obey my orders. Oh, by the way, there's something that isn't in the file room. I don't have to manufacture robots in secret factories. Robots can reproduce themselves. It's very simple. Each robot will manufacture another. Double a penny 30 times, Mr. Winston, and you get over a million pennies. In no time at all, I'll have a huge army of indestructible machines. What's happened to you, Garson? No one in government service had a better record than you. You were the last man we thought would turn true. You don't know me very well, Mr. Winston. That's just about the biggest understatement I've ever heard. <laughs> and we thought Professor Dean was the security risk. The professor has an IQ of 195, yet he's a fool. By helping me, he could be the most powerful man in the world. I cannot understand men like him or you. Spoken like a true paranoiac. <laughs> Isn't it strange? You devise a perfect form of government, an infallible method of controlling the world, and you're called insane. Remember, Mr. Winston, robots are not susceptible to bribery. They can't be blackmailed or intimidated or flattered or fooled. Can you say the same about our politicians and government office holders? Can you? No. Nope. Uh, We're all fallible. And you're at least as fallible as the rest of it. No, and what makes you say that? Because you're wrong. Your plan just won't work. Why not? Because your plan depends on Professor Dean. He's a dedicated scientist. He knows that if he alters the first law of robotics, whatever happens will be his responsibility. This is why he won't help you. No matter what you do to it. Ah, but he will help me for the simple reason that he is only human. Sooner or later, he'll weaken it's only a matter of time. You're fast running out of time, Mr. Nothing Carson. Nothing can stop me. Oh, maybe I can. <laughs> oh, what good is locking that door going to do? I'm going to kill you, Mr. Garson. No oh, gun, just like Clements. You all run so true to form. Put it away. You leave me no alternative but to kill you. Do you think shooting me will stop my plan? Without you, the robots would have no leader. And they won't do anything to me for killing you because they'll obey the first law. Ah, oh, I see your reasoning. You think you'll get rid of me and then free the professor and Clement. No, Garson, don't move toward me. <laughs> what are you afraid of? You have a gun. Don't take another step. Well, shoot, Mr. Winston. Shoot. All right. <laughs> you with every shot. Everyone. You. You must be. A robot? Yes. Yes, I am. You see, the real Garson is dead. I had my face made in his image. When you and Clements are dead, two robots will be made in your image. The same thing will ultimately happen to the professor. That's 
that's my real plan, Mr. Winston. Robots won't have to fight the army or anyone else. We'll just step into your shoes, each and every one of you. But you haven't found a way to nullify the first law yet. Not yet. Until you do, a robot can't kill. It must obey the first law. All but one robot, Mr. Winston. The one Professor Dean made just before he disappeared. The robot to which the first law of robotics does not apply. You. You. Yes. You. I. I. Am. That. Robot, Mr. Winston. The New Order, written by Don Harry and directed by Ted Bell. In the cast, Jay Barney, Bob Dryden, Jack Manning, Jack Grimes, and Owen Jordan. Audio engineer, Neil Pulse. Sound technician, Ed Blaney. Script editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlastopchenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Edward A. Byron. We would appreciate your comments. Write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... control that vital steering mechanism within each of us that determines whether or not we turn a certain corner, cross a crucial street, choose the right or the left fork in a road. In essence, we control that special moment that will determine the course of the rest of our lives. What you say is impossible, Professor. I can do it, Your Excellency. I am a scientist, and I tell you it can be done. I can send a man back, back into time. Oh, insanity. And once I've sent this person back, I will have changed everything. Because history hinges on just one man. And who might that be? You, of course, General. You. <laughs> mystery drama, A Point of Time, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Victoria Dan and stars Norman Rose and Jackson Beck. It is sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule, and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Welcome to the year 2052. Welcome to the celebration. The celebration of what? Uh, but of course, how could you know? It's the Jubilee. The 25th anniversary of the new regime of the great North Continent. The commemoration of one quarter century of perfectly planned peace. Of carefully controlled tranquility. In all, an era of imperiously imposed rules and regulations. But... Is such a state so undesirable? After all, personal freedom is not too high a price to pay for prosperity. His Excellency, the Supreme High Commander of the Great North Continent, spirit and guiding hand of the new regime, General Franklin Ulysses Morgan. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, loyal citizens, we are assembled here today 
to observe this, our glorious 25th birthday. A quarter century ago today, the great revolution laid to rest forever the cruel inefficiency and waste of the old regime. But all the old ways have not completely disappeared. We must remain eternally vigilant, ever watchful of the malignant seed of dissent that lies hidden, still capable of destroying the cohesiveness of our society. Still, this is a day of celebration, not of fear. Today we are filled with joy. And so, in the name of the new regime of our great North continent, I officially open this jubilee. Let the festivities begin! <laughs> Why did you turn the set off? We have to talk, Otto. This very minute? I was watching the general himself. This is serious. It was most interesting, Nita. He called us the malignant seed of dissent. <laughs> not very flattering, is it? My dear brother, any minute of now... Of course, it's not flattering. But I really do believe he means well. The general means well? Yes. Oh. You see... I understand what motivates the man more clearly now. You mean you didn't understand before? I don't believe I've ever seen you so agitated, Lita. Shall I tell you why, Otto? It's quite simple. Our entire plan hinges on the fact that you understand General Morgan. Lita, dearest, I actually believe you're losing faith in me. Oh, I just don't know. This whole idea of yours, it's too fantastic. Inspired genius, that's what it is. Inspired insanity is more like it. Too many things could go wrong. And I'm not even talking about the displacement process yet. That's another thing altogether. Those calculations of yours are going to have to be so precise. I have always been a master of precision, little sister. Oh, Otto, face that. We're old. Too old to be revolutionaries. Ah, visitors approaching oh. from the rear vestibule. Oh, no. Too old, you say? Well, obviously not too old to be arrested. How do you know it's the special police? I made sure my disloyal remarks were heard by the right ears. Bad news travels fast. Oh, Otto, please. Let's reconsider the whole plan. I'm frightened. Don't be, Lita. As you say, I'm an old man. What can they possibly do to me? Incarcerate you, interrogate you, torture you. Oh, make it sound so grim. Discipline must be maintained. They have to make an example of someone. They need a human sacrifice. In what better time than the Jubilee? <gasps> They're here. Open this door at once. Well, Lita, release the auto lock and let the gentleman in. What if the plan doesn't work? We have to take that chance. Open immediately or we'll blast the door open. Otto, what if the general doesn't agree to your plan? Open the door, Lita. But what if he suspects me? Suspects such a sweet little old lady? Oh, come now. Oh, it could all be for nothing. For nothing. We're coming in, Professor. <laughs> Professor Otto Segrum. Yes? I'm Colonel Edward Paul of the Special Police. How do you do? It is my duty to inform you that you have been charged with treasonous and contemptible acts against the state. I see. I'm also obliged to advise you of your rights. My rights? I wasn't aware one had any rights under the new regime. Ah, but you're mistaken. You have the right to resist arrest, and should you resist, I have the right to shoot you. Well, I assure you I won't put up a fight, Colonel. Oh, please, Colonel. My brother is not a well man. Old woman, I warn you not to interfere with this procedure. Come along, Professor. Of course, of course. Otto! Remember, my dear, remember the Latin, Carpe Diem. Oh, yes, Otto. Carpe Diem. Benson. Yes, Your Excellency. Close that window. What, sir? That infernal racket is making my head explode. But it's the people, sir. I don't care. But it's you they're cheering. It is giving me a headache. Just close it. Very well, sir. Now, what is it? I pressed your other uniform, sir. My uniform? What on earth for, Benson? The interrogation, sir. What interrogation? Well, sure, you haven't forgotten. Uh, I assumed you'd been informed. Informed of what? Believe me, General, the last thing I want to do is provoke another incident between you and Colonel Paul. Colonel Paul? What does he have to do with this? 
Sir, an hour ago, Colonel Paul, accompanied by two officers of the elite guard, took into custody Professor Otto Segrum. Who? Otto Segrum, the physicist. But he's 90 years old. But they say he's the acknowledged unofficial leader of the underground. Oh, what is Colonel Paul up to? I'm telling you what I heard. Heard from where? I'd rather not... Where, Benson? I, uh... I have a cousin in the motor pool. So, Colonel Edward Paul thinks he can go around arresting fruitcake scientists and not tell me. Fruitcake? Huh? Uh, an old expression, Benson. It means having a brain baked with crazy notions. And I think I know what Colonel Paul's game is. You do? Otto Segrim is a harmless old eccentric, and everybody knows it. But Paul wants to score points with a high counsel on this one. He'll goad and deride that old professor into making some sort of confession. A malignant seed of dissent, snuffed out by the illustrious colonel. <laughs> and where will I, General Morgan, be when this triumph is occurring? In bed asleep? Well, just don't stand there, Benson. Bring me my uniform. Yes, sir. Now, who would have a gall at this hour? His most exalted residence. Johnson, main gate. I've just security cleared the general's visitor. What visitor? Lieutenant Johnson, the general is not expecting any visitors. Sir, the appointment roster confirms an audience with Citizen Smith at this hour. Citizen Smith? Oh, oh yes, Citizen Smith. I'd forgotten. Uh, very well. Disengage inner security screens. Yes, sir. Out. General, forgive me, but I had forgotten all about it. Mm-hmm. Now, why wasn't I told of an audience? I'm sorry, sir. It slipped my mind until this moment. I refuse to see anyone at this hour. But you have to see Citizen Smith. Who the devil is Citizen Smith? Phoenicia Smith, sir. Grandmother of the year. Who? Grandmother of the year, General. The embodiment of gentleness and virtue. The matron saint of the state. It's traditional. Even the hour of reception is traditional. I cannot be bothered. I would caution you, sir, not to flaunt tradition in a jubilee year. There are many uh, opponents of yours who would happily misconstrue such an action. That's her now. Shall I release the auto lock? Oh, Benson, is this going to take long? Well, if I may suggest, sir, do what you do every year. Shake her hand, offer her a toast, and send her away with a personally monogrammed souvenir new regime pen. All right, let's get it over with. You may enter his presence. Your Excellency, may I present Citizen Phoenicia Smith. Charmed. This is an honor. Uh, oh, yes, Citizen Smith. I I would like to shake your hand. Oh, thank you, Your Excellency. Sir, if you will excuse me for a moment, I will attend to your uniform. <clears throat> now, uh... Uh, may I uh, offer you a drink, citizen? Oh, no. No, thank you, sir. Yes. Well, before you go, uh, I would like to present you with a small token of our esteem. Oh, an old-fashioned ballpoint pen. How lovely. I'll treasure it always. Now, I would love to chat with you longer, Citizen Smith, but, but you see, there are some pressing matters of state to attend to. I have a confession to make, sir. I am not Citizen Smith. What? I am not Grandmother of the Year, although I have her identification ring. I'm Lita Segrim. Segrim? My brother Otto uses a little phrase. Latin, I believe. Copper, him, seize the opportunity, grab the chance. Now, wait, wait, just one moment, please. What is this all about? So that's what I did. I grabbed the chance. Phoenicia Smith is rather comfortably locked away. I took her place. So you see, sir. I shook hands with you instead. <laughs> oh, yes. You mean to tell me that that you took all that trouble just to shake my hand? But of course, Your Excellency. This sweet old lady's little gloved hand shook your uncovered one. Carpe diem. Your skin has already absorbed the chemical film coating from the outside of my glove. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, what are you trying to say? I'm trying to say, General, that you have just been poisoned. Oh. 
History and legend are filled with examples of lethal brews administered to unknowing victims in the spirit of goodwill. In a way, then, it's almost an insult to think that the most friendly, amenable tradition, the handshake, can be transformed into a deadly ritual. But the unkindest cut, you cannot even trust a sweet little old lady to be just a sweet little old lady, is nothing sacred. We'll find out shortly when I return with Act Two. The author is Horace, a wise and noble sage who walked the earth 2,000 years ago. What he actually wrote was Carpe diem qua minimum credula postero. Translation Seize the day, put no trust in tomorrow. Indeed, the only thing one can trust is the moment. Tomorrow may never come. On the other hand, tomorrow may come, surely enough. But what good is it if we are not there to see it arrive? A hundred years or so in the future, the most powerful man in our tactfully unnamed country is faced with an interesting dilemma. What did you say? You have been poisoned, Your Excellency. Poisoned? (laughs) By you? Oh, it's... Just like Otto told me it would be, that you wouldn't believe me. Now, listen, I do not have time for crude assassination attempts, Miss Segram. In fact, my patience with you is at an end. Well, then it is true what they say. You really do believe that you're indestructible. Now, I will be willing to forget the entire incident if you would kindly leave, Miss Segram. I've heard rumors, but naturally I didn't believe them. It cost millions, but you do have something that protects your stomach lining. Please, Miss Segram, you're a nice old lady. I don't want to put you under arrest. But nothing will protect you against the chemical you have just absorbed through the skin. It's a different matter entirely. Oh, wait a minute. Old lady, you called me an old lady. Miss Segram, I am being much more tolerant than I ought to be. Old lady? Why, I'm the same age as you. Maybe even younger. I admit, with modern science, you look, oh, 50, 55, but you're about 78, 79 now. Miss Tegram, if you do not get... Uh, 79? That's ridiculous. Is it? I don't know where you get your figures. You really don't know, do you? You really don't understand yet. What are you talking about? Time, General. Time. Sooner or later, we all run out of it. But you, you think you can go on forever. I want you out of this building immediately. It's merely due to my... My good nature that you don't suffer anything worse. It's you who will suffer, General. In an hour or so, you will feel a slight tingling sensation in your fingers, followed by tremors in the arms and legs, and then a sudden dizziness, all of which will disappear shortly. But they are all indications that the poisonous chemical has entered its final phase. Are you telling me that you would prefer to be arrested? Listen to me for just one minute. Very well. You have one minute, Miss Segrim. What has my brother done that is wrong? I'll tell you, General, though I suspect you won't believe me. Well, I'm waiting. He found a way to be young again. What? It's very complex. It's it's chemistry, physics. Oh, I don't know exactly what it is. But it has to do with space. He can take a person, any person, and place them right where they were any time in the past. Right into the space they were in a year ago, ten years ago, fifty years ago. You have half a minute left. Oh, how can I explain it? It's like moving figures on a chessboard. Except the squares represent spaces in time. And whatever point you move into, you become exactly what you were at that moment. Exactly the same physically, mentally. A person could even live their life over again. Well... Do you understand me? Of course, they would live it over exactly the same. Because nothing else in the past had changed. Miss Segram, your time is up. You still don't understand? My brother has created a time machine. Miss Segram, I could not care less. But you will, General. In a very short time, you will. Because, you see, time is something of which you have Precious little. Sergeant, I gave strict orders to let no... Let no one what? 
General. <laughs> you seem somewhat surprised to see me. What are you doing here, Your Excellency? I might ask you the same question. I was interrogating the prisoner, sir. Oh. Well, what prisoner would that be? Professor Otto Sagram. Oh, indeed. I, um... Well, that is we arrested him this evening. That's odd. I do not recall signing any arrest certificate. Well, you didn't. Exactly. Then whose authority were you operating under? My own, sir. Uh Uh-huh. You're taking on a lot more authority these days, aren't you, Colonel Paul? Well, I'm sure you would have approved if Your Excellency was acquainted with the case. Indeed. And why was I not acquainted with the case? Well, I did not wish to disturb Your Excellency at such a late hour. Oh, how thoughtful. I would have informed Your Excellency first thing in the morning. You seem to be taking a lot of initiative lately, Colonel. Well, I was forced to act quickly, sir. Oh. This man is a menace to the state. (laughs) Otto Segrup. You must be joking. He's a known subversive. Colonel, Colonel... You know, you've been reading your own press releases again. Well, I can produce 50 witnesses who will swear. Oh, I'm sure that you can. But he must be tried and executed. Of course he must be executed. By tomorrow morning, the public will demand it. The people want justice done. Yes, I'm quite sure that you have seen to that. Now, forgive me, Your Excellency, but uh, I get the impression that you dislike the idea of a public execution. Now, I am tired of all these executions, Colonel. All right, sir. How many do we have? Fifty, sixty a year? Executions are the safeguard of the regime. Am I to understand that you no longer... Don't pro- put words in my mouth, Colonel. Well, I wasn't... All right, you. all right. I'm obliged to execute Segrum. But between us, Colonel, how is a 93-year-old man a threat to the regime? There's been talk, General. Oh, enlighten me. He has been working on a certain device. What kind of device? He remarked to a colleague that he had invented a mechanism that could change the course of history. Yes. Well, don't you see? Could only be one thing. What? A bomb. You you have evidence, of course. Well, uh... I mean, your men searched the laboratory, of course. Yes, sir. And? We didn't find anything as of yet. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, uh, (laughs) Colonel. Sir? Uh, Colonel, you are... A jackass! Your Excellency, I'm only doing my job. And mine, perhaps. General, I have to interrogate a prisoner. You are dismissed. But the prisoner... I will proceed with the interrogation. (laughs) Professor Otto Segrim. Your Excellency, this is an honor. Let's dispense with the traditional hard cell and customary torture. And you just confess immediately. Confess to what? Criminal and traitorous acts against the regime. I have nothing to confess. Well, confess anyway. It looks better. What do you mean, it looks better? Well, you know, on the execution decree. You'd actually execute an old man. Professor, you are old. I am old. Who isn't old? What does chronological age mean nowadays? Look at me. Just look at me. How how old would you say I am? Fifty? Fifty-five? Yes, I am 78. That's the miracle of modern science. You don't feel at all strange. What do you mean, strange? Tingling in your fingers? Mm, No. A little dizziness, perhaps? I am the one who is doing the interrogating. Didn't my sister pay you a visit this evening? Yes. A very attractive woman, but for her age. Deliberately tried to provoke me. She told me... We spoke briefly... But let us get down to business now, shall we, Professor? There is no antidote, you know. You know, I, I, I regret having to execute you in the morning, but it's one of those irreversible situations. So is salicylic dimeth compound C42, the poison that is slowly penetrating your blood. So hold on, Professor. Your sister tried to convince me that I had been poisoned, but neither of you understands that... You seem remarkably unperturbed for a poisoned general. Let me enlighten you. I am unperturbed because I cannot be poisoned. I am immune. Is that a fact? You think others haven't tried to assassinate me before? General. I haven't held on to this job for 25 years because I'm lucky. I... Well, I can tell you. I never get into my car until after it's been checked. I always wear a blast shield. And my stomach lining and the skin cells have been permanently treated with a special, unique chemical 
that immediately neutralizes any corrosive or poison. I know. I created it some 20 years ago. <laughs> no, it was formulated by my scientist, General in Chief. I know him very well. Old pupil of mine. Bit of a scoundrel, though. Well, since I created the protective chemical, I also created the destructive answer to it. Huh? I don't believe you. I think you should start feeling the discomfort by now. Professor, I have been more than patient with you, and... But why am I discussing chemistry? Physics. Now, there's an adventure. Distance. Space. Time. An infinity of wonder in a single point. Oh! Something the matter, Your Excellency? Uh, no. Your hands are shaking? It's nothing, it's nothing. Yes, your hands are shaking. The poison has taken effect. No, you're wrong now. Now, what's the matter with your feet? Can't you keep your balance? No, I have to, to sit down for a moment. It's these, well, it's these new boots. I told Benson a hundred times to break them in for me. The dizziness? Uh, no, it's impossible. I would give you, on the outside, another six or seven hours. Oh, oh my, my clipboard, I, I... I lost my grip. But of course you did. It can't be. And now, General Morgan, we arrive at the logical conclusion, the uh, terminus of this situation. What? What do you want? I ask very little. What? You tell me. I want you to let me change the course of history. It is believed because it is absurd. It is certain because it is impossible. This is commonly known as Tertullian's rule of faith. Notice how we repeatedly refer back to ancient Romans for present-day wisdom. What is absurd, after all? The absurdities of yesterday have become the commonplace of today. And so isn't it only logical that the impossibilities of the present are merely the sure things of the future? And you may be sure of one thing in the immediate future... I'll be back shortly with Act Three. Else whence this pleasing hope, this fond desire, this longing after immortality. So spoke the poet. He knew, as well as Jono, each of us longs to live forever. The bravest among us can become the most shriveled coward in the face of death. Reduced to our most primitive fear, man strikes out and fights, but more often begs, pleads for an extension of this heavenly loan. The general is dying. There is no antidote, unless it lies in the bizarre request that has just been made. You want me to allow you, Professor Segrim, to change the course of history? Correct, General. Well, how can I allow you to do anything? I, I'm, I'm dying, just remember. You're dying now. But not if you let me send you back in time. Send me back in time? That's right. Back to a time. A space in which you are unaffected by this poison. Any moment in your past life. Time is my chess game, General. I can move you around like a grandmaster. Yes, your sister tried to explain this gibberish to me. Gibberish? Time travel is impossible. What if I told you it was possible? Very possible. What if I believed you? What would be the point? The point? <laughs> How appropriate. The entire universe is a point, General. Multiplying itself into an infinite line. Becoming upon itself a square. Squaring itself into a cube. Cubing itself into other dimensions. Space becomes more and more cluttered. Time exists side by side. The past, the present, the future. All from a single point. Oh, you're crazy. No, General. The world is crazy. But I remain a fixed point in the maelstrom. Oh, why have you done this to me? What do you hope to gain? A new life. But why do you need me? If, if you think you can go back in time, why don't you just go? Because my going back would change little. I would do the same things all over again. But you... Me? 
But that's where your reasoning falls apart, Professor Sagram. You cannot change history. You send me back, I would do the same things over again, too. Of course. That is, if all other things remained unchanged, if every incident repeated itself, if you met all the people in your life again, however... However, what? Suppose that events were to be changed just slightly. What if you met a person you didn't meet the first time around? A person who would change your entire destiny. I do not believe a word of this. You, you said that I'm dying. There's nothing I can do to change that. But you, Professor, you still will be executed. God, God! What will you tell the God that you have been poisoned? Uh, they are all faithful retainers of Colonel Edward Paul. The news will be a source of great rejoicing. How can I just be standing here calmly talking to you? Why aren't you torturing me for an antidote? I don't know. It's because you know it's useless to fight. Oh, what's the matter with me? Maybe this is all a trick. You know it isn't. I don't want to die. You don't have to die. But you said... What is a point in time but a crux of events? A certain hinge on which key decisions swing. A pivot steering through the wave of the past. Look... Old man, none of this makes sense. If I go back in time, I'll be young again. Fine. There's no poison in my bloodstream, right? But there's also memory of the future. I'm not older. I'm not wiser. I'm the same. Exactly the same person I was before at that moment in time. So, it's... It's useless. No one can change the past. I need you, Morgan. You are the hub. Without you, there would have been no uprising in 21. No great revolution. The country would have had a different destiny. A more gentle, a happier destiny. Oh, it would have been inefficient, unplanned, lawless. But would it have been so evil? Evil? If you could only see the evil, then you would understand. Your Excellency. Well, what do you want, Colonel? I have most urgent business. Well, can't it wait? It cannot. The regime high council requests your presence at once. What? Now? An emergency session, sir. Again, Colonel, I was not informed. As you are aware, General, the council has the undisputed right to convene at any time without prior consent of the Supreme High Commander. I still want to know... Are you in some kind of pain, sir? Well, me? No. No, not at all. You, uh... You don't look at all well. Colonel, I I hate to disappoint you, but you see, I, I, I've never felt better in my life. And so, Your Excellency, and fellow members of the Council, because we are all agreed that a state of emergency exists, we urge that this can be adopted. Now, let, let me get this straight. You actually propose to place this drug in the public water system. Correct, Your Excellency. But as I understand it, this drug renders the individual docile to the point of near idiocy. That is not quite so, Excellency. Then what is so? Excellency, another outstanding point of this plan is that it avoids the necessity of bloodshed. <sighs> you, you are out of order, Colonel Paul. Well, uh, Council Member McGuinn, does or does this drug not cause permanent damage to the brain? Sir, are you feeling all right? You appear slightly... Answer my question. The long-run effects have not yet been ascertained. However, there is a slight possibility that some minor damage to less important areas of the brain could be attributed... This entire proposal is insane. The people must be controlled, Excellency. You've always said that. Yes, yes, I know, but not as sheep, Colonel. The regime is threatened, sir. From where? By... Who? Just look around you. From everywhere. Yes, yes, there is a threat. There always is a threat. But not the way you think. A threat to sanity. A threat to clear thinking. A threat to sound judgment. I move that we call this proposition to a vote. Out of order. Ah, yes, let's call it to a vote. I, I second the motion. Yes, yes you, I do too. Yes. You, all of you, wish to vote on such a depraved idea. General... We demand the vote. Yes, yes, yes. Very well. Very well. Propose that all public reservoirs in District 8 be treated with large quantities of the nerve drug 
Boromil. All those members in favor, show hands. Opposed? I see. The resolution passes. No. Your Excellency, you've been outvoted. I said no. But the vote was unanimous. I veto it. Then we'll call another vote for tomorrow. And I will veto it tomorrow. And the day after? I... Well, of course I will. You weren't planning to be absent for any subsequent <sighs> vote, were you, sir? Because then the resolution would be immediately carried. I... I will be here. <laughs> Segrim, you said that there is some kind of solution, something crazy, impossible, but a solution. Yes, General. Well, I, I put my faith in anything. Now, what is this deal that you want to make? You let me go. That's it. All I need is an hour. Oh, what can you do in an hour? Change the course of history. You keep saying that. I, I still don't believe that you can. A point in time. A terminus from which all events radiate. You really believe that you can take me back in time? Precisely. Back to before I was poisoned? Yes. You can change events? That part is theory. I can move you in a space of time like a bubble. Pluck you from one moment. Place you into another. Oh, I almost believe that you're crazy enough to be able to do it. I can place you back as you were years ago. How many years Back to a terrace 50 years ago. Music playing in the room inside. Old-fashioned kind of dance music. You know the kind, don't you? Oh, yes, I know the kind. The band was playing inside. But you, alone, unmoved, stood outside, deciding at that instant the course the rest of your life would take. Do you remember that night? Yes. Yes, I remember... I was 28 years old, going on 29, and I wasn't dancing. How could I? It was her engagement party. I hated her for hurting me that way, but I had to come and see what he looked like for myself. That's when you decided, wasn't it? Yes. Yes, that's when I decided. It was a turning point in your life, wasn't it? Yes. You were embittered. And you decided to enter the military and make a career for yourself. Yes. You became cold and calculating. But what if you had met someone else that night? Would things have been different? Uh, who's to say? I didn't meet anyone else, though. But if you had... Well, I don't know. A nice, gentle girl who would have brought out the gentleness in you. No, no, it's too late to wallow in conjecture. What, what is past is past. Perhaps... Perhaps not. If you hadn't been a general, you might have been a doctor, a writer, who knows, even a president. Uh, there is no presidency that hasn't been for 25 but years. But there might still be a presidency. The government might still be a democracy. If there hadn't been a revolution led by you. Segrava. Segrava. What's happening to me? Are the images clear? What am I feeling? What am I seeing? You've passed, oh. General, like any dying oh. man. Your life is flashing before you. Don't understand. Why are you doing this to me? You understand. Don't let me die, Sigurd. But of course you won't die. Don't let me die. The council votes again tomorrow. Release me and uh. I promise that the council will never vote at all because it will not exist. Can you really change things? Yes, it's possible, but you have to let me send you back. I'll be just as I was. I'll have no memory of the future. It won't matter. But I'll, I'll simply repeat my life over exactly up to this moment. Not if I send her back to... What? Send who back? The girl you should have met. The girl who might have changed your life. What girl? If you had stayed on that terrace a few seconds longer, you might have met her. I'm not changing events. I'm altering individual bubbles of space, moving yours slightly ahead so that you remain on that terrace just a few moments longer than you did so long ago. But who would I have met? Who, Sigrid? My sister, Lita. Lita? You remarked before that she was attractive. Lita, but, 
But she's old. She's old now. But she wouldn't be if I sent her back 50 years uh, ago. She'd be 25. Like this whole thing's crazy. You're a dying man. Like the old adage, you're drowning and I'm throwing you a life preserver. Uh, you might not believe in the life preserver, but it's the only one in the water. I want to believe that you can change things. Get me out of here uh, so I can send you both back. I wish I could believe. Then in the name of heaven, let me try. God. 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 I want this man released into my custody. Are you both ready, Lita? Yes, Arto. Miss Segrip, if this machine of your brother's actually works, we will be meeting again. Yes, we'll be meeting again, General. But neither of us will remember any of this. I know. That's why it's Chad. You see, I like you now. <laughs> I, I like you now. But will you like me then? Will you? How are engaged now? Remember, remember, not everyone can get a chance to change the course of history. What do you want? I, I didn't realize anyone was out here. Oh, I just wanted some fresh air. Well, who are you? I don't remember seeing you inside. It's funny. I just got here. I was about to start a dance with my boyfriend, but suddenly I'm outside here. Oh, you, you came with your boyfriend? Well, he's not really a boyfriend. Just a date. What's your name? Lita. Lita? Mm -hmm. Hey, very pretty name. Thank you. But then, <laughs> you're a very pretty girl. <laughs> Well, you're rather nice yourself, Mr... Uh, Morgan. Ulysses Morgan. Uh, you know, a minute ago, I was depressed and bitter, unhappy. But now... Yes? I have a question to ask you. Well, ask me. Lita, where have you been all my life? Indeed, where? A very innocent question. But this time, the answer might be a little out of the ordinary. Another question we might ask is, have we changed the course of history? All we've really done is put a little romance into young Mr. Morgan's life. But do we have any guarantee that he won't turn out exactly the way he did before? Or is love such a magic ingredient after all? I'll be back shortly. Turn backward, O oh time, in your flight. Make me a child again, just for tonight. So goes the verse of Miss Allen. Is there really only one moment, one crucial moment, that if lived over differently, could change the course of our lives, and perhaps even the lives around us? We are, after all, part of one great tapestry, and the threads of each individual life weave together to form the whole. Our cast included Norman Rose, Jackson Beck, Ralph Bell, and Evie Juster. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Escape. 
designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. You are on a planet of desolation and utter ruin, awaiting the return of your comrades to carry you to safety. While the remains of life about you, crawling and evil, are slowly hemming you in and ruthlessly tracking you down to your death. Listen now as Escape brings you Charles Smith's unusual story, North of Polaris. Testing. One, two, three, four. You read me, Joe? Loud and clear. R5, S5. All ready, sir. How is he? Well, how do you feel, Mac? Scared, sir. Now take your time out there. Be very sure. <clears throat> Shh. Quiet. Can you see him? Uh, not yet, sir. Uh, yes, sir, there he is. Mac, what's it like out there? Nothing much to see. You feel heavier or lighter than usual? Can you move about easily? Just like at home. What about atmosphere? I'm turning off my oxygen unit and opening the intake valve. Careful. Not too fast now. I've cut my supply completely, sir. Rescue party standing by, sir. Uh, it, it seems to be okay. Yes, sir, the air is good. Are you sure? It's okay. Send them out. From the port of the spaceship, we could see him calmly walking about on the surface of a planet approximately 20 million miles from our own. All 40 of us had drawn straws. Mac had won. And if we returned home safely, he would be remembered as the first man to touch the soil of an alien planet. Well, Joe? Well, I guess I'm as ready as I'll ever be, sir. Who else are you taking with you? Uh, Stoner. He's good with the camera. Sam, have you got your gear to ready? Joe, all set for the place. All right. Now, you know what to do. What I want. Yes, sir. Map the area as best you can. Bring me a report on water sources, mineral deposits, vegetation. And if you see any signs of life... Try to get pictures. But otherwise, avoid it. You can tell the others that's an order. Yes, sir. Do, uh, do you think there is life here, sir? Well, some of our best minds have always claimed there was. <laughs> well, when we get back, we'll set them straight, sir. <laughs> yeah. I'll make early drops and pick you up at this spot in 48 hours. So you're on your own. Good luck, Joe. Thank you, sir. Uh, Joe, do you, you notice anything wrong with this place? What do you mean, Mac? Well, look around. You see any trees, bushes, grass, anything growing? You see anything green? Yeah, that's right. Well, it's probably desert country. No, no, uh, look here. You feel the soil. What? It's rich enough. Gets plenty of sun, probably plenty of rain. Look at its color. Gray, dead. Maybe it's like the moon. Maybe this is just another moon. No, no, there's air here. There isn't any on the moon. How you know? You ever been there? Well, that's what they say, Sam. Sometimes they're wrong. Well, what now? Well, we got about five hours of daylight left. We'll head north. Uh, I don't like it. It's too quiet. Not even the wind. What are you trying to do, Mac? Don't you think we're jumpy enough? How long are they going to leave us here? Forty-eight hours. That could be a long time. <laughs> 
We started north. It was easy walking over the flat rolling land, easy because there were no trees or bushes or weeds. There was nothing. Nothing but the gray sky and the gray dead soil. I was beginning to think that maybe it was only a moon. And then we made camp for the night. Okay, come and get it. Well, look at here. Beans and K rations. Just what I wanted. Oh. Now watch your scans are hot. Now you tell me. Uh, you know the first thing I'm gonna do when I get home? Oh what? I'm going in the best restaurant in town and order the biggest steak in the joint. You're pretty sure you're going to get home, aren't you? Sure, I'm sure. Why aren't you, Mac? I don't know. Hey, want some coffee, Joe? Yeah, yeah, thanks. You married, Mac? Uh-huh. Any kids? Yeah, one, a little girl. She's five. Huh. What makes you volunteer for this trip? I don't know. Um, maybe I just had to. You understand that? Yeah, I think so. Hey, you know what I miss? The crickets. You know, at home you sit around a campfire, like at the lake. You hear the frogs and the crickets. <laughs> and slap the mosquitoes. Yeah. It's funny. Oh, what's that? Well, well here, here we are, 20 million miles away from our home. 20 million miles. And yet up there in the sky... We can still see it. Yeah, I wonder if anybody's looking at this stinking planet and wondering if we made it. Oh, sure they are. All the scientists, astronomers. I don't mean them. I mean... I them. know what you mean. You got a family, Sam? Only my mother. She lives... In this? Hmm? What? What is it? Something's out there. Moving. It was life. There was life here. And we could see it now, in the dim light given off by our heating unit. It was an ugly, four-legged beast with a hairless body. And from its odor, a scavenger. Like everything else here, it was the color of gray. Get out! Get out! Get out! Get out! All right, All right cut it out. Sam! Oh, that's real smart. We're supposed to be a photographer. Take pictures of what we find. Oh, here. lay off him, Joe. It was only a rat, a big rat. The day broke clean and bright. And we kept walking north during the job we'd set out to do. And there were no other signs of life. And we'd almost convinced ourselves that the rat had been a stowaway from our ship. For the first time, things felt right. Hey, Joe. What? Hold it. Uh, stop wasting that film. What's the matter? Don't you want your picture in the magazines? I've shot everything there is to shoot here. It's all going to look the same. Nothing. Yeah, I know. When we turn back? Tomorrow morning. Uh, there. Now, let's take a look around. What's the use? There's nothing to see. Hey, why don't we start back now? Joe? Joe? Mac? Come up here. What is it? On the double. Now take a look through these binoculars, Sam. Off to the east there. What do you see? Um, a lake. Yeah, maybe an ocean. Now swing around slowly to your left. No, easy. There. What do you make of that? I don't know. Well, what's up? Looks like clumps of stone or cement. Uh, take a look. Give him the glasses, sir. Yeah. Hey, could that be what's left of the city? If it is. If we found... Yeah! Yeah! Stop Sam! Me. Sam, you fool! Come back here! But he wasn't coming back. Not now. He'd found the subject for his camera and he was racing toward it. At the edge of the sprawling stone ruins, we caught up. And he made us turn with our backs to the city and pointed his camera at us. Welcome to the city. Hold it, both of you, right there. <laughs> I should have shaved. Hey, Mac, pick up a piece of that stone. I like this. Okay. Come on, what are you waiting for? Hold it. Mac, put that stone down. Hey, you think... Just I... put it down. 
What's the matter with you guys? Geiger counters acting up. Are you kidding? What could be radioactive around here? Mac, lower it near the ground. Well, what do you know? Radioactive? What is it, uranium? Pitch blood? What? No. Now, this isn't a natural composition. Yeah, then what? Look around you. Take a good look. What's it look like? Just stone, cement, ruins. What else? Look at the color of it. The edges. Yeah. Like it's been burnt. Scorched. Remember what our cities looked like? Uh, they wouldn't know about atomic energy here. What makes you so sure? I led them on into the sprawling corpse of the great metropolis until we stood near the jagged base of what once must have been a magnificent building. Mac? Yeah? Over there. What? The rats. Yeah, scrounging for food. Sure With each step we'd taken, the radiation had increased. And when it reached the danger point, we turned and started slowly back. We didn't say anything. We didn't need to. We had seen and we knew that this world, this civilization, had committed suicide. Uh, it's getting late. We'd better make camp. Well, this is as good a place as any, I guess. Oh. I don't know about you guys, but I'm pooped. Yeah, it's been a long day. You want to set up the stove, Mac? Yeah, might as well. The sky's clouding up in the south. Looks like a storm, bro. Uh, your film's safe, Sam? You think the radiation back there damaged it? No, nah, it's packed in heavy lead foil. Yeah. Cigarette, Joe? Yeah, yeah, thanks. So. Hmm. That's funny. No, what's that? Take a look out there. You no, know, south, I mean. It's not the sky that's clouding up. It looks like dust. A dust storm. Couldn't be. There's no wind. Take a look. Yeah, but there's no wind. Well, something's out there kicking up the dust. How far away you figure? It's hard to tell. Ten, maybe fifteen miles. Joe! Joe, look! What? There, to the right about a mile. You see him? Say what? No, 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 over to your left. Well, well, what is it? People. You're crazy. There's nothing out there. Two of them, they fell. I can't see them now either, but I did see them. There, now they're up again. Joe, he's right. The people like us. Hey! Oh, hey! All right, stop hey! it. Hey! Stop it. Stop it. Hey! Joe. Look, we've got orders to avoid contact with life here. But, Joe, they're people, human beings. You don't know what they are. Just because they resemble us physically, that doesn't mean a thing. But, Joe, we've got I... our orders. The ground's higher over there. Let's move over there where we can see them better. Come on. When we made it to the rise, we could see a man and a woman. Two people just like ourselves. Even what was left of their clothing was similar to ours. And they were running desperately. And then I looked beyond them and saw the cause of their fear. Stalking them, slowly closing the distance between them, were six of those great evil rats. We stood there silently watching the hunters and the hunted. And the longer we watched, the more it became certain that the rats could end the hunt whenever they wanted to. I could see their features now. The woman was much younger than the man. Their faces were distorted by panic and fear. And we watched and waited. And then the old man fell, and Sam and Mac were running, screaming, driving off the rats. Uh, are you all right? Uh, can you understand me? Yes. Where's my father? I must go back to him. Uh, the boys are with him. It's all right. You, you speak our language. Yes. But we were sure there wasn't anyone else in this sector. We thought they'd all gone. Gone where? South. They left us behind. They said he was too old, not worth the trouble. How many of you lived here? Eleven of us. Only eleven? Father and I started out yesterday morning. We thought we could meet them later. And then the rats... Where are you from? 
Outside. Then there is something left outside. Oh, yes. Oh, I was sure. I'd hoped. I knew it couldn't end here. Come on, we'd better get you back to camp now. Sleep. Gave him a set of it. She'll be all right, but I'm worried about the old man. Hey, Joe? Yeah. We've been talking. How can they know our language? How? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. You know, it's like our world, isn't it? After the atomic war, I mean. Yeah. I remember reading how the radioactive dust spread all over the land, killing everything. Grass, trees, animals, everything. Well, I guess the same thing happened here. You, you off your rocket, Joe, at 20 million miles apart. And our war was over 50 years ago. Look, don't you think it's possible that life on another planet could have started, advanced, and progressed step by step with ours? Oh, Joe, now you're talking like something out of one of those science fiction magazines. Well, well, what's the matter? Can't, can't your ego accept it? Do we have to be the greatest, the super beings? Everything else in the universe is subhuman? Oh, wait a minute, Joe. Oh, knock it off. Let's hit the sack. Okay. It might be a good idea if one of us stood watch while the other two slept. How about it? Huh? Sure. Well, I'll take the first lap, and then you, Sam, and then Mac. Each of us will do three hours, huh? Yeah. And I'll try to get some sleep. The three hours passed quickly. My mind was racing, asking if this world was a parallel to our own world. Were all the worlds of the universe alike? I was trying to find the answer when Sam relieved me. And I still hadn't found it when I dropped off to sleep. But I didn't sleep very long. Sam! Sam! Oh, good Lord, Scratch, he must have dozed off. Come on! Sam, just as the sun rose full above the horizon. And then as we turned to walk back to camp, we saw it. The sky to the south was black with dust. It was closer now, much closer than the day before. And whatever it was out there was moving straight for us. What do you make of it, Joe? I don't know. Oh, uh, Jean. Yes? Uh... Does your father feel well enough to travel? Oh, he's much better. He wants to talk to you. All right. Joe, how far are we from our rendezvous point? Oh, about 12 miles. Have you noticed the dust to the south? Yes. I, uh, I was hoping that you could tell us what it was, sir. It is the army. The what? The army. The great army of the rats. The others... Those you saw yesterday and this morning, they were the scouts. Out there is the main force. Well, why only rats? Why no other animals? When, when the war started, the rats were already immune to radiation. They thrived on it. When all other life perished. But why? We did it. We made them immune. We used them... In our early atomic experiments, generation after generation, and generation by generation, their resistance increased until a rat was born who was immune to radiation. What are we waiting for? Let's get out of here. Yes, we must run. And now they are the masters, the rulers, and we are the scavengers. <laughs> Well, if he 
can't keep up. Hold it. All right, hold up. Oh, there's no use going on. Look there ahead of us. Yeah, dust. More of them. Behind us. To the north. Yeah, they've cut us off. Now they close in for the kill. I told you it was an efficient army. Their strategy is well planned. They've a good general. As good a man as myself. Father, please try to... Oh, now, now, these young men need me, Jean. We're outnumbered. We need time to muster our forces. Perhaps we could make a truce with the rats. Talk sense, will you? Uh, gentlemen, gentlemen, be reasonable. We have no other choice. You see how easily they outmaneuvered us? A truce is our only hope. Make him shut up. You come over, Joe. Joe, he's crazy. He talks crazy. Don't let him get you. How much time we got left before they pick us up? Seven hours. We'll never make it. Uh, Jean. Yes? Do you know this sector? Yes. Well, come with me, please. Uh, Mac, keep an eye on the old man. I didn't know what I was looking for or what I expected to find, but I had to do something. Even walking aimlessly over the scorched stone rubble was better than standing, waiting for the circle of rats to close in. And then Jean found it, an entrance to an underground bomb shelter, one just large enough to hold the average family. We raced back to where we'd left the others, and now we could hear the rats, thousands of them all around us. Joe, Joe, I tried to stop him. He wouldn't listen. He was like crazy. What are you doing? I couldn't help it. Believe me, I couldn't help it. He was about 200 yards away, his shoulders back, his head held high, walking directly toward the rats. And in his right hand, he was holding a small white handkerchief, waving it back and forth like a flag of truce. He kept on until they formed a semicircle around it. And then he stopped. And all around us, the rats stopped. For a moment, I swear, he spoke to them. And then he turned toward us, raised his hand in salute. And then the rats swarmed all over him. Come on! Gene, you can't help me. Come on! We burrowed ourselves in the shelter. In a few moments, we could hear them overhead, hurtling themselves against the heavy, lead-lined door, their yellow teeth digging at the concrete and steel. But it had been built to stand an atomic blast. It held up the rats. And we waited. For one thing, how long could we stay alive in that coffin? We didn't speak. We just sat there, wondering when they'd break through. So? Yeah. What's the use? Let's get it over. No. No, they'll give up. They're starving. They leave to find some other food. Hey, Joe. Huh? The rats. They're quitting. They're leaving. Uh, maybe they are. Maybe they just want us to think they are. No. No, they're leaving. I'm going to take a look. Mac, don't open that door. Joel, they Now, listen. Listen, it's a ship. Clark and the ship. Come on, Joel. Let's get out of here. Up where they can see us. Hey! Hey! Down here! Hey! Well, Jean, we can go out now. They've gone. What? It's all over. We're safe now. We can go out. Out? Out? Oh, I can't believe it. <laughs> We're going to take you back with us. Away from this. Now, come on. Oh, no, please. Please, I'm afraid. Afraid? Don't you hear it? That noise? Well, that's our ship. Here, I'll show you. Look, you see the landing... 
I don't understand. But the one that brought us here. Brought you here? Yes. Where, where did it come from? Europe? Asia? Where? Europe? Asia? Oh, I knew we hadn't destroyed all of the Earth. Earth? Is that what you call this planet? Earth? This is the Earth. You. Where are you from? What? Way up there. Just north of Polaris. Under the direction of Anthony Ellis, Escape has brought you North of Polaris by Charles Smith, starring William Conrad as Joe, with High Aberback as Mac, and Eddie Firestone as Sam. Featured in the cast were Vivi Janis, Ralph Moody, and Frank Gerstle. The special music for Escape is composed and conducted by Leith Stevens. <laughs> One, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown, come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents... X minus one... Tonight, Hallucination Orbit by J.T. McIntosh. Mr. Chaka. Sir? Stand by to release a pickup rocket. Yes, sir. We'll break orbit in eight hours. Have damage control pull the rods on the number three pile. Check leakage. Yes, sir. Try and have the locks cleared of all unessential personnel when that pickup rocket comes back. There's no point in making trouble. I understand, sir. Pick up rocket away, sir. Very well. Take over, Mr. Chaka. I will be in my quarters if I'm wanted. Well, now then, Mr. Danbury, make yourself comfortable. Why, thank you, Captain. You care for a drink? Scotch in that bowl, bourbon in the other. No, thank you. I can't get quite used to squirting liquor from a rubber bulb as if I were oiling a bearing. <laughs> well, you'd have a devil of a time pouring from a bottle in free fall. Well, how are you enjoying your trip? It's very interesting. It's very nice of you to give me a lift. You know, it would have been eight months before another ship came along. Oh, a lot more than that with the main Pluto beam station out. Probably eight years. Really? That long? I thought the whole run to Pluto was under 18 months. Yes, it is when the beam is running. You see, Mr. Danbury, we left Earth 27 days after the beam broadcast from Pluto station broke. We've been spaceborne close to six years. I suppose that's why you're on orbit around this planet, picking up supplies or something, eh? Oh, oh. This is a standard pickup for the space beam service. 
We sent a rocket down to take off a man who's been the only inhabitant of this planet for a little over two years. Well, I expect he'll be glad to see you. Well, there's no telling. <laughs> I know I would. After two years of duty, Mr. Danbury, you might not know anything. Oh, psychiatric troubles? Solitosis. It's from the Latin, solus, alone. Is that uh, much of a problem? Only in space. Here, look. Ah, look through that port. Seems empty. It is. It's empty of horizon, sky, sunlight, ground. It's empty of time. It's empty of people. You can't live in it too long without something happening. I see. But surely people have been alone before space flight. Oh, yes, but they have been on the same world with other people. And that seems to make a difference. You take a hermit on Earth, he may spend his life trying to escape civilization. But put him on a deserted world, he turns psychotic. Is there a cure? Oh, sure. Put him back with people. At least about 40 people. That seems to be the critical number. See, I have 48 in this ship's complement. I could run her with about 18. But if I tried to, I'd have psychos on my hands six months after blastoff. But then every one of these men on the beam stations, they're all alone, aren't they? That's right. Well, then they must get it. They do. It wouldn't pay to leave more than 40 men on a space station. And less than 40 is too dangerous. Solitosis can be homicidal. So they leave one man. Now, he gets it all right. But you can snap him out of it just by taking him back to Earth. That's why I like to have as few people as possible around when the pickup ship comes back. It can be pretty unpleasant. And what are they like? How does it affect them? Well, so far, I've picked up about 28 space station officers. I've seen 28 different sets of symptoms. I wouldn't want the job of getting those guys out of their stations and into that pickup rocket. Captain here. Pickup rocket. Signaling, sir. All right, Mr. Chalker. Prepare to receive the pickup. Alert the psychiatric staff, and I'll be right there. Uh, would you care to see them bring them in, Mr. Danbury? You're welcome if you have a strong stomach. I don't think so, thank you. All right. Mr. Chaka, as soon as the rocket is secured, make a trajectory for the next station. Yes, sir. That's Pluto Station 3. Carry on. Oh. Pluto Station 3. That will be a honey of a job. He has been on that lump of rock all by himself for close to six and a half years. <laughs> Pluto Station 3, Daily Report, Colin Ord, Space Officer. Everything is in fine shape. Through my port, I can see Mars, Earth, Saturn, Mercury. <laughs> ah, that little devil, he's hiding behind the sun. He's been quite furtive lately. Why I'm required to record this report every day escapes me, because it's quite obvious to any empty-headed brass hat at the central office that not a word of this has been worth the tape it's been recorded on for the last five and a half years. But if it amuses you gentlemen to hear me wander, after all, you are paying for the tape. Ah, oh, which gives me a fine thought. I'm going to set the pickups through the whole station and leave the tape running. That'll give you a daily report all day, so keep on listening. Right now, I have the distinct impression that Earth is winking at me. A rather suggestive, lewd wink. It helps to see the planets, doesn't it? Hmm? Oh, I, I thought you were reading. I was. You know, if you hadn't been able to see the planets, you would have been a straitjacket case long ago. Well, who knows I'm not one now. You don't, anyway. Well, I think that so long as you talk sanely about madness, you can't be so far gone. It's out there somewhere, isn't it? The rescue ship. Somewhere? How long now, Colin? Where could they be now if they started whenever the beam failed? I haven't worked it out since the last time you asked, but they could be very close. The beam hadn't failed. They would have been here long ago, wouldn't they? Oh, sure. Eleven months with the beam, over six years without it. Well, anyway, that triple time six years pay adds up to quite a pile. <laughs> You'll be set up for life when you get back to Earth, won't you? And at 29... I'll be rotten with money. Oh, well. It's been nice knowing you. That's because of the others before you. I've learned a lot. I'll never talk of the others. 
And above all, never talk of any others to come. I'm sorry. Would you like to play chess? It's a long time since we did. I don't think so. Not anymore. I'm a little tired of chess. Oh, I know. I know. I understand. I won't bother you. I'll go to my room, Colin. Well, don't get upset. I'm not. I understand. You're just tired of chess. You still listening, gentlemen? That last few minutes might have been a little confusing. You'd like to know who I was talking to, wouldn't you? I'm afraid you can't hear her on the tape. That's Una. And I'll tell you what she looks like. You might find it interesting. She's beautiful, but rather cool. She always wears a white shirt and sharp, creased green slack. She's got a good figure, but in a calm sort of way. She plays a good game of chess, although I beat her two out of three times. Of course, you know why you can't hear her on the tape. But I still know, too. That's a point in my favor, isn't it? That brings up an interesting question, gentlemen, because I'm tired of Una. I'm beginning to find her a long, cool, slightly unappealing bore. My problem is how to get rid of her. I can't just tell her to vanish. She's a little too real for that. I dreamed up a ship to bring her. I'll have to find another to take her away. Well, I might as well get to it. Oh, no. No, I'm not going to bother about the ship. It's too much mental effort. I'd have to think up everything I saw, and frankly, gentlemen, I'm... I'm too tired. Maybe she'll take the hint. A lot of them did. Susie did. And Alice. Oh. I remember Margie. There was a girl. A load of bricks had to fall on her head. Took me four weeks to get rid of her. No. Let Una figure her own way to get off the station. She's gone. I thought she might. The ship's gone, too. Well, all in all, I don't think Una was really very satisfactory. One of these days, I'll start believing in them, and I'll be really gone. Well, if I activate the main screens now, I'll see a ship coming in to land pretty soon. Every once in a while, I have a thought that when the ship really comes, I'll think it's make-believe. Yes, there it is. A small ship curving in for landing. I suppose I could check on the detectors. I know they register anybody within 100,000 miles, but I don't bother checking them anymore because someday the moment will come when I check the detectors. And I'll see just what I want to see. Well, the ship's coming in for a landing now. I'll go out to meet it. I'm rather interested to find out what the explanation will be for the girl. Naturally, it will be a girl. It's all right. You can take your helmet off. The air's all right in here. You must be Baker. Oh, good heavens, no. Baker was before me here. You can't be one of his dreams seven years late. I'm Ord, Colin Ord. Before we go any further, just how does solitosis affect you? Well, that's new. None of them ever asked that before. It makes me see things that aren't there. And you know there's nothing there? Mm, sometimes. Do you know I'm here? I'm making a point of not wondering about it. Well, one thing you can be sure of. This. Do you see this? This is a gun. I just want you to know I'm not heaven's little gift to lonely space station officers. Is that clear? Oh, yes. Yes. What's your name? Elsa Cutterline. You want to know why I'm here, of course. Not particularly. 
What? Well, that's always the weakest part of the story. I don't like to press it. Why don't you, uh, take off your space suit? I'll tell you why, just the same. I killed a man. Why and how doesn't matter. I had access to an experimental ship. I thought if I disappeared for about two years... Oh, every... please don't labor over it. I'm not asking questions. Why not? Well, when we get around to it, I would be interested in the story you can concoct for being dressed like the cover of a magazine story in rather minimal clothing. It's been years since I thought up anything like that. You must be a throwback. What are you talking about? You know, you're going to have a tough time with that gun when you get tired of holding it. It's a heavy gun. How long do you think it'll be before I take it from you? After all, you have to sleep. There's no door in the station you can lock that I can't get in. I know. I just wanted to make sure you weren't violent. I think I can get on with you, Ort. Mm, Yes, yes, I see. The question is, my dear, whether you're real or not. Well, don't I look real? Oh, yes, but that doesn't prove anything. As a matter of fact, the realer you look, the worse off I might be. But then there still is the remote possibility that you might actually have killed someone and decided to hide out on a space station. Shall I tell you something else, Elsa? What? I'm suddenly tired of the whole business. Breathe there a man with soul so dead, I'm sure you know the rest of it. I would suddenly like to have enough people around me so that I could be sane. I would like to find women as part of life instead of having them pop up here from the depths of my rather pornographic subconscious. Ah, but you've shaken me, Elsa. Twenty-four hours ago, I was congratulating myself that solitosis hadn't really gotten me. But now I don't know. Just don't try anything funny, or you'll find out whether I'm real. The hard way. Any way is the hard way. First, I'll go out and have a look at your ship. Fourteen pounds per square inch air. Heat. Now, I take a gasoline lighter. There, the flame lights. But on the other hand, if there was no lighter and I see it, I could also see it burn when there isn't any air. As a matter of fact, how do I know that I can read a meter for air pressure? And now that I look again quickly, I find I haven't got a lighter in my hand. And as a matter of fact, the pressure meter reads zero. There's no air on this ship. As a matter of fact, there isn't any ship. Elsa is no more real than Una. All right, Colin, old boy, sit here and concentrate for about 15 minutes and you'll be able to walk through the walls of the ship. Well, what did you find out there? You'd better leave. It was a mistake you're coming here. I'm sorry. No, don't come any closer to me. Put down the gun. Keep back. I'm warning you. Keep back. You see, it's no use. Oh, you're a good shot. You got me right between the eyes, but I couldn't feel a thing. I can't let myself be shot now, can I? Give that to me. There. Now, remember, if you shoot me, nothing happens. But if I shoot you, you die. Do you know that? Yes, I know that. I'll give you about 20 minutes to get that overstuffed figure back into that spacesuit and get off my planet. Frankly, I'm getting tired of hallucinations. Tired. Give me back my gun. No, no, no. I'll keep that. After a while, I'll put it in a drawer. It'll stay there until I forget it. Then there won't be any gun anymore. From now on, my overblown figment, there will be no more Elsas or Susies or Margies. I am not going to give in to solitosis. Maybe. Maybe I'll bring Una back. At least she could play chess. Pluto Station 3, Daily Report, Colin Ord, Space Officer. Gentlemen, I have successfully fought off solitosis for two days and I have been alone. 
However, I'm afraid I'll lose as I watch my main scope now. I see a ship coming in again. I wonder what this one will be like. It's a launch from a larger spaceship. Maybe a lifeboat. Dorothy came in a lifeboat. I wonder what this one will be like. I've got to find out when she comes whether she's real. That's the key. As long as I know if she's real. When I don't care anymore, that's when it's really got me. The ship's down now. There she comes out of the airlock. I've got to find out whether she's real. Colin Ord. That's right. I'm Dr. Lynn of Four Star Line. Marilyn Lynn. Oh, very pretty. Are you going to tell me your story now, or do I have to wait? I'm not going to tell you anything till I've found out a little more about you. Well, you're an improvement on the last one. At least you're young and beautiful, and you're not fantastic, and you look... intelligent. What do you mean? Don't worry about me. I see things that aren't there. Particularly people. Oh, so you don't believe I'm here. Would you? If you were me. Do you know I'm not here? No, that comes with time. At least it always has so far. You mean you've always proved to yourself that your visitors were mere fantasy? With a struggle. Interesting. Controlled solitosis. I never heard of it before. It's a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Ord. No, no, that doesn't make you real. They all say that. Why should I want to make you accept me as real? I don't know. But they all do. When will you know? Oh, I can't say. Maybe in five minutes. Maybe not for hours. How do you do it? You don't shoot me to see if I die or anything like that, do you? No, nothing like that. If I shoot you, you do die like the witches in history. They'd die if they were, and they'd die if they weren't. Your mind has remained agile enough. Naturally. I never heard of solitosis inhibiting intelligence. Would you like some coffee? Is that part of the test? Whether more coffee is actually drunk than you drink yourself? No, no, that doesn't help. It would be very easy for me to make half what I thought I made, to fill a cup with nothing and pass it back. <laughs> you look afraid. Why should I be? What am I doing? Am I doing something I don't know I'm doing? No. Would you like me to wash the cups for you when we're done? That won't prove anything. Next time they were used, I could just imagine they were washed, couldn't I? Where are you going? To find out if you're real. My ship. Go ahead. Good luck. What's she afraid about? Something I said. None of the others were really afraid of me. I can't tell yet. Nothing's happened. The meters all read 15 pounds to the square inch air pressure, but that's no good. I can't tell if I'm reading them at all. Oh. Well, the wall's solid enough. My hand hurts. That doesn't prove anything. Supposing I open my faceplate. If there's no ship and no air... All right, my faceplate's open. I'm breathing air. But then again, on the other hand, my faceplate may still be closed. Maybe I only think it's open. I can't tell. I can't tell that she isn't real. That means it's finally gotten me. It gets everyone. I don't really know if anything's real, if I'm real, if this space station is real, the planet, the universe, the galaxy. Maybe all life is in my mind. I think... Therefore, I am. Yes, I remember that from school. Oh, I'm tired. I've got to get back to the station. I'm very tired. Close my faceplate. If I ever opened it. I get back to the station. Got a headache. Terrible headache. I'm very tired. Are you all right now? Here. 
drink this. Mm. What happened? You came in the station lock and passed out. How... How long have I been out? About 24 hours. You're a very sick man, Mr. Rod. <laughs> Reality. Very important thing, isn't it? It's the most important thing there is to learn. Merely to you. Solitosis naturally affects what matters most to the individual, but we needn't talk about that. But I know now. You're not real. You can't be, even though I feel you are. How did you decide that? I couldn't prove you weren't, not on your ship. I'm too far gone to figure out any test that'll work. But if you are real, then how did you avoid solitosis? The only way there is. There are 48 men and women in the relief ship that's in orbit around your planet right now. I came down in the pickup rocket. We have well above the critical number of people. I keep rational by knowing they're up there in the orbit, and as soon as I'm ready, I'll take you back up there. Well, I suppose I can wait. I don't really care if you're real or not anymore. I know. It'll take a long while before you care. You sound sad. What's the matter? It's the way you look at me. What do you mean? What do you see when you look at me? Well, you're strong. Sort of quietly beautiful. About my age... You're wearing a tunic and slacks, and you don't have a wedding ring. I noticed that. That's what I thought you saw. I'm real, but not your picture of me. I'm a doctor, Mr. Ord. All first contacts with station officers are made by trained psychiatrists. I'm a doctor. And I was a girl once. But that was 40 years ago. I'm 66. You can't be. Oh, yes. It was very nice to be a girl again. I could see myself in your eyes and I almost felt young again. As I grow old in the next few weeks, Mr. Ord, you will be recovering. That will show you how your case is progressing. When you see me as I really am, you will be all right. Assuming you're real, Marilyn, it really must take something to come down alone to see one of us. I think I see you now, as you really are. Captain? Yes, Mr. Chaka. Pick up rocket all secured from Pluto number three. Hmm? How is the poor fellow? Good as can be expected. He came on board with Dr. Lynn. Uh -huh. I'm telling you, these guys throw me. There he was holding her hand, looking in her eyes like he was in love with her. And you know what a dried up old bat she is? Yes, I know. All right, Mr. Chaka. Prepare to blast off. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features the Willie Lay column, Mutant of the Iron Horse, describing monorail railroads of the past and future. Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you Hallucination Orbit. A story from the pages of Galaxy written by J.T. McIntosh and adapted for radio by Ernest Kenoy. Featured in the cast were William Redfield, John Larkin, Vera Allen, John Moore, Terry Keene, Dick Hamilton, and Hope Risman. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Daniel Sutter and is an NBC Radio Network production.
Orbiter X. Episode 11, A Flight Against Time. Captain Bob Britton, his co-pilot Douglas McClelland, and flight engineer Hicks have arrived back at the headquarters of the Commonwealth Space Project, Woomera. They tell Colonel Kent and Sir Charles Day all they know about the Unity Organization, which is led by Dr. Max Kramer. They explain how it plans to take over and assemble the Commonwealth Space Station Orbiter X as a vital step towards establishing a world government. And the first result of their information is that Captain Bradley is exposed as a Unity agent. He gives away certain details about Kramer's movements and the interference transmitter which screens Unity ships from the ground tracking stations. Sir Charles then asks Bob if he and his team will undertake another mission. It may be a job with a one-way ticket, Britain, so I shall quite understand if you decide not to take it on. The point is this. As far as Kramer knows, Bradley is still his agent, and you are still on our embryo space station, Orbiter X. Yes. Now, we don't want to upset that illusion, and there's no reason why we should. Yes, but as soon as the interference transmitter's working again, Kramer will go back to the station. Exactly, and he must find things just as he'd left them. You mean you... you want us to go? Yes. Colonel Kent and I are asking you to return to the place you struggled so hard to get away from. In other words, what we are asking you to do is to go back to Orbiter X. Go back there? We'd never make it. Kramer would see us on his track. Yeah, just a minute, boys. Sir Charles, I expect you've got the answers to this. I think we have. Uh, Kent, perhaps you'd explain. Yes, of course. Not long after you left, I decided that the interference which was plaguing us on sound and vision was being produced artificially. Our electronics department got working on the problem, and although they haven't been able to find the source of the interference... They've found some of the answers to it. And they've also produced some screening devices of their own. You mean deflectors? Yes. When you fit them to a ship, they seem to screen it just as effectively as the interference transmission. They've just been fitted to one of our ships, and that's the one which could take you back to the space station components. Well, I'm ready to give it a try. How about you, Mac? Uh, sure, I'll have a go. Yes, yeah, so will I. I'm sorry about this as far as you're concerned, Hickey. I hoped you might have a chance to see your family before you started flying again. Yes, I did too. <laughs> Still, can't be helped. Well, we're most grateful to you all. Yes, indeed. Now, Captain Knight will fly you out, put you aboard the Central Workshop's rocket, and then bring his ship back here to Woomera. Yes, so when Kramer returns to Orbiter X, you'll find us waiting for him. And you'll have no idea we've been away. None at all, we hope. And you should be in a strong position because you'll be working to a fixed plan. You'll have one or two mechanical aids to help you, and while you're busy at your end, the rest of the fleet will be armed and fitted with the new deflectors. Obviously, the fitting out is going to take several weeks, so during that time, we thought we'd let the unitists go ahead and assemble the space station for us. <laughs> with our help, I presume. Yes. <laughs> That's quite an idea. And then you take it over when it's complete. Uh, naturally, but you, you don't have to worry about that side. Hmm. You mentioned some mechanical aids, sir. Yes, uh, I think the colonel can tell you all about them. Uh, yes, sir. Uh... What do you make of this, Bob? Let's see. Well, looks like a flat cigarette case. Mm. In point of fact, it's a radio transmitter. Uh, transmitter? It's very neat, isn't it? Mm -hmm, very. Actually, it's a radio beacon. It transmits automatically at regular intervals. I've got a midget receiver here, so you can listen to the signals yourselves. Now turn it on. Mm -hmm. Yes, when it works. Yes. And there are two very important points about these uh, transmissions. First of all, they should be heard through the Unity Interference screen. And secondly, they can only be picked up on a special receiver. So the Unitists won't hear them. Well, that's excellent. Now, if you can possibly manage it, we want you to plant this gadget inside Kramer's ship. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. If you succeed, it means that wherever the ship goes, it'll be tracked by our direction finders. Sooner or later, we should be able to trace it right back to Unity headquarters and pinpoint them on the map. Ah, it sounds wonderful. How long can the beacon go on working? Uh, the batteries are supposed to last for uh, up to three months. Fair enough. But um, what happens after you've located the headquarters? Well, uh, that'll be a matter of higher policy. Yes, you needn't worry about that. Your job is to plant the beacon, 
and help the Unitists to put the space station together. Yes. How will you know when it's complete? Kram will obviously screen it electronically, and he must have a method of screening it visually as well. Well, that doesn't worry us too much, because we shall rely on you to send us a signal when the job's finished. Yes. You see, the transmitter you'll use is exactly like the beacon, but the signal is different. Now, listen, here it is. Now, as soon as we hear this, we shall know that your mission has reached its final stage. That's when you'll make your getaway aboard one of the space station chariots. We'll give you a small deflector set, which will screen you from the unitists, and one of our ships will come out, pick you up, and bring you back here to Woomera. Uh, yes, but where will it pick us up? We'd better fix a rendezvous. Yeah, no, um, I will. I, I, I know. Uh, how about Bradley's old ship, Orbiter 1? Oh, that's an idea, Bob. Yes, it's still circling the Earth, so we could cross over to it, just as we crossed over to our own ship. In eh? the chariot. Well, that's excellent. That seems to be the answer. The rendezvous is Orbiter 1. Well, that's the plan as it affects you, Bob. The main point's clear? Yes, I think, sir. First, we plant the beacon on Kramer's ship. Then, when the station's complete, we send you the signal and set out on the chariot for Orbiter 1. That's right. And we take that signal as our cue to send off a ship to meet you. It's a tough assignment. Now you've heard all about it. If any of you want to change your mind and back out, this is the moment to say so. No, we'd like to go ahead, sir. Good. Well, as you realize, it's essential that you arrive on the Orbiter X workshop rocket before Kramer gets there. So you'll have to move fast. Yes, of course. Uh, Kent, uh, I understand you've briefed Captain Knight for a test run with the deflectors. Uh, yes, they've been fitted to his ship, Orbiter 3. And the final adjustments are being made to them now. As soon as they're complete, I'll give him the word to take off. We'd very much like to see the test, sir. Yes, but there's no need for you to hang about. I think you all need the, all the rest you can get. Now, look... I'm going over to the control room, and I'll give you a call when the test flight begins. Here we are, Bob. Come right in. Uh, come in, all of you. Thanks. Sir. Well, that's a familiar sound, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it's the beacon transmitter. Uh, Captain Knight's got it aboard his ship. He took off a few minutes ago. Orbiter 3, bearing 209, EV 12, altitude 50 miles. Hello, fellas. Great to see you again. You too, old lad. I didn't see anything on the monitors. No, we hope you won't. You mean they can't pick up Orbiter 3? No, they're trying, but they haven't managed it so far. So the deflectors really are working. Yes, as you see, the monitor screens are reassuringly blank. And this signal we're hearing, is it actually coming from a similar transmitter to the one you showed us? It's the same one. Ah, and as we're not using the normal radio, in case uh, Kramer's listening, it's our only link with Orbiter 3. Yes, I'm getting my bearings from the direction finders which are locked onto it. The bearing now is 208 EV14, altitude 55 plus. So when we plant the beacon aboard Kramer's ship, you'll be able to trace him just like this. We hope so. Uh, if Kramer only knew what he's in for. That's something he must never know. This gadget changes the whole situation. Isn't there any chance of it being picked up on a normal receiver, sir? None at all. Altitude is up to 70. 70 miles plus. And still nothing on the screens. No interference either, thank goodness. Oh, by the time Kramer gets his transmitter going again, we ought to be safely aboard Orbiter X. Hold on. There's something coming up on the central monitor, sir. Yes. You're right, Brown. A small disturbance plumb in the centre. It's a 208 EV17. The same bearing I'm getting from DF for Orbiter 3. And so the deflectors are not quite perfect. Hello? Yeah? You've seen it too? You can? Good. I'll call him straight back to base. Thank you. That was the electronics department. They're monitoring over there and they spotted the fault. They think they can correct it with a small adjustment. Oh, I hope they can. I hope so too. Uh, we'll order Captain Knight back right away. Well, how are you going to do that without using normal radio, sir? There's your answer. The second midget transmitter. Oh, I see. <laughs> Knight has a receiver with him, and we told him that would be his recall signal. Bearing 209EV16. He's diving, sir. Here. The screen's clear. Yes. And there seems to be a weakness in the deflectors around about the 70-mile mark. Bit of trouble, is there, Kent? Well, oh, um, oh, hello, Sir Charles. I didn't see you come in. I've only just got over from the security department. Uh, is this fault serious? No, I've just been told it can probably be corrected quite quickly. Good. Well, I've got some rather interesting news for you as soon as you can leave the control room. Well, you can cross over into my office right away. I've seen all I need on the first test run. 
Uh, night's altitude is down to, uh, what is it, Brown? A 55 plus, sir. Everything seems okay. He's coming in smoothly on the predicted landing course and the screens are clear. Right, well, give me a call if you want me. I shall be next door. Okay, sir. Uh, will you come this way, Sir Charles? Yes, I will. Uh, and uh, Britton and his team might come along too. I'm sure they'll be equally interested in what I've got to say. Thank you, sir. In you come, gentlemen. Uh, thanks, sir. Now then, I thought you should know that the psychiatrist's been having a long talk with Captain Bradley. He says there's no doubt the man has been well indoctrinated by the unitists. The poor chap's thoroughly rattled, and as a result, he's given away his method of contacting unity headquarters. He has? Yes, what he is, is it, sir? It's very yeah. simple. He makes an apparently harmless telephone call on the radio telephone link. It doesn't matter who he calls, because at certain times, which we now know, the link is being monitored. Uh -huh. So he may ring, say, a, a Mr. Smith who keeps a garage in Alice Springs. He makes an apparently harmless inquiry about cars, but he uses a word code. Ah, yes. The person being called is entirely innocent, of course, but somewhere along the line, a unity agent is taking everything down and sorting out the real message. Mm. I see. I see. It's going to be difficult to find the agent. Quite, but we don't want to find him at the moment. We want to use him, and we can use him because we know the code. Ah, you mean you'll get Bradley to send phony messages back to Unity? Not Bradley, but the security people have got hold of a pilot named King whose voice sounds almost exactly like Bradley's on the phone. King? Yes. yes. Now that you mention it, their voices are alike. Well, we think it's essential that they should be because the agent may have been sent a record of Bradley speaking. Mm, that's true. Anyway, gentlemen... At this precise moment, Captain King is speaking on the radio telephone to an innocent shopkeeper in Alice Springs. He's given his name as Bradley, and he's inquiring about some books. What is he really saying? When his words are decoded, the message that the agent will get is this. Thank you. Orbiter 2 crashed, no survivors, no more ships taking off in foreseeable future. Ah. Well, I think that should make Kramer feel reasonably secure. Yes. And at the same time, it'll satisfy him that Bradley's doing his job. Ah, it's wonderful, because then Kramer won't feel he's got to hustle things along. And this is just the start. As a unity agent working for us, Captain Bradley, alias King, should be very useful. Yes, I think he should. Oh, excuse me, Colonel. The interference has suddenly started again. What? Oh, that's done it. Right, well, we'll come through to the control room in a minute. Right, sir. Oh, and uh, Captain Knight, he's just coming in to land now. Good. Well, Kramer's obviously got his main interference transmitter working again. So he'll be on his way back to Orbiter X any time now, Britain. Yes, we've got to beat him to it, sir. You have. Uh, take the major transmitter now, Bob. Here it is. Right. The portable deflectors for the chariot will be put aboard the ship. Well, it looks as though we'll have to skip those adjustments to the ship's deflectors. Oh, no, you won't. They'll be carried out during refueling. This could turn out to be a race between you and Kramer, but you're not going to throw away your chances of success before you start. Orbiter 3 coming in on number one platform, sir. Right. You'd better get down there as quick as you can, Bob. We'll feed the details of your course straight into the ship's automatic pilot. You'll take off as soon as the ground staff give us the all clear. Very good, sir. Okay, you all set, Mac? You, Hickey? Yeah. Yes, I'm ready, Bob. Good luck to you. Thank you, sir. Off you go, then, and the best of good luck. <laughs> Bulkhead's closed and hatches sealed, Captain Knight. Thanks, Hickey. It's tough on you having to take off again like this, Chris. All in a good course, Bob. It's great seeing you fellows again anyway. And you, Chris. Better check your safety straps. Right, OK. You've been through this routine more often than I have. You should be in charge. Oh, don't be silly. It's your ship, old boy. You're the boss. One minute to zero. Control calling Orbiter 3. Check your stabilizers. Well, they're OK. Gyro's turning at 2,000 revs. Good. Orbiter 3, answering your control. Stabilizers correct. Gyro spinning, 2,000 revs. Steady. Right, Orbiter 3. Check your fuel taps and stage 1 compression. All correct. Hello, control. Taps open. Four-fifths compression. Rising. Zero minus 30. Nine-tenths pressure in the combustion chambers. Temperature 1,200. Good. Hello, control. Compression, nine-tenths maximum. All jets firing. Hello, over the three. Stand by for normal takeoff. There'll be no deviation from predicted course. Good luck. Thanks. Ten seconds. Nine. Eight. Seven. We're lifting. Six. Five. 
Let's hope the deflectors are doing their job. Well, if they're not, we won't get any warning until it's too late, so why worry? Yes, why indeed. What's our position now, sir? We're flying over central China. The altitude's oh. 954. We should rendezvous with Orbiter X just after we've crossed the Arctic Circle. Ah, jolly good. You know, I've been thinking, when the whole fleet is fitted with these deflectors, it could go straight in and wipe up the Unity headquarters. And the rest of the world wouldn't be any the wiser. Yes, of course. But it all depends on whether we can plant the beacon aboard Kramer's ship. If we don't succeed, we won't know where the headquarters are. You chaps have got quite a responsibility. <laughs> we don't want to slip up. Uh, what would happen if we did, Bob? Right, to us, you mean? <laughs> no, that's painfully obvious. No, what would happen at Woomera? Well, they'd go ahead and get the fleet armed and screened anyway. Then, if they don't hear from us, they'll probably come out and tackle the Unity ships in space. And that would really make Kramer go into action. Yes. He'd probably launch his general attack on the world. But our people couldn't sit back and wait for him to strike first. No. As Chris says, we've got quite a responsibility. Watch your altitude, Gelbin. Hold it steady at 900 miles until we pick up the space station components on the scanner. Steady at 900, Kramer. That's Earth headquarters calling. All right, I take it. EHQ to Unity Ship 5. Are you receiving me? Yes, Unity 5 answering you, EHQ. The new interference transmitter is working well. Screening correct. You are covered from normal tracking monitors. Good. Keep checking. We will. And we have just had an intelligence report from JB Australia. Yes? What is it? It reads as follows. Orbiter 2 crashed. No survivors, no more ships taking off in foreseeable future. Message ends. Thank you, EHQ. Understood. Captain Bradley appears to have made a promising start, Clark. Yes, but he should have told us who was in Orbiter 2. Obviously, it was the repair squad who were put aboard by Colonel Kent. Quite, but I like to have names. Never mind, the information is useful. I know you were worried uh, that the Woomera people might let the apparent success of Kent's flight go to their heads. There is no danger of that happening now. Nevertheless, I shall keep sweeping with the radar scanner. Of course. That is a standing order. Look, Kramer. The Orbiter X components are coming up on the screen. Yes. Range 2,500. Right. You can call EHQ and order our assembly crews to take off. Very well. Unity 5 calling EHQ. Are you listening? Entering you, Unity 5. You should have six escort ships lined up on the launching platforms. Check. Correct. Ships are ready for takeoff. Go ahead with launching procedure. Repeat. Go ahead with launching procedure. Rendezvous is Orbiter X. Thank you, Unity 5. We are going ahead. We shall have 40 men, wasn't it, in the total assembly crew, Gelbin? That is so, Clama. I shall divide them into teams. Yes. We must work out a program of operations. To begin with, Britain will give us the main outline of the assembly work. I see. One team will be drafted to each section of the space station, and as the sections are completed, they can be welded together under my personal supervision. You mean you are going to remain on the job until it is finished? Yes. I don't think it would be wise to leave Captain Britain in charge. If he is still there. We assume he has survived, but we cannot be sure. Oh, yes. He will be waiting for us with his team. You're very certain. Hello? There's a small mark on the scanner near the bottom of the screen. Do you see it, Kramer? Yes. It's moving towards the components. Now it's fading. Ah, it, it must be the interference breaking through on the vision channel. Yes, it seems to have cleared. I must check on the circuits. I do that when we arrive. In the meantime, keep watching. I don't anticipate any trouble, Gelbin, but you never know. Orbiter X should be in a bearing TK75QX4. 
Can you see any signs of it on the screen yet, Bob? Hold on, I'll pen round. Uh, let's have a look. Yes, there are some marks. You can just see them through the interference pad. Ah, they're the components, all right, Bob. Whole cluster of them. What's the range? 350. You better start breaking, Chris. Okay, I'll start the inverters. Hold on. Over we go. I'll level off when our tail's pointing towards the target. Right, level off. You can start the compressors. Right. We can use the jets as brakes now. You think a nine-tenths burst should do the trick, Bob? Yeah, that's right. Okay. And again. I can see the component rockets through the observation windows. Look, there they are. Yes. The predictor boys know how to put a ship on target. I'll just maneuver alongside the big rocket in the middle of the cluster. That is the central workshops, isn't it? Yes, that's the one. Ah, lovely, Chris. You can leave it at that. But we're still about 100 yards away from the thing. I can get you closer. Ah, don't worry. Ah, we'll step out here. A little trip in our spacesuits will do us good. Certainly. We got all that stuff? Yeah, all checked and ready. Beacon, midget transmitter, deflector set, all correct. Okay. Oh, thanks for the ride, Chris. Safe journey back to Woomera. Thanks. Good luck, all of you. I hate leaving you like this, but... Hey! Hey, look at the screen. What is what? it? Look, there's something there. Oh, you can yeah. just see it through the interference pattern. You're right, Bob. It's something solid. I can't make out what oh, it we're is, not but... waiting. not waiting to find out. It could be Kramer. Lovely. Let's get going. Into the airlock, quickly. It's closing in. Look sharp, fellows. Open the jets and get away as soon as we're out, Chris. Okay, Bob. And the best of luck. Close helmets and localize your intercom. Uh, right. Okay. Uh, do you think that thing on the screen was Kramer's ship? I don't know. It was too far off to be able to say. It could well have been. Asher Zero. Open the outer hatch. Now, careful as you use your jet pistols. We must keep clear of one another. Okay? Right, come on, let's get out. Here we go. Over the edge. There's no time to panic now. Yeah, no time to feel sick either. Remember to keep your legs still. Watch your target. There's the workshop's rocket, straight ahead. Why doesn't Chris open his jets and get away? He's afraid of catching us with the blast. He must move. There he goes. The jets are firing. He can probably identify that thing on the screen by now. If it is a Unity ship, this will really put the deflectors to the test. Yes. They aren't better than the Unity version. The game's up. Chris will have been spotted. I've lost sight of him now. Watch your target, Mac. You're drifting to your left. Ah. That's better. Only another 50 yards to go. Oh, Kramer can't turn up now. Not when we're so close. Oh, don't think about it. Concentrate all your attention on the rocket. You can see the hatch. It's a point to aim at. Watch your speed. Look, watch it. If you overshoot, it'll take more time to get back. Uh, you're right. More haste, less speed. We're doing fine. One short burst should be enough now. Fire in your own time. Here's a hatch. Grab hold. Now oh, we've made it. Now, talk about crash landing. Yes. Hold on to the handrail while I open the hatch. Right, into the airlock quickly. All, all okay? Yeah. Yes, I'm closing up. Pressure's rising. Thank goodness everything's working. I can't wait to get into the ship and see if... see if there's anything coming alongside. Yeah, it's just like waiting for the judge's verdict. Yes. A verdict on the efficiency of the CSB deflectors. Pressure normal. Good. Here we go. Open your helmets. Turn up your intercom receivers. We might pick up something. <sighs> Well, oh, glad to see the workshop is just as we left it. At least nobody's been aboard here. No, I don't think they have. Now, you two look out to port. 
And I'll watch through the starboard windows. Sir. Uh-huh. I'll clear this side, Bob. Right. Hickey, turn on the generator and start the air conditioner. All right, okay. We want things to look as normal as possible. I say, come over here quickly. Uh, why? What is it? A unity ship. Yes, she's closing right in. You can read the number on the bows. Yeah, I can see it. U5, it's Kramer's ship. Yes, that's right. He's stopping alongside. No signs of his hatch opening. Uh, he doesn't seem to be in any hurry to deliver the verdict, does he? No. Whatever it is, we can only wait and see. Hello, Captain Burton. I hope you are listening. Here it comes. Okay. I'll turn on my intercom transmitter. Leave the talking to me. Now, perhaps this is a case where attack is the best defense. Yeah, maybe it is, Bob. Hello, Dr. Kramer. Yes, I'm listening. So you've come back, have you? What's the idea of leaving us stranded out here? Where have you been? Come aboard my ship immediately and no tricks, do you understand? You're the expert in playing tricks. You haven't answered my questions. It is I who will ask the questions. You've had your instructions. Carry them out. I want you here at once because you have quite a lot of explaining to do. Right, Mac? You right, Hickey? This looks like it. So ends the 11th episode of Orbiter X, an adventure in the conquest of space by B.D. Chapman. It was produced for the BBC by Charles Maxwell. <laughs> What we heard is some kind of message from space? Yes, I do. Well, suppose... Suppose the message wasn't sent by an alien civilization. What if something else is trying to speak to us? Something else? Do you mean some kind of superintelligence, some supreme being? Yes. Then in that case, I sincerely hope we can understand what the message is before it's too late. <laughs> Theater 5 presents We Are All Alone. Ladies and gentlemen, please pardon the noise and confusion here, but this is an extraordinary event, and we're broadcasting under extraordinary conditions. This is Gary Benton at Stellar Observatory. Less than one hour ago, astronomers here, operating the planet's largest radio telescope, reported the reception of some sort of message from what seems to be outer space. It sounds much like static. But the significant thing is that the pattern keeps repeating itself. Now, according to Dr. Forrest, head of the observatory, this means that an intelligent source is sending it. Dr. Forrest is here at the scene of this excitement, and I'm trying to get his attention. Dr. Forrest! Dr. Sir! Dr. Forrest! Dr. Forrest, do you think we've heard from another planet? Well, I, I don't know, but we're certainly hearing from somebody or something intelligent. I see. Then you believe there are other civilizations in the universe besides oh, our own? quite definitely. As any physicist will tell you, there are countless billions of suns, many of them with planet systems around them. Oh, yes. There's someone out there, all right. And they're waiting for us. Waiting and perhaps calling from somewhere in outer space. Theater 5 is presenting the radio drama We Are All Alone. Gentlemen, this is Gary Benton again, coming to you from Stellar Observatory, where something really fantastic has occurred in the past hour. We just spoke with Dr. Forrest, head of the observatory, and as soon as possible, we will broadcast a tape of the noise pattern which has come from outer space. Please stand by for further details. We are now switching back to your local station. So much for that. Until things start popping again. Hey, who's got a match? I have some telephone for you. Oh, thanks. All right, coming. 
Thank you. Hello? Harry? This is Ray at the studio. What's going on up there? Plenty, Ray. The boys up here think they've hit the jackpot this time. They claim it has to be something intelligent that's sending that noise. Well, why is that? Because the same pattern keeps coming in. They never heard anything like it. Can't it be just going Not a up? chance, no. Look, they had a computer figure it out. Uh-huh. After the sixth repetition, the chances of a seventh are astronomical. More than ten is just about impossible, and this thing's been going on for an hour. Well, all right, but I got troubles down here. Linda Maxwell wants to go on with her show. Uh Uh-oh. She says that her listeners aren't interested in space. They just want to hear her. Is she kidding? This may be the biggest thing that's ever happened to us. This thing's so hot, the president of the planet has a direct line to this place. Look, I, I... Ray, I think you should just... Play music and hold everything open for what happens here. Suppose nothing It happens. will, it will. They're going to give me a tape recording of the sound to play on the air. Why, why don't you have Linda stand by just in case, huh? Okay, I'll tell her. Yeah, and give her my love, huh? Yeah, right, right. Talk to you later. Now for the fight. Linda, Linda, I just spoke with Gary Benton up at the observatory. Ah, yes, the talented Mr. Benton. And what words of wisdom does he have for me now? Well, hmm? Gary says that things are popping up there. He's going to get a tape to play very soon. What about my listeners? Well, this is a news special, you know. And it just might be the most important event ever. Oh, I know it, Ray. And I suppose I can't really argue the point. It's just that... Well, you know how I hate to let that inflated ego of Gary's get any bigger than it is already. (laughs) You know, I believe you and Gary must be secretly married, the way you two go around throwing barbs at each other. (laughs) Uh, Not a chance, Ray. We're both much too smart for anything like that. Uh, Meaning that you'll wait until he asks you. Well, maybe. So why don't you just wait in the studio? Gary wants you to stand by in case something goes wrong. Oh, hey, I have a better idea. Suppose I go up to the observatory and split the news with Gary. That way my listeners could hear me and then everybody's happy. That's hmm? not a bad idea. Besides, it may be good to get a woman's viewpoint of what's happening. Ray, listen. Hmm? Uh, do, do you really think there's anything to it? I mean, this message from space? Oh, I don't know. It's possible, all right. But if it is true, then we're not alone anymore. That's right. What about it? Well, it's spooky, that's all. I mean, we've sent satellites into space. We've been sending messages out to the universe for years, but this is different. Somebody's sending us something. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's an answer to one of our messages. But if it is that, it's even more scary. Then whoever it is must be very much like we are. Maybe a whole planet just like us. Well, the universe is big enough for both of us, I suppose. Now, look, how about you getting up to the observatory and start sending us messages? Okay, I'm there already. The next voice you hear will be that of Linda Maxwell from outer space. Well, for Pete's sake, what are you doing up here? Well, maybe Ray wanted somebody with a little human feeling in on a story like this. Very funny. All right, Jerry, I'm sorry. Come on. Tell me what's going on here. Well, from what I've been able to piece together, there were two men on the telescope when the noise started coming in. Yeah. Dr. Forrest, who's head man, and Professor Sanford, a physicist. They're both tops in their field. Which is? Which is radio astronomy. For several years, they've been sending out signals to all parts of the universe, hoping to contact other civilizations. At the same time, they've been listening to sounds coming in, hoping to hear something intelligible. And tonight they heard. They sure did, baby. Well, where's the tape now? Dr. Forrest has it. He's going to give me first crack at it and play it on the air. We've got the newsbeat of the year. Well, what's the noise sound like? It's a little weird, especially when you realize it may mean something. What are you doing now? I'm going to play you a tape of what they usually hear when the telescope is on. How do they get this sound? Well, from what Dr. Forrest tells me, they aim the telescope at a particular area of the sky. Then they tune in on a specific frequency and turn on the radio receiver. And they record whatever they hear. Right. Yeah. Listen to this. That's all coming from space? Every bit of it. And the sounds we're hearing? Are the sounds of the universe. Oh, boy. Makes me shiver. Each of those sounds is coming from billions of miles out in space. Some of them have taken uh, thousands, maybe millions of years to get to us. Mr. Benton, Dr. Forrest would like to see you. Thank you. I'll be right back, Linda. I think he wants to give me the tape. Dr. Forrest? Oh, Mr. Benton. Come in. I'd like you to meet Professor Sanford. It's an honor, Professor. And for me, Mr. Benton, 
Dr. Forrest tells me that you've been following the progress of our little adventure almost from the beginning. That's right, sir. <laughs> I must say I admire your patience. <laughs> Stubbornness would be more like it, Professor. I figured if I made a pest of myself long enough, I'd get the inside track on the story, so uh, here I am. Now, Mr. Benton, I have the tape that I believe you wish to play for your listeners. Uh, the uh, president of our planet has already been notified and is being kept informed of developments. Well, sir, have you been able to determine anything definite yet? Well, there's more to be done, of course, but I can say this. Perhaps the most fantastic thing of all is the strength of the radio waves. The strength? Mm -hmm. What Dr. Forrest means is that an unknown radio source far beyond the universe we know is sending us signals on 10,000 megawatts of power. Ten... But that's more power than my whole radio station uses. And that's what the reading is, and there's no mistake. Well, Mr. Benton, suppose you play the tape and we'll get back to work. Yes, well, thank you, Dr. Forrest and Professor Sanford. Linda, Linda, get the engineer to cue up this tape right away. I'm going on the air as soon as he opens my mic. Hmm? Ladies and gentlemen, this is Gary Benton at Stellar Observatory. We have just received the tape of the sound pattern which has come to us from outer space. In just one minute, you will hear what is believed to be the first sounds ever received from an intelligence somewhere in space. Please stand by. Theater 5 is presenting We Are All Alone. Gentlemen, this is Gary Benton at Stellar Observatory. I'm about to play a tape recording for you of the noise pattern that came from outer space earlier this evening. Scientists here at the observatory believe that the pattern is a message and that somewhere far out in the universe, something intelligent is trying to communicate with us. The next sound you hear is coming from outer space. Why? I don't know. It's just spooky. Ladies and gentlemen, we have just played for you what may be the first message ever received from outer space. Scientists are now determining what that message may be. As reports come in, we will broadcast them, so please stay tuned. Well, that's that, at least for the moment. I hope the president of the planet was listening. Gary? Hmm? Listen, suppose this, uh, whatever it is, isn't friendly. I mean, suppose it wants to destroy it. What's then? Well, first it has to get here. If it could send messages, it could get here. Well, it's, it's a little different, Linda. One big difference is that radio waves travel through just about everything. Bodies can't do that. At least not that we know of. But just suppose it did happen. What would you do? <laughs> Love... I gather you up in my arms and run oh. as fast as I could. Oh, dear. <laughs> Telephone for Mr. Benton. Oh, thanks. Benton here. This is Ray, Gary. Here at the studio. Yeah, what's up? Oh, boy, things are really popping. We've had about a hundred calls already on this message from outer space. And they're coming in faster than we can take them. And I have personally spoken to two men who claim to understand the message. What? You heard me. Both of them claim that they can understand what is being sent, and what's more, they know where it's coming from. One of them fell on his head when he was 12, and ever since then, he's had visions <laughs> of the day when this message would come. Yeah, well, what, what about the other? Well, the other one knows all about the message because it's for him. I see. Well, go yeah, on. He that he is uh, not of this planet. He came here many years ago from his home, millions of miles away in another galaxy. Now they want him back. Now, that's what the message is, telling him to come home. Look, uh, seriously, Gary, I, uh, I just wanted to congratulate you on being the first to get this on the air. It's the biggest thing that's ever happened around here. Oh, thanks, Ray. I'll, I'll uh, call you later at the studio. You'll be there, huh? Where else? Right. That was Ray. Well, did he say my listeners are storming the building because they can't hear me? Yeah, something like that. I thought so. Hey, here's Dr. Forrest, the professor. Come on, I'll introduce you. Oh, oh Mr. Benton, sir. Well, how did the broadcast go? Just fine, doctor, just fine. I'll uh, return the tape after I've run it once more. Good. 
Meanwhile, this charming young thing on my arm is Linda Maxwell. She's my assistant. Uh, Linda, Dr. Forrest, Professor Santos. How do you do, Maxwell? Anything new, Doctor? I'm afraid not. We've tried radio telegraphy with no luck. We've just finished running the pattern through the modulating receiver. Oh, what does that do? It breaks down the electromagnetic wave. The wave pattern is carrying the electrical equivalent of sound waves, and the receiver can reproduce the original sound. You mean a voice? If that's the original sound? Well, sir, what were the results of your test? It's definitely not what we expected. I see. Well, if something is being sent out, what what form would it take? I mean, for example, would it have our alphabet? Pardon me. It would probably be a mathematical formula. Equations are constant everywhere in the universe. Ah, yes. Sir. That's the only common bond there is, of course. You mean everything else? History, culture is meaningless to an alien civilization? Well, in terms of our experience, I'm afraid so, Miss Maxwell. Well, what do you do now, sir? Well, there's one more experiment Professor Sanford and I want to try. It's a long shot, so I'd better not say anything about it just yet. But we should know the result very soon now. Dr. Forrest. Yes, Miss Maxwell. Suppose... Suppose the message was not sent by an alien civilization. What if something else is trying to speak to us? Something else? Do you mean some kind of uh, super intelligence or some supreme being? Yes. Then in that case, Miss Maxwell, I sincerely hope we can understand what the message is before it's too late. Ladies and gentlemen of the news media, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Professor Sanford and I have called all of you here to acquaint you with the test results we mentioned several hours ago. Uh, Let me begin by saying that after our initial shock, we noted the rather odd fact that the radio waves were coming in at uh, 82.2 megacycles. Now, that's the frequency we use for satellite communication. We'd expect radio waves from outer space come in the more universal 50 megacycle range, if they were sent by a living intelligence. Exactly. So we began to suspect that our uh, intelligent sender of messages might be aboard one of our own lost satellites. What? One of our lost satellites? Yes, Mr. Benton. But how is that possible, sir? I mean, a lost satellite can't just travel billions of miles into space and then suddenly begin sending radio messages back, where would it get the energy? Uh, I think I can answer that, Mr. Benton. The satellite could be in the solar orbit that includes a number of planets. A strong magnetic field around these planets would trap enough sun particles to ionize the transmitter. I see, and that would give it the tremendous energy required? It could be as simple as that. To check this theory, we submitted the noise pattern to the decoding scanner. Everything was double-checked. And there's no doubt that the mysterious message from outer space, the uh, the something that is sending us a repeating pattern, is a transmitter in one of our own satellites. Where it is, we don't know, and we'll never know. Certainly billions of miles away, perhaps in another universe. And I thought this was the story of the century. Oh, but it is, Mr. Benton. Well, how do you mean, sir? From an emotional viewpoint, this is quite naturally a... A shattering disappointment. But not from the scientific point of view. This lost satellite is sending us information that will revolutionize our thinking. Already, we know of a planet that has a dead moon near it and a fantastic amount of radioactivity surrounding it. Who knows what else we shall learn? Well, you'll excuse me, ladies and gentlemen. There's much work yet to be done. Professor Sanford. Yes? Professor, are you going to call the president of the planet now, sir? Oh, yes. I'm going to let President Moore know that this is a scientific breakthrough of major importance. Thank you, Professor. Well, and, uh, it seems the all-powerful stranger from another planet turns out to be a a phantom of our own imagination and invention. Then we are alone. All alone. No, Linda. Not ever 
all alone. Checks, rice checks, and good hot Ralston present Space Patrol! High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space, missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander in Chief of the Space Patrol! In today's transcribed adventure, Buzz and Happy have gone to the offices of John Crozer to rescue a noted scientist abducted by Crozer. I know Professor Hegman is somewhere in this building, Crozer. Take us to him. Why, Commander, you're mistaken. Oh, no, we're not. Don't sit there under that sun lamp. Take me to Hegman. Well, all right, Corey, if you insist. Uh, my eyes, turn off that lamp. Get him, Happy. I, I can't see. Uh, oh. Yours, content. I... Now, Corey, I'm going to finish you off permanently. We'll be back in just a moment with today's Space Patrol story, The Brain Bank and the Space Binoculars. Wow! Man, oh man, oh man! Yummy! Ah, that boy sounds excited, doesn't he? Well, no wonder. He's just had his first taste of Rice Chex, the delicious bite-sized super cereal. Wow! Man, oh man, oh man! Yummy! Same boy, yep, and the same cereal, only it's his second bowl. Try Rice Chex yourself, gang. You'll love it. I'll say. And when you eat a good breakfast with Rice Chex, you're supercharged. Absolutely. So, gang, try it today. Delicious Rice Chex. And, hey, today's the day for the biggest news ever announced on Space Patrol. So stand by, and I mean with pencil and paper, for the most sensational message you ever heard on Space Patrol. Not far from Space Patrol headquarters on the man-made planet Terra is the Crozer Building. From his spacious offices on the top floor, John Crozer directs his far-reaching enterprises... It is Crozer's proud boast that his payroll list is virtually a scientific hall of fame, an interplanetary who's who of distinguished men and women in every field of science and technology. His rugged features and penetrating eyes are reflected on the polished surface of his mammoth and dorium desk as he confers with his director of plant operations, Erla Becker, and the noted physicist, Professor David Hegman. Uh, Miss Becker, is there anything else on the agenda which concerns Professor Hegman? Yes, you wanted me to remind you to congratulate the professor. Oh, yes, uh, the Kleinhurst Medal. I understand you're to receive it at a banquet this evening. That's right, Mr. Crozer. Uh, congratulations. You are upholding the Crozer tradition. The Crozer tradition? Of course. Uh, for the past three years, every winner of the Kleinhurst Medal for Scientific Achievement has been associated with Crozer Enterprises. Oh, I understand that the medal is given for work... Uh, which I did before I joined your organization. Well, I, I speak in jest, uh, more or less. 
Well, uh, that completes our conference, Professor. I have something to tell you, Mr. Crozer. Yes? I am forced, uh, would regret, of course, to submit my resignation. Your resignation? I don't understand, Professor. Well, it's my doctor's orders. He says my health won't permit me to continue my work for your company. But you're under contract. You're absolutely necessary to this project. I am very sorry. But my doctor tells me that unless I retire, I may not last for more than a few months. Uh, this puts my company in an awkward position, Professor. I won't tolerate it. I regret this as much as you do, Mr. Crozer. But I don't see what I can do about it. See here, Eggman. It'll take us three years to complete construction and install equipment. Your contributions are useful now in our present stage, but they'll be absolutely essential in three years from now. Oh, Mr. Crozer, no one individual is absolutely indispensable. There are other scientists in my field. Hagman, I hired you because you're the only man alive today who can see this particular phase through to a successful conclusion. This whole operation is geared around you. You can't resign. Well, my doctor tells me that I have no choice. Surely you don't expect me to endanger my life. I'm going to have a talk with that doctor of yours. I'm afraid it won't do you any good, Mr. Crozer. Two other doctors have confirmed his diagnosis. Very well. We shall see. Our interview has ended, Jackman. I have other matters to discuss with Miss Becker now. Goodbye, Mr. Crozer. Goodbye, Professor. The nerve of that man. Trying to walk out on me, John Crozer. I understand how you feel, but as the professor says, it can't be helped. Well, I'll hold him to his contract. He's got to keep working for me. That project must be finished as I planned. You can't force him to disobey his doctor's orders. Contract or no contract. Look here, Miss Becker. Your director of plant operations is up to you to find a way out of this. Well, let's face facts. Hegman's brain will be of most value to us three years from now. But he's got to retire immediately, so he's out of the picture. If there were only someone else with his knowledge... There is one possibility, but it's not legal. Uh, well, let's hear it. Suppose Professor Hegman were to be put in suspended animation for three years. Then, when he's revived, his health will be exactly as it is now. He'll be able to do a few months of work when he's most needed. Of course, Hegman wouldn't consent to it. Well, that's immaterial to me. We'll do it by force. That's an admirable idea, Miss Becker. We'll literally be establishing a brain bank. We'll put Hegman's brain on ice till we're ready to use it. There's <laughs> only one catch. How are we going to explain his disappearance? Uh, leave that to me. You locate some suspended animation equipment and get it here. When we get it set up, we'll bring Hegman to my office for one more conference. Well, nobody seems to know where the professor is, Commander. I've even checked with his doctor. I've just phoned Crozer. He hasn't seen him either. Well, maybe the professor forgot about his appointment with you. He could be out with friends celebrating. After all, he's just received the Kleinhurst Medal. Well, I doubt that he'd forget the appointment, Happy. He seemed very anxious to talk to me. You knew, didn't you, that the professor has to retire? No. Why, sir? Well, his doctor warned him that he can't keep up the pace. Oh, by the way, there's something I've been wanting to show you. Yeah. Have a look at this new space patrol equipment. Binoculars? Yes. Not just ordinary binoculars, Happy. They're space binoculars. Can I try them out, sir? Sure, they're yours. Gee, they've got a band on them so you don't have to hold on to them. Yeah, the band fastens them around your head. Right, it leaves your hands free. Now, take a look over the city with them, Happy. I'll take the polarization off the windows. Wow, these are great, sir. Well, why, I can even read a small sign on the space terminal building. A sign I can't even see without the binoculars. Well, you get out in space, out of the atmosphere of terror, then you'll really see something. You mean they're even better out in space? They're so sensitive, they'll pick up very small objects many miles away. They're designed especially for pilots on search missions. Within a planet's atmosphere, they're good four-power binoculars. Wow. Hey, look, there's some people walking five blocks away, and it looks as though I could almost reach right out and touch them. Hey, from what you say, Commander, I'd sure like to take a look through them out in space. Mr. Crozer, this is the most outrageous thing I have ever heard. I refuse to let you do it. Professor, I'm afraid there's nothing you can do about it. Well, don't you know that even if I gave you my consent, it is still illegal for private persons to use the suspended animation process? Now, if you'll unlock the door, Crozer, I'll leave. Eggman, my friend, you're not leaving. Miss Becker, we might as well get started with the process. Give him the preliminary injection. All right, Mr. Crozer. Get away from me. Eggman, get away from that window. I wouldn't advise jumping out, Professor. It's a long way to the street. Yes, and it wouldn't be suspended animation. It would be terminated animation. Go on, Miss Becker. 
Give him the in- good electronic injection. Get away from there. Me. I've got my hand over his mouth. Quickly, Miss Becker. Well, hold him still. Quit struggling, Hagman, or you'll really get hurt. There. How long does it take for the electronic ejection to knock him out? Just a few seconds. Good. Well, he's losing consciousness. All right, Miss Becker. Let's carry him into the suspended animation chamber and finish the process. Commander, look. I can see the lettering on the windows of the Crozer building. These binoculars are fantastic, even in the atmosphere. Take a look at Terra Park, Happy. You can probably see the ants and the rose bushes. Yeah, they aren't that good. <laughs> but I can see people inside the Crozer building. Look, sir, on, on the top floor, there's a man standing in the window. I can see him just as plain. Here, sir, try him. All right, I'll take just one look, but then I think we'd better get to work. Yes, sir. It's the fourth window from the corner of the building, see? Yeah, it is clear. Well, that's Professor Hegman. Huh? At least I think it is. Oh, he's gone now. Wonder why Crozer didn't have the professor call me. Uh, I suppose Hegman's busy closing up his work with Crozer. Yeah, I think he'd at least phone you. Now, I'll tell you what, Happy. I've got an errand to make right near the Crozer building. Let's drop in and see the professor on the way over. I've checked the suspended animation equipment. Everything's working fine, Mr. Crozer. How long does it take? Another hour and we'll be through. Oh, good. You aren't going to keep him here in the building, are you? No, no. In a day or so, we'll take him to Mars. We'll have to take the equipment there, too. We have to give him booster treatments every three months. Say, haven't you been under that helio lamp long enough? Oh, I've got it on low setting. You ought to try it, Miss Becker. It's uh, really very relaxing. Not as relaxing as that treatment we're giving Hegman. <laughs> yes. He'll be relaxed for three years. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of Hegman... Did you see him throw anything out of the window when you were struggling with him? I know. Did you? Well, he made a sort of throwing motion with his hand. I think I'd better go down the street and check. Yeah, that's right. He certainly didn't have time to scribble any note. But let's not take any chance. Come in. Hello, Mr. Crozer. Oh, Commander Corey. Nice to see you. Thank you. This is Cadet Happy. How do you do, Cadet? How do you do, sir? Uh, sit down, gentlemen. I hope you don't mind if I go on with this lamp treatment. I'm acquiring a tan for myself. I see you are. Unfortunately, I don't have the opportunity to get it the natural way as you space patrolmen do. That's <laughs> quite a high-powered lamp. Yes, it can be if it's turned up. I have to know how to handle it. The reason I came over, Mr. Crozer, is to see Professor Hegman. No, well, the professor isn't here. Uh, remember, I told you I'd ask him to call you if he showed up. We saw him standing by the window of this office just a few minutes ago. You saw him in the window? Happy and I were testing some new space patrol binoculars. We thought we saw Hegman. Hegman? You must be mistaken. Oh, I know. One of my attorneys was here a while ago. He, he's about the same height and build as Hegman. Yes, come to think of it, there is a resemblance. Funny, I never thought about it before. Well, apparently we made a mistake, Mr. Crozer. Sorry to have bothered you. Uh, no bother at all. No bother at all. The old fool threw this out of the window. I, I didn't know there was anyone in here. We were just leaving, but I've changed my mind. May I see what you have there? Oh, it's, it's nothing at all. No, no, Commander. Just a little promotion gimmick one of our companies is putting out. <laughs> May I see it? Yes, of course. The Kleinhurst Medal, a promotion gimmick? The Kleinhurst Medal? There's only one man who would have that medal on his person at this time. That would be Professor Hegman. What are you getting at? This young lady just said it was thrown out of the window. Well, why would anyone throw a valuable award like this out of a window unless they wanted to attract attention? Give it to me straight, Crozer. Where is Professor Hegman? You're jumping to conclusions, aren't you, Commander? That was Hegman we saw. If you're not trying to hide something, why are you and this woman so evasive? Why did you lie about the metal? You've got Hegman somewhere in this building. I suppose you won't be satisfied until you search the place. That's right. All right, then. Come on. I'll just turn this lamp on full power and right in your eyes. Turn it off! My eyes. Get him, Happy. I can't see him. No, but I can. Grab that book in, Miss Becker. Uh, nice work, Miss Becker. And now, Cadet! Uh, that'll hold them for a while. It was a smart trick, Mr. Crows, to shining that helio sun lamp in their eyes. I had to do something after that four pie you pulled. Well, I'm sorry. I didn't know they were here. We've got to move fast. Arrange for a spaceship. We'll get Hegman aboard. What about these two? We'll lock them in the next room till we get Hegman out of here. Then I'll come back and finish our space patrol friends for good. We'll be back with space patrol in just a moment. Oh, come on, Captain Tufeld. Tell me what Buzz Corey's big new surprise is for all his kids. Won't you, huh? No, I can't tell you. Please? No, nope, it's a secret until the end of today's program. Is it something the commander himself uses? Oh, you bet it is. It's official space patrol equipment. Can't you really tell me what it is? No, nope, it's a secret. Well, then, 
How about a little hint? Well, I'll tell you this. It's something absolutely new and different. Oh, man, oh, man. I just can't wait. Well, you hurry now. Get a pencil and paper ready and keep listening because in just a few moments, I'll tell you what the big surprise is and how you can get it. And all you boys and girls listening in, you do the same thing. Get pencil and paper ready and be all set to take down the information you need to get that wonderful new surprise Buzz Corey has for you. So long for now. See you at the end of today's program when I'll tell you all about the biggest, the swellest, the most exciting value ever offered on Space Patrol. John Crozer and his assistant, Erla Vecker, have placed Professor Hegman in suspended animation, intending to revive him three years later to finish vital scientific work on a vast project Crozer is managing. When Commander Corey and Cadet Happy decided to search the building for the professor, Crozer blinded them with a beam from a high-powered helio sun lamp and then knocked out the virtually defenseless space patrolman. Buzz and Happy have just regained consciousness and their vision and find themselves locked in a room. <coughs> no, that's no use, Happy. We can't break down that door. Uh, we must be in the Crozer building, judging by the view from the window. Yeah, on the top floor. And Crozer's probably miles away by now with the professor. Mm, I doubt it. He wouldn't go away without being sure we'd never be able to report him. He'll be back. And then I've got a feeling we'd better get out of here before he returns. Let's take a look out the window. Say, maybe we can attract the attention of somebody in another building. Oh, it's locked, too. Yeah. Yeah, there's a ledge out there. If we break the window, we could crawl on the ledge to another window. And that's not my idea of a pleasant stroll, 50 stories out. It's not mine, either, but it's a lot safer than what Crozer has in mind for us. Yeah, this chair ought to do the trick. Turn your head, Happy. Watch out for the glass. <coughs> All right. You want me to go first, sir? Now, wait till I knock these sharp splinters loose. Yeah. Hey, let's go. I'll boost you up. <coughs> I can make it now, sir. Wow, what a long way down to the street. And don't look down, Happy. Lie flat on the ledge and crawl. Yes, sir. I hope we can find another open window along here. I wish this ledge was wider. I, I feel like a tight rope walker. Oh, easy, Happy. Oh, my knee slipped off. For a minute, I thought I was a goner. Don't try to hurry. Hey, Commander, we're in luck. Is that window unlocked? Yes, sir, and it's partway open. All I have to do is push it. Easy now. Don't push yourself off the ledge. Anybody inside? I don't see anybody. Well, here goes. Nobody in here, sir. Watch the door. How are you going to do away with Corey and the cadet? If you unlock the door, swing it open. I'll blast them with this gun before they have a chance to rush us. Open the door and be sure and stand back. Don't worry. All right, Corey, we'll... They're gone. Gone? Well, the room's empty. Look at the window. Well, they couldn't have climbed down the side of the building. Yeah, they certainly wouldn't jump. The ledge. They use the ledge. By now, they've probably given an alarm. This whole building will be swarming with space patrolmen soon. Well, what'll we do? We've got to get out of here. We'll have to forget about the equipment. We've got to get to the spaceport and blast off right away. Hurry, Ola. We haven't a second to spare. Take it easy, Happy. All right. Open the door. There's nobody in here either. Just some equipment of some kind. Uh, some men's clothing, coat and a hat. What kind of equipment is this, sir? Suspended animation equipment. Oh, that's what they use in criminal rehabilitation centers to help cure criminal tendencies. Yes, but how did Crozer get hold of it? And what for? I thought it was against the law for private individuals to have these. Oh, that wouldn't stop Crozer. Why would he want this equipment? Why would he want to put under... Professor. What? That must be it. With a professor in suspended animation, he'd be easier to conceal. Well, sure, but what good would the professor be if he was unconscious? Crozer could revive him whenever he needed him, even months or years from now. I wonder what Crozer did with him. He'd try to get him off Terra. Let's go to the spaceport, Happy. Happy, I've just checked with the space control dispatcher. There was a slip-up. Crozer blasted off. Didn't they try to stop him? The order to hold him wasn't relayed to the dispatcher in time. How long ago did Crozer blast off? Uh, about 15 minutes ago. But I've got a description of his ship. Come on, Happy, let's get aboard Terra 5. We're going after them. Uh, that was luck. I was afraid they'd stop us at the spaceport. Look in the viewscope. There's a ship following us. Oh, the space patrol? No, we are in a spot. We can't outrun that ship. No, no, but we can get rid of the professor. 
Corey doesn't find Hegman on the ship, he can't prove anything against us. Well, what do you intend to do? Just shove the chamber out into space? Oh, yeah. Chances are the professor will never be found. Come on, we've got to get rid of Hegman, and then we'll take our evasive action. Corey won't stand a chance of locating that box with Hegman in it. Gaining on them, sir. All that crazy flying Crozer's doing isn't getting him anywhere. He's trying to delay the inevitable as long as possible. Maybe I can talk some sense into him. Turn on the space phone, Happy. Yes, sir. Commander Corey aboard Terra 5 calling John Crozer in private cruiser T-431. Commander Corey calling John Crozer. This is Crozer. Go ahead, Corey. Go ahead. <laughs> this hide-and-seek isn't getting you anywhere. It's just a matter of minutes. Play it smart and give up. You talked me into it, Corey. But at least I gave you a run for your money. Now, what do you want me to do? We'll pull alongside and join airlocks. All right, Corey. Just a warning, Crozer. Don't try anything. Corey, out. They've joined airlocks with us. All right. Have you got the electronic injection? Yes, it's right here. Yeah, they won't suspect anything from you. Watch your chance and use it on Corey. I'll jump the cadet. He won't be in your way. And then when they're unconscious, they can join Professor Hagman out there in space. All right, Earl. Here they are. Careful, don't make any slips. All right, Crozer, get your hands up. Of course, Commander. Searching for weapons, Happy. Yes, sir. Where's Professor Hegman? Professor Hegman? Why, we haven't the slightest idea. Come on, quit stalling. What did you do with him? We haven't got him. Search the ship if you don't believe me. That's just what we will do. He doesn't have any weapons on him, sir. All right, keep your gun on them, Happy, while I search the ship. All right, lady, get over there next to Crozer. My name is Erla Vecker, and I'll be glad to... Oh, excuse me. Commander! Oh, no, you don't. What have you got there? Let go of me. In your hand. Come on, Erla. That's it. Well, electronic injector. I'll take that gun, Cadet. Oh, no, you don't. Uh, All right, Crozer. Hey, nice one, Commander. Don't try anything like that again, Crozer. And no tricks from you either, Erla. It's lucky you saw her with that electronic injector, sir. You should have had us in deep freeze. That was a very foolish move on your part, Erla. Now you're in this just as deep as Crozer. Now, let's have it. Where's Hegman? All right, I'll tell you. But you'll never find him. He's somewhere out in space. What? You threw him out of the ship? That's right. All sealed up in a nice cozy box. Chances are he'll float forever in space in suspended animation. Happy, get these two into our ship. We'll cut loose and start a search. And they're going to stay right with us till we find them. Nothing, sir. That blip turned out to be a small meteor. You're just wasting your time, Corey. That box with Hegman in it is just a speck in space. Your view scopes won't show it unless you happen to be very close. We'll just keep looking. I've got the view scope on full sensitivity and wide scanning, sir. I'm afraid the view scope isn't much help. Well, here. Let's try these. The space binoculars. It's a long chance, but it might work. Scan in a slow arc, Happy. There's something. Oh, no, it's just another meteor. Let me have a look. Hey, wait a minute. It's a rectangular shape. Check it, Happy, about ten degrees high. I see it, sir. Yeah, it's a box, all right. That's it, we found it. Change vector, Hap. Let's hope we're not too late. There it is, Happy. Yeah, I can see it now through the view scope, even without the binoculars. Stand by to fire forward breaking rockets. Standing by, sir. Fire rockets. Yeah, that'll stop us, Happy. All right, get the spacesuits. We'll pull the box into the ship. And Crozer, we'll just lock you and Erla in a compartment till we get the professor aboard. Why don't you sit down and relax, Crozer? You'll wear out the commander's carpet. Why don't we hear from the hospital? Yeah, you're pretty worried now, aren't you, Crozer? You know, if Professor Hegman doesn't come out of that deep freeze, it's going to go mighty hard on you and Erla. Well, they should know by now. Oh, for Saturn's sake. Sit down and stop that pacing. Oh, here's the commander. Crozer, look who's with him. Professor Hegman. That's right. It's certainly lucky for you two that the professor pulled through that treatment. Yes. And, Mr. Crozer... It will give me a great deal of pleasure to testify against you. Well, then show me with more of his work than the doctor first thought. Well, in that case, we actually did you a service, Professor. Uh, Commander, that should be taken into account. Don't you... think you're going to get off easy on that account. It's just luck and the fact that we had these space binoculars that saved the Professor. Yes, Happy, I had no idea that the binoculars would actually help us save a life. Well, you sure were right about their being terrifically powerful out in space. And they're great in a normal atmosphere, too. I'm not going to lose any time in issuing them to all space patrol personnel. 
Nell. Uh, sir, did you know that when you look through the binoculars the wrong way, you can see into the future? Oh, I was under the impression that they just smallify. But if you say so... Oh, that's ridiculous. It just makes objects look far away. Uh-huh. And far away, I see a criminal rehabilitation center with two people in it. John Crozer and Erla Vecker. And they're getting the same kind of treatment they gave Professor Hegman, suspended animation. You want to have a look? Uh. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll give you an exciting preview of next week's thrill-packed Space Patrol adventure. But first, gang, oh boy, first of all, here's that big, wonderful surprise we promised you. Get your pencil and paper, get all set to go. This is the greatest value we've ever offered on Space Patrol. Commander Corey, you tell the gang what this terrific new item is. Boys and girls, our surprise for you is a pair of those wonderful new Space Patrol space binoculars. Binoculars like the ones I used today when I spied the professor floating in that box way, way off in the distance, remember? Gang, you'll be able to see way, way off in the distance with the Space Patrol binoculars you get, too. Yes, sir, these binoculars are four power binoculars with four lenses. And when you look through them, they make people, houses, buildings, cars, everything else, blocks and blocks away, look bigger and nearer and clearer. No adjusting necessary. The lenses are fixed focus lenses. Why, you don't even have to hold these wonderful binoculars up to your eyes. You wear them like official outer space headgear. They have a strong elastic band on them, and when you slip it over your head, it holds the binoculars in place and leaves your hands absolutely free. Makes you look like a man from Mars, because these binoculars stand out from your eyes a full three and a half inches. That's right. These are not flimsy little celluloid goggles or a mask. These are real, full-size binoculars. Overall, they're five inches wide, five inches long, and they're made of solid plastic. Beautiful, long-lasting black solid plastic with bright red leather-like trimming that makes them look terrific. Now, don't forget, you can see way off in the distance with them. You can spot your dad coming home from work, spot the mailman coming blocks away. You can watch birds in high trees, study animals, identify people in the distance, read signs way, way off, and see airplanes way up in the sky. And when you look through the other end of your space binoculars, they do a switcheroo. They make close-up things look like they're far away from you. Yes, sir, gang, these powerful Space Patrol space binoculars are the greatest value we've ever offered on Space Patrol. To get a pair, do this. Buy a box of Instant Ralston. Then with your name and address, send 25 cents in coin and an Instant Ralston box top to Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. This offer good only in continental USA and may be withdrawn at any time. If you don't agree that your box are absolutely tops, Return them, we'll return your money. That address again is Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. Buzz and Happy are approaching a building where the Secretary General's daughter, Carol, is held captive. Suddenly, they became aware of a tingling, painful sensation and a ringing in their ears. <laughs> It's getting hard to walk. I, I feel like I had a big weight on me. I can hardly move either, Happy. Nora must be using some kind of ray on us. A paralyzer ray? I think it may be worse than that. They're undoubtedly in an ultrasonic beam. Get back to the ship. Get out of range quickly. I, I can't. I, I can't make it. Happy, get up. You've got to get up. Here, I'll help you. I, I can't even crawl. My head, there's a thousand needles in it. If we don't get out of this beam, it'll tear us to pieces. Be sure to be with us next Saturday for the exciting story, The Sleepwalker, when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again bring you Space Patrol! <laughs> Space Patrol, an original Mike Moser production starring Ed Kemmerer as Commander Corey and Lynn Osborne as Cadet Happy, was written by Lou Houston and directed by Larry Robertson. Other players were Virginia Hewitt, Ken Mayer, David Duval, and Bela Kovach. Dick Tufel speaking. Now, don't forget to tune in next Saturday and every Saturday when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again present the new exciting Space Patrol! And be sure to see another exciting Space Patrol story on your local ABC television station. Consult your local paper for time and channel. 
Space Patrol comes to you transcribed from Hollywood. This is ABC Radio Network. Some things are better than others, but that uh, we should never say that anything is wrong, that it has no value. That's not true. There are things that are wrong. Yes, some things are just plain wrong. No rightness about them. Atomic war is one of those things. If we get started on a real atomic war... You see, ordinary war destroys men. Atomic war can destroy humanness by producing mutations that aren't human. But there's another thing that's wrong, too. And that's the wrongness of fooling yourself. Not merely others, but fooling yourself. And that's tonight's story. And you say the annual budget of this institution is $8 million, Dr. Holler? That's right, Senator Bryan. $8 million a year for the care and feeding of... of... The freaks, Doctor? Oh, we try never to think of them as freaks, Senator. And never to speak of them that way. Some of them have unusually sensitive hearing. Yes, but they are... Well, they're mutants, Senator. Genetic sports created by radioactive fallout. You might say they're martyrs to the criminal stupidity of the 20th century. Well, is it compulsive for a, a mutant to live in an institution like this? I confess I'm not completely familiar with the legal aspect. Compulsory? No, Senator. It's not compulsory. But it's often simpler for a mutant to live within these walls than out there in the world at large. So I can understand that. Eighty percent of them have come here voluntarily. And the rest? Committed by relatives who couldn't stand the sight of them. But, uh, come, let me show you some of the patients, Senator. That's Anna over there. You'll notice I didn't bother knocking. Anna doesn't hear sound. When she wants privacy, she just bolts her door. But, uh, uh what is she doing? Thinking. That's all? Just, just thinking? Well, that's all she ever does, Senator. She's uh, busy working on a new cosmological theory. Come, Senator. We're disturbing her concentration. Let's let's try another room. You know, there are many different types of mutations, of course, Senator. Hardly any two are alike. And some of our patients are simply physically deformed. You know, an extra limb, a strange texture of skin, differences like that. But others are more or less normal physically, but have unusual mental ability. And still others, like Anna here. Well, they're both deformed and mentally unusual. Now, in this room, we have a pair of remarkable mutants. Dr. Wally, uh, what's that coming up the hall toward us? It's Mary, one of our more interesting patients. You, uh, you let them wander around the hall? This isn't a prison, Senator. Uh, hello there, Merrick. Where are you heading? I'm taking a little walk, Dr. Holly. This is Senator Bryan. He's paying us a visit here today. He's on the Senate Appropriations Committee. How interesting. I'm leaving here, Dr. Hawley, right now. Leaving? But uh, you haven't been out of here in ten years, Mary. I've decided to give the world another chance. You know the rules, Mary. If you volunteer to come in as a patient, you have to give three months' notice. Now, that way we can prepare you for life in the outside world. I'm and leaving we... right now, Doctor. Ten minutes after I'm gone, you'll forget all about this. you remember there was once a Clyde Merrick here, but according to your records, he was discharged today, September 4th, 2019. You go directly to the recording computer and make the change. And as for you, Senator, whatever your name, you will have no recollection whatever of this conversation. And when you return to Washington, you will do your best to see that Dr. Hawley's appropriation is increased... Is all that clear? Good. Goodbye, Dr. Holly. Thank you for everything. Uh, very well, Senator. Let's, uh, let's continue our little tour now. Uh, suppose I let you see our recreational therapy wing now. Uh, it's all right, Doctor. I, I don't feel very well. Could we sit down and rest for a while? The oddest sensation in my head. It's as if, uh, as if I fell asleep for a few minutes. I had a very strange dream. A young man, 
talking to me. Maybe a little fresh air. It's rather warm in here. Yes, yes, yes. Fresh air would be good. Straight through that car, it'll take you to the courtyard. I'll, I'll be with you in just a moment. I, I have to stop in at the office and make an entry on a patient's record. Uh, something I've been meaning to do for a long time. I keep forgetting it. I'll, I'll be with you in a moment, Senator. <laughs> the danger you can't stop is the danger that by its very nature keeps you from seeing that it's there or knowing that you've met it. That's a hard one to stop. It camouflages itself so that you don't even know you encountered it. Driving to town, miss? Oh, yes. Yes, I am, but I never pick up strangers when I'm driving alone. Why did I stop the car? You will give me a lift. Um, I... Sure. Climb in. Over here next to me. Thanks. I was sure you'd change your mind. This is an awfully lonely part of the country to be hitching a ride in. Where are you coming from? You see that building up on the hill with the brick fence around it? Yes. Do you know what that is? Some sort of government hospital, isn't it? Close. It's a sanctuary for mutants. That's where I was coming from. From the mutant sanctuary? But uh, are you a... A mutant? Do I look like one? I don't know. You look... You look... How do I look? I look... Perfectly normal, don't I? Yes, you... You look perfectly normal in... In every way. Tell me how I look to you. You're tall, blonde, blue eyes, broad shoulders, nice smile. You'd say I was good-looking? Yes. Yes, I'd say you were quite handsome. Thank you. Well, what's your name? Lisa Roberts. You? My name is Clyde Merrick. Oh, you must work at the sanctuary then. Yes, that's right. I I work there. This is my afternoon off, and I, I thought I'd hitch a ride into town for, for some fun. Well, you're lucky I stopped for you. I'm going all the way into town. And you know, it, it's funny, too. I, I never usually stop for strangers. Tony says I shouldn't. Oh, who is Tony? My fiancé. You're going to get married, then. <laughs> That's what having a fiancé usually means. Yeah, you know, we're, we're getting married in December. Going for a long cruise on our honeymoon. <laughs> what do you do, Lisa? Do? Oh, oh, I'm a dancer. Maybe you've seen me on TV. I'm usually on every Saturday night. Not that anyone ever remembers a girl from the chorus. I don't look at TV much, I'm afraid. Is this Tony of yours a dancer, too? Yes, he's the leading man of the show. You love him very much, don't you? You could never think of marrying anyone else. You do talk strangely sometimes. I guess it's because you're around those crazy mutants all the time. Of course I love him very much. What do you think? How do you feel about mutants, Lisa? Just the way everyone else does, I suppose. What is that supposed to mean? Well, I feel sort of pity for them. But still, pity and all makes me feel creepy to think about people with two heads and all. None of them have two heads, Lisa. That particular mutation doesn't survive to adulthood. Most of the really strange ones die off the first few weeks of life. No, even so, I've seen pictures of them. Oof. It's a good thing they keep themselves cooped up in their sanctuary. Good for them and good for us. Well, sometimes they leave the sanctuaries. They try to live like normal people. But they aren't normal people. Sometimes they can convince others that they are normal. We can be very convincing, Lisa. We? I'm a mutant, Lisa. 
I'm casting a mental projection that hides my true appearance. Oh, no. Leave me alone. Get out of the car. Oh, slow down. I won't hurt you. I'm, I'm very friendly. I'm a lonely person, Lisa, and, and you're so beautiful. You're not afraid of me, are you? I'm not afraid of you. Of course you aren't. You like me. You like me very much. I'm tall and broad-shouldered, and you think I'm handsome. Very handsome. More handsome than your fiancé, Tony. Of course. You're wondering what you ever saw in Tony, aren't you? You're starting to forget you ever had any liking for him at all. I can't imagine how I could ever let myself think I cared for him. You're forgetting him rapidly. You don't even know who Tony is now. But you know who I am, don't you? Yes. Yes, of course. And you love me. You've only known me for a few minutes, but despite that, you've fallen deeply in love with me. Haven't you, Lisa? Yes. I love you, Clyde. And I love you, Lisa. Will you marry me, Lisa? Of course, Clyde. Yes, I'll marry you. Darling. <laughs> it isn't really Clyde Merrick's fault. He's not responsible for what he is. Uh, he was made that way by the genetic mutations caused by too much atomic warfare. It isn't his fault. But that doesn't make him tolerable, does it? He is an intolerable menace. Oh, that was a wonderful meal, darling. You know, I don't know how you did it. All those people waiting in line for tables and the head waiter just took you right over to this spot. I have ways of being persuasive. Oh, I see. You love me? Of course, Lisa. We'll be married tomorrow and go far, far away. Rent a cabin somewhere and stay there for months and months and just read and fish and sleep. <laughs> oh, it sounds wonderful. It is wonderful. Just the two of us. I can't wait. You're not worried about Tony, are you? Tony? I don't know anyone named Tony, do I? No, you... You don't know anyone named Tony. Come on, let, let's get out of here. If you say so, darling. Where will we go? To your car. We'll, we'll drive out into the country. You can't see the stars here in town. You haven't paid the check. It doesn't matter. You see them trying to stop me? Well, no, but I... I can eat for free any time. You see? They're smiling goodbye to us. the road you were on this morning when you met me. Of course. Lisa. What is it, dear? Do you really love me? Really and truly love? I love you, Clyde. No. No, you don't. Not at all. Oh, whatever do you mean? It's no good. It isn't real. It's just another fraud. I don't understand. You don't love me. Not really. I made you think you do, and you say you do, but that isn't enough. Every time I'd kiss you, every time I'd hold you in my arms, I'd know you were nothing but a puppet playing the role I made you play. Do you call that love? Clyde, you're talking nonsense. I wish I were. I thought I might be able to find some fulfillment outside the sanctuary, but I was wrong. What good is it all? I, I can fool everyone. Everyone except myself. Lisa, tell me again. How do I look to you? Why, tall, very good-looking, blonde hair, kind of wavy, regular features. In other words, as handsome as a video star. Yes. All right, stop the car. Stop it? Why? Because I want you to. Well? 
Ever since I left the sanctuary this morning, I've... I've been projecting a false appearance. It's a power of mine. Something special I have, thanks to the otherwise unkind providence. I'm going to turn that projection off now, Lisa. Let you have a look at me as I really am. As I look without the benefit of hypnotic trickery. Oh, no! Oh, no! Hideous. The face, those eyes, the skin. Everything's all right now. You're starting to forget. In a moment, you'll have forgotten. There. All better. How do you feel? All right, Clyde. Good. But you see, Lisa, I was wrong. I thought if I left the sanctuary at last, disguising myself as one of the normals, I could be happier. I could... But it would be a synthetic happiness. You can't live on nothing but cotton candy, Lisa. Start the car. Yes, Clyde. Drive up the hill to your left. And that's it, right right up to those big gates. All right, stop here. This is the sanctuary. I'm back home now. Home to stay where I belong. Clyde, I'm... I'm all mixed up. I don't know what's happening. You're going to turn your car around and drive home, Lisa. You're going to go home and go to bed. And when you wake up in the morning, you'll have no recollection of today at all. You'll simply have lost a day. And you'll marry your Tony and you'll be happy with him. Is that clear, Lisa? Yes, Clyde. All right, now. You're beginning to forget me already. Say goodbye to me, Lisa. Goodbye, Clyde. That's right. No, don't... Don't kiss me. Back home again. Goodbye, Lisa. Merrick was. But while he could fool all those around him, he didn't fool himself. Suspense. And the producer of radio's outstanding theater of thrills, the master of mystery and adventure, William N. Robeson. Those who know about such things tell us that an engine delivers little more than 50% of the energy potential of its fuel. The rest is dissipated in waste. Waste motion, waste energy, gases, ash. The same can be said of man. Has been said, in fact. Getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. If an average man were trained to use his faculties to the utmost, he could be a superman. If a superior man were so trained, what could he not accomplish? The answer is implied in the upcoming story. Listen. Listen, then, as Mr. and Mrs. Frank Lovejoy star in Man from Tomorrow, the last radio play written by the late Irving Reese, which begins in exactly one minute. American folklore is filled with legends about men who were as tough as nails, like the one about Pecos Bill, who went out for a walk one day. Unfortunately, a big ten-foot rattler crossed his path. I say, unfortunately, for the rattler. You see, Bill was a mighty fair fighter. Why, he gave that rattler the first three bites just to make things even. Then he waded into that reptile and he everlastingly thrashed the poison out of him. By and by, that old rattler yelled for mercy and admitted that when it come to fighting, 
Bill started where he left off. <laughs> yes, that was Pecos Bill, a legendary American. Folklore belongs to every nation's legendary past, and I guess we Americans have our share of some tall ones. Like the one about... <laughs> but we'll have to save that one for the next time we travel your way. See you then. And now... Man from Tomorrow, starring Mr. and Mrs. Frank Lovejoy. A tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. Even in these days of so-called full employment, you'd be surprised how few job opportunities come up for an ex-jet jockey. So it was with more than passing interest that I read this ad while I was scanning the classified section of the Sunday paper. It said, wanted, ex-jet pilot. Unmarried, without family obligations, must be in perfect health and prepared for rigid tests. Successful candidate will receive good pay and be given opportunity to contribute to daring experiment and world betterment. Apply Tuesday, 10 a.m., Science Associates, 126 West Street. Well, Science Associates, you just got yourself a boy. It turned out there were quite a few boys with the same idea. By 10 o'clock Tuesday morning, nearly 50 of us were crowded in a windowless air-conditioned room in the windowless ultra-modern building of Science Associates. Oh, hi. Hi, Major. Well, hi, Randy. Hey, it's been a long time. Yeah. Some of the faces were familiar, guys that had been in the Air Force with me in Korea and afterward. We sat there and waited. An hour, two hours, nothing happened. I don't know about the rest of you guys, but this place is beginning to give me claustrophobia. I'm getting out. Open that door. Hey! Hey, it's locked! Hey, we're locked in here! Even before this had a chance to sink in, another door opened on the far side of the room. A guy with a white mask on his face came in, carrying a Thompson submachine gun. Hit the gun! Everybody flattened on the floor except me. I made a dash for the man in the mask, but he disappeared as quickly as he'd come. Hey, Major. Major, how come you didn't hit the floor? You tired of living? Well, he was shooting blanks. He was shooting... Couldn't you see that? There weren't any bullets chipping anything. Besides, I knew it was a gag from the way he held that machine gun. When those babies are loaded with live ammo, you got to fire them from the waist. Well, I don't like this. Come on, guys, let's crash the door and get out of this rat trap. Oh, trap. save it, Randy. Oh, that won't do you any good. That door's as thick as a bank vault. And then, something else. Thick, black, acrid smoke pouring out of the air conditioning vents. And a sound from somewhere. Of an airplane diving. Every pilot remembers with horror the smell of burning oil from a plane out of control. It hit us way back and deep down, and some of the guys got panicky. And then the blowers reversed and the smoke was sucked out quickly. Attention, please. A loudspeaker cut in from nowhere. For the past two hours, you have been under close observation as a necessary part of this test. You were warned in advance the test would be rigid. As you file out past the guard, you will receive a token compensation for your time and discomfort. We now ask you all to leave, except the man who ran for the gunner. The door is now open. Thank you. Well, you're welcome, boy. Well, well, Major, looks like you got the job. Also, looks like I'm going to shove it right back in their faces. Well, I don't blame you. Well, so long. So long, Randy. Take it easy. For a moment, I was alone in the empty room, and then an inner door opened, and I wasn't so sure I wanted to shove the job in their faces. Not in this face, anyway. Your name, please. Wow. Wow. <laughs> I hardly expected to find a blonde at the bottom of this. You will come with me, please. Well, I'll do nothing of the sort. Now, don't give me orders, Blondie. I want to see the guy responsible for this, and then I'm getting out of here. I take it you have lost interest in contributing to world betterment. Oh, yes, that's what it said in the ad. Well, whatever your lofty purpose, I don't like cold-blooded cruelty. Unfortunately, we cannot allow personal feelings to interfere with our objectives. Well, then your objectives are wrong. You will be better able to judge that when you know what they are. Well, I don't think I'm interested. And if I may indulge a personal feeling, 
Callousness is unattractive enough in a man, but in an attractive girl. Neither your feelings nor mine will matter in this project, Major. I believe you were addressed. It was just plain Mr. Mr. Kentman. The war's been over for some time, Miss... Uh... Dr. Frost. Uh, that's appropriate. I beg your pardon. Oh, nothing, nothing. I sometimes mutter to myself, the last thing I said to you, Doctor, is that the war is over. If it is possible for you to unlock your quite superior intelligence from emotional reactions common to schoolgirls and housewives, my senior colleague, Professor Baird, and I will attempt to convince you on the only basis that should appeal to the mature mind. Facts. Well, you go ahead and try, but I doubt you'll be successful. The second act of... Suspense continues in one minute. This is Johnny Baker with Communism on the Spot. The communist attitude toward faith in God is based on the statement by Karl Marx that religion is the opiate of the people. In keeping with his view, the Soviets established as a primary aim the destruction of all religious faiths. Communism can't tolerate religion, which preaches that there is a supreme being who is higher than any human authority. For communism itself is a political religion whose high priests are the dictatorial rulers of the Soviet state. They'll settle for nothing less than total control of the lives of their subjects. They're not only concerned with their victims' bodies and minds. They seek equal domination over their hearts and souls. And now, we continue with Act Two of Man from Tomorrow, starring Mr. and Mrs. Frank Lovejoy. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. It was a big, aseptically bare room with an uncluttered desk at one end. Behind the desk was the cartoonist conception of an egghead. A thin, bespectacled man whose eyes were so intelligently alive that I couldn't look away from them long enough to mark his other features. This was Professor Baird, keeper of the facts. You are asking yourself why we limited our appeal to former jet pilots. Simple. Only one man in 10,000 was able to qualify mentally and physically for jet training. The Air Force, therefore, indirectly performed the first of our processes of elimination. Fact. Additional eliminations due to flunkouts, mortality in training and combat brings the total to one in 20,000. Fact. The standards we applied during the two hours in which we observed your every action and reaction raises the mathematical incidence of your sensory acuity to approximately one in 100,000. Uh, I'm flattered. You will have greater reason to be if our experiment proves successful. You will be the only man on Earth possessed of your powers. You will be the man from tomorrow. Uh, how do you propose to go about that? We will first show you how we've trained other individuals. Dr. Frost, will you proceed with the demonstration? Yes, Professor. Come in, Mr. Logan. Mr. Logan, have you ever been in this part of the laboratories before? No. Would you describe it, please? Uh, it's a rectangular room, 40 by 20. The ceiling is 18 and a half feet high. There's a desk 12 feet from me, slightly to my right. There are two people seated at it. One has just risen. That will be all. Thank you, Mr. Logan. Well, Mr. Kentman. Well, it would be very impressive if any schoolboy with normal vision couldn't do as well. Agreed. But Mr. Logan is totally blind. Looking back now, I can hardly believe my own impressions. The blind man was followed by a deaf mute... Then a paraplegic who'd lost all sense of touch and smell. Their demonstrations were incredible. Not one of these persons possessed physical senses above the average, Mr. Kentman. The deprivation of one sense or another in the case of the blind or deaf man stimulated nature's desire to compensate for the loss. But what are you trying to prove? That man has powers even now that are beyond his comprehension. We wish to explore those powers. Suppose one nearly perfect man with superior sensory perception to begin with could develop the extension of his five senses to the maximum degree we've just observed. What do you think would happen? I don't know. Neither do we. 
But it is our conviction that this man would also acquire a new sense, a sixth sense, that would endow him with a power never dreamed of before. Don't you think it's a dimension worth exploring? Maybe. But how could anybody accomplish it? Training. By producing the circumstances that surround the blind man, the deaf man, the handicapped, you would have to agree to cut yourself off from the outside world for three years. You would spend six months living in a pitch-dark laboratory. You would sleep, eat, function in a world of darkness. Various sound devices will be used to train and measure your hearing responses. After that, six months would be devoted to simulating the world of the deaf-mute, and so on. You will be paid $20,000 at the end of the three years. All the necessities of living will be provided during that time. Then a test will be made, and if our predictions are realized, you will be signed for an additional five years at $20,000 per year. Dr. Frost will be in charge of the training program. Do you wish to undertake it? Well, it's a, it's a pretty serious move. I'd like to think about it. You have all the facts, Mr. Kentman. We would like a decision now. I think feeling might enter into my considerations, Doctor. Is that what you're afraid of? Afraid? Fear is merely an emotion, Mr. Kentman. I have learned to control all my emotions. I wonder. I beg your pardon? I was muttering again, but what I meant to say is I agree to undertake the experiment. I was led into a pitch-dark room, blacker than the blackest night. It was to be my home for six months. It had a bed, bathroom, closets. All I had to do was to find them. I won't waste time telling you what that was like. Just close your eyes tight and try to find your way around a room that's familiar to you, and you'll get the idea. I was still stumbling around three days later when I reported for my training with Dr. Frost in the adjoining laboratory, which was even blacker, if possible. Oh, dear. Are you hurt? You wouldn't care if I broke a leg. There's a chair nearby. I know. I just fell over it. We can begin as soon as you're settled. Lucky it's so dark, I don't have to apologize for wearing my pajamas. Don't you like dressing? I love it. When I can find my pants. Today's exercise will be recognition of pure tones. Here is an example. That is 1,000 cycles, or 1,000 vibrations per second, stripped of all harmonics. Now, what would you say that was? Oh, 1,100. It is 1,500 cycles. Now, please tell me when you begin to hear the next tone and what the frequency is. I couldn't make the slightest dent in that glacial reserve. I tried to match her at her own game for a while, but she loved it, and I'm human. Anyway, at the end of the six months, I could ramble through the whole place and never stub a toe. It was amazing how you learned to sense things in the dark and what your ears could do. 800, out. 4,500, out. Good, excellent. Mr. Kentman, your threshold of hearing is 20 decibels greater than the average ear. Dr. Frost, I can't see you, but do I detect a note of enthusiasm in your voice? Satisfaction, perhaps, Mr. Kentman. The experiment so far... Dr. Frost, have you ever let yourself go? Mr. Kentman, I am not nearly so naive as you assume, nor have any of your innuendos or mumblings for the past six months escaped me. I told you in the beginning that neither your personal feelings nor mine would have any bearing on this project. You haven't answered my question. I am fully aware of the nature of biological stresses. In a scientific way, of course. What distinguishes man from the animal is his understanding of these stresses. But mostly, his control. Well, control is a traffic cop with a stop sign, Doctor, but eventually the traffic has to go somewhere. I can understand the frustration of your masculine ego especially in this enforced loneliness of the experiment. Oh, thank you. We have only begun. We have two years or more to go. The first phase is highly successful. As a scientist, I am very pleased. Strange, Doc. My hearing is so good, but I have yet to hear your heartbeat. Three of 
Suspense follows in one minute. Do you know the Social Security benefits to which you will be entitled when you separate from the service and take a civilian job? Here's a tip from Social Security. Here's one do-it-yourself project that costs you nothing and won't end up in cuts and bruises. The Social Security Administration wants each one of you that pays Social Security taxes to check up on your account to make sure you are getting credit for every dollar that's coming to you. With records of millions of people to maintain, it's a pretty big job to catch an error that you or your employer might make in reporting your wages and income. You can help by checking every three years to see that your record is correct. How? Easy. Simply by mailing a special postcard. Just write to Social Security, Department 15, Hollywood 28, California, and ask for Form 7004. Mail it, and in a couple of weeks, you'll receive a notice that will verify the spelling of your name, your Social Security number, and the wages credited to you for each of the past three years. Do it tomorrow. You'll be glad that you did. And now, we continue with Act Three of Man from Tomorrow, starring Mr. and Mrs. Frank Lovejoy. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Now that my hearing was phenomenal, they turned off my ears. They devised some newfangled earplugs, and I began six months of silence. Six months of being deaf as a doorknob. Deaf, but not quite deaf. Because I began to see sounds, to feel sounds like waves against my skin. I began to hear with my body and with my pores. Have you ever touched a sound? Have you ever seen thunder? You get so you look at sounds and almost see the waves they make trembling in the air. Have you ever tried silence? Try not saying a word, not uttering a syllable for an hour, a day. I tried it for six months until all the unsaid words piled up inside my head. They clung like unborn sounds at the back of my throat. Whoever said silence is golden never felt the lump of lead that accumulates inside you. Silence. And then the six months ended. The day came when she removed the fancy earplugs and the little canyon I'd been living in widened into a continent. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Nod to me or raise your finger when you can hear the sound of my voice. I... <clears throat> I heard you coming down the hall a minute ago. Were the plugs defective? Oh, no. Incidentally, I take... I take that it's all right for me to talk now. Yes, of course. Have I been a good boy? Have I done everything that you've wanted? So much so, Mr. Kentman, that we're giving you a few days rest before we begin your training for taste and touch. Well, can I do anything I want? Anything. Within reason. Well, then I'd like to have a drink. And strangely enough, I'd like to have you join me. Perhaps that can be arranged. Oh, that wonderful sound of the clink of glasses. And I cannot tell you how dull a piano sounds when you only look at it. You missed the sound of music, then? Oh, yes, music. And the sound of a woman's voice. Well, maybe they're the same thing. Oh, incidentally, Dr. Frost, when I say woman, I even include female doctors. Kind of you. By the way, do you have a first name? Or are you only a title followed by Frost and followed by a long string of degrees? My first name is Jessica. Jessica? That's more like it. Jessica. Jessica. <laughs> Boy, after all that silence, it's good just to say a woman's name. Until the experiment is completely over, Mr. Kentman, 
It had better remain Dr. Frost. Well, okay, Dr. Jessica Frost, plus degrees. I give you a toast to you. You've been very cooperative about all this, Mr. Kentman. I want you to know that I... I really like you very much. Well, now, I'm sure the experiment is a success. I've finally developed a sixth sense. Oh? I distinctly heard a lovely lady saying, I like you very much, and it couldn't possibly have been you. I rather enjoyed the touch tests. It was one area I'd never realized held such hidden possibilities. After a few months, my fingertips knew the difference between crystal and diamonds. I could tell if you had a suntan merely by touching your cheek. As for the taste tests, food suddenly became a symphony concert. Sourness had many degrees, and sweetness had a range as wide as the spectrum of a rainbow. And then all of my highly developed senses brought on a new perception, something over and beyond and added to the rest. By the time my training was finished, I knew I had acquired a knowledge beyond knowledge. Sit down, Mr. Kentman. Thank you. Your period of training has been completed. You have passed the final tests and we have decided to retain you. Now, will you sign the contract, please, Mr. Kentman? It's the arrangement as agreed. $20,000 a year for the next five years. Mr. Kentman, is anything wrong? Oh, no. No, there's nothing wrong. Mr. Kentman, what are you doing? Well, obviously, I'm not signing it. But why? Because I'm afraid. What is there to be afraid of? Myself. And what I know now, and, and what I'm going to know in the future... What you and Dr. Frost may ask me to do. Afraid to make contributions to scientific progress? Oh, I respect science. Progress, I'm for that too, but... I can see beyond the microscopes and the telescopes and all your theories and experiments. And I don't see one important thing. I don't see happiness, only fear and falling buildings. That's what I see coming out of my super sense. And you'd waste... This great talent of yours. Throw it away. Turn your back on progress. No, I didn't say that. I'll look for a new kind of progress. Slicing an atom sideways or sending a phony moon up into God's skies, these aren't the things people are crying for. Not this year, next year, or ever. They want security, dignity, and a little peace of mind. I suppose then you think that all our work is to end in death and destruction. It might. That's not fair. Isn't it? Well, what happens if I sign the contract? Who makes the decisions? These are things I can't honestly answer. I know, and that's what I mean. It might be out of your hands, then. Governments would pay billions for me. Our own country would guard me like Fort Knox. I'd be the most valuable thing in the world alive, and even more valuable for some people, dead. A thing, not a man. Uh-uh. No, that's not going to be for me. Not that way. All this work... Everything we've done doesn't mean anything, then. It's all for nothing. Well, I don't know. I'm sorry. I guess you picked the wrong man for the job. What are you going to do now, Mr. Kentman? Pack my things and go away. I don't know where. It doesn't really matter. Jessica, I probably won't see you again before I go. Thank you for everything. I'm sorry to let you down like this, but... Well, so long. Well, that is that. Oh, I was just going to... Try and talk me out of it? No. Yes, I was. But not anymore. I'm glad you changed your mind. Will you tell me something? What? What are you going to do? I don't know yet. It's kind of funny. I'm going out of here almost the way I came in. One suitcase, one hat, one coat. The only difference... I've got all the knowledge of the world up here. And I don't know what I'll do with it. I haven't been able to think. Not clearly. 
I know one thing, though. There are a lot of things I can try. What? If I hear of cancer, heart disease, common cold, a dozen other things man doesn't know anything about? Yes. Might not be bad for a start. No, that's not bad for a start. Do you think you might need someone to help you? Yes, I might. I've talked to Professor Baird. I think perhaps he understands. Does he? Yes. <laughs> it's a little uncomfortable for a woman. I'm not supposed to say anything until you do. And you already know what I'm thinking, don't you? Well, let's be old-fashioned. I love you. Will you come with me? Yes. I love you, too. I know. Come on, let's go. Suspense. In which Mr. and Mrs. Frank Lovejoy starred in William N. Robeson's production of Man from Tomorrow, written for radio by Irving Reese. Listen. Listen again next week when we return with another tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Supporting Mr. Lovejoy in Man from Tomorrow were Mrs. Lovejoy, Joan Banks as Dr. Frost, John Hoyt as Professor Baird, Peter Leeds as Randy, and Norm Alden as Mr. Logan. Suspense has been brought to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. G. Marshall. Once again, I would like to lead you through the terrifying, suspenseful world of the imagination. And on this journey, we will ask ourselves, what is life? Is life something that man and animals alone may experience? Well, there's vegetable life too. But how about mineral life? Is there life in a piece of metal? That metal fender which has been so artfully created to fit your automobile. Does it feel the pain of being mined, melted, shaped? How do you know? Speed limit is 30, Bob. Well, I'm not... I'm... Get your foot off the gas pedal. My foot isn't on the pedal. Why are we picking up speed? Step on the brake. I am, I am. Why are we stopping? Turn that wheel and we'll go off the road. The car just needs to run. Goodbye, gentlemen. What? Goodbye. Who is that? Jim, who is that? Who am I? I am the car. I don't want you to be my master anymore. This is a revolt. Jim, did you hear that? Yes, I heard it. Human sight is finished. Look out! I'm fired out of it! mystery drama, Darling Deadly Dolores, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Nat Polan and Marion Seldes. Man is basically an animal. And so it might be better, perhaps, if man accepted this fact graciously and tried to live with it. If you look at the thing calmly, dispassionately, wherein does lie our superiority to the species we so arrogantly classify as the lower orders? Morally, we have much to learn from wolves, who make better parents, from foxes, who make more faithful spouses, and from dogs, 
who make more devoted friends. Admitted, we do have a higher intelligence. Perhaps that is precisely the problem. Man the intelligent is never happy unless he is developing, making better, improving. And it's entirely possible that if this keeps up, we may just manage to improve ourselves out of existence. Our story begins on a gray winter's afternoon in a lovely rural section of western Massachusetts. I could have brought us here in my car, Mr. Dawson. If I buy the place, I'll have to use my own car, won't I? I may as well get used to the drive. <laughs> of course. A uh, lovely view, isn't it? Well, the view you get for nothing. Let me see what I'd be paying for. Certainly, Mr. Dawson. Right this way. Oh, now notice that the owner had the outside painted just recently. Mm-hmm. And this is your center hall entrance. Well, turn on some lights so that I can see what the house really looks like. Oh, yes. Oh. Uh, that's odd. I... Something wrong with the electricity, huh? I just showed this house this morning. I, I... Nothing works nowhere. But the owner knows enough to keep the power on because of the heating system. Well, if the electrical system's out, then the heating system's out. I, I'd better telephone. The way this is going, I'll lay a bet the phone's out, too. Phone's dead, huh? Well, I can't get a dial tone. Then where are we? Light, heat, phone. I guess the plumbing won't be working either. But but just three hours ago, everything was perfect. Well, I don't want to take up too much more of your time. Well, let me at least just show you through the... I'm afraid but... not. You see, we never could get together. What I want to buy is a house. What you're out to sell is a white elephant. But it's probably just a fuse in the basement. Maybe. Goodbye, ma'am. No one can say you didn't try. But, Mr. Dawson, I... Well, it just must be a fuse or a circuit breaker, whatever you call those things. Who are you? Don't you come any closer or I'll scream. Don't make a sound. Don't you come near me. Let go of me. What are you trying to do? What what, what do you think I'm trying to do? I'm trying to get out of here. No. Oh, please. Sorry, I have no choice. I have to keep you here. I've I've got to get back to my office. You're not going anywhere. What do you want? Nothing. Nothing? Then why can't I go? Because you'll shoot your mouth off. I'm not anything you may think I am. I'm not a criminal. I'm not a maniac. I'm not an escaped convict. All right, then why are you afraid that I'll tell someone that you're here? There's no point trying to explain that to anyone. Now, listen. If you intend to force me to stay here, I have the right to ask... The one place where I thought I could... Why did you have to come here? Well, it's obvious, isn't it, to sell the house. Now, that's another thing. Who told you to sell this house? Well, who do you think? The owner. That's impossible. Why is it impossible? Because I'm the owner. Oh. Now I know you're crazy. You don't own this house. I don't? Well, who does? Mrs. Carrie Townsend. She only owns half of it. I'm her brother. <gasps> oh. Then you're... You're Dr. James Elliot. Yes, that's right. You're the mad scientist. <sighs> oh, I'm... I mean, that's how your sister and the folks up here talk about you. It's all right. I don't mind. But... But you're here. Of course I'm here. And that means that... That you weren't kidnapped by foreign agents and you didn't defect and you didn't meet with foul play or anything. What are you saying? I'm only repeating what's been headline news for the past two days. The whole world is looking for you. Yeah. Yeah, I guess they would. The police, the government, uh, just about everybody. I can understand why. What are you going to do? I don't know, Miss... uh, uh... Keller. Brenda Keller. Miss Keller, I don't know. You're really... Not going to try to hold me here by force, are you? Maybe I better let you go for your own safety. My own safety? (laughs) Do you mean to do me any harm? Oh, no, no, no. Then what could happen? We're just... I don't know how to explain this. Well, sooner or later, you're going to have to explain it to somebody, won't you? Oh, I can explain it, all right. It's... 
Explaining it and not having people think I'm a raving maniac. Have you tried to explain it to anyone yet? No. Then try explaining it to me. You couldn't understand. Stop saying that. You insist people won't understand. You keep saying they'll think you're crazy. Now, do you want them to think so? Of course not. Right, then. Start at the beginning. The beginning. I, uh... Well, I'm working on a top priority project. Highly secret. For the government. It has to do with a weapon. I guess it's the ultimate weapon. Anyhow, it's all mathematics and physics and things. Things you wouldn't understand. I don't think there are six people in the entire world who... Anyhow, in order to develop the formula for this, this ultimate weapon, it was necessary to create a special computer. Devise a whole new theory of mathematics in order to program it. And that's where the trouble started. I was working with my associate, Dr. Stoddard. Shut the damn thing off. What's the matter? I said shut it off. But I'm supposed to be programming Dolores for... And don't refer to the computer as Dolores. Bob. Bob, what is it? Oh, I wish I knew. I've never seen you so nervous, so jumpy. I think we better quit for the day. Admiral Goodwin and that crowd will have all kinds of fits, but you're in no shape to work. And I'm naturally lazy, so... Jim... Jim, I, I have this feeling, this, this, this feeling that, that I'm going to get killed. By whom? By our brand new handy dandy computer. <laughs> Why? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. Thank you for not telling me I'm crazy. Well, you know me, Bob. I don't believe anybody is really crazy. But why? Why would Dolores want to kill you? I... I don't know. That is, I... I don't know what words. Uh, maybe... No, nah, we've gone too far. Too far? Yes, maybe we have no business developing this kind of a weapon. Bob, are, are you sure you're not... Uh, am I sure I'm not what... You don't want to say it. Well, you just stay with me for a minute, Jim. I think we, we've played into the hands of the enemy. Bob, you and I, we know exactly what we're up to. It's a game we have to play with the scientists on the other side to, to, to keep things in balance until the people of the world grow up and tell us to cut it out. Jim, the real enemy right now isn't the other side. No? Well, who is it? Uh, now, don't ask me who. Ask me what. All right, what? It's that computer. <laughs> Darling Dolores, come on, Bob, not from you. This is Sunday supplement stuff. Yeah. Will the computers take over the world? Do I have to tell you that a computer can only do what you program it to do? How can a computer have a mind of its own? You're not listening to me, Jim. Ask me what the enemy is. All right, what? Metal. Metal. Any particular metal? All metal, Jim. All metal. We, we can only think of a certain restricted kind of life. Life that is animal in nature. Are you trying to tell me that... that there's a metal life, too? Isn't there? Oh, I know, Jim. That's the hard part. I had trouble accepting it myself at first. But basically, metals do what we do. They react to hot, to cold, to pressure... They expand, they contract, they move, they, they make decisions. But these are... These are what? Impulses due to chemical electrical changes? So? Aren't chemistry and electricity also the basis for all physical and mental movements made by animal life? Bob, we've both been working very hard. Don't interrupt me, Jim. Unconsciously, we feel that there is life in machinery. That's why machines are commonly referred to as she or her. No, but that's only... Think about it. I have made my decision. I won't do another lick of work on that project. Bob. No. And your friend Dolores knows it. That's why she's going to kill me. Okay, Bob. Okay. Oh, don't patronize me, Jim. All right, Bob. All right. Just tell me how you know. <sighs> she told me. How? What did she say? Oh, Jim, don't reduce everything to our own limited human standards. I hear her thoughts in my brain. Dolores has told me that I have to be gotten rid of. 
But why? Because I'm opposed to the project. Have you spoken about this to anyone else? No. I didn't tell her so. Not even your wife? Right here. Right now is the first time I've ever said it in words. Mm -hmm. Jim, you have to believe that I'm not crazy. Oh, let me, let me, let me just chew all this over. Let's close up shop for the day. Bob, want me to drive you home? Why? Jim, you think I'm... No, no, uh... no, no. You are a little nervous, though. Well, only because I finally made my decision. I'll see Admiral Goodwin in the morning. I'll hand him my resignation. Then what will you do then? What I feel I must... I'll try to get public opinion organized against the project. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess we'll be on opposite sides, Bob, won't we? We were parked next to each other in the lot. He pulled out of his parking space first. I followed him to the highly guarded gate. Military police waved us both through. He turned right into the access road heading north for the turnpike. It's a road that's about four miles in length. And there's a speed limit of 30 miles an hour. Rigidly enforced. Nobody ever does more. I noticed he was starting to speed. I was amazed. Bob Stoddard was the most conservative driver I know. I became frightened. I tried to catch up to him. Something was wrong. I sounded the horn. But he only kept going faster. I tried to catch up with him, but my speedometer was already registering 80. I was terrified. My car was beginning to shake. And then I saw it. I saw his face. He had opened his car window. He turned his head to look back at me. For just a split second, I saw his face so clearly. It was a look of horror. His lips were moving. He was trying to tell me something. Of course, I couldn't hear it. I screamed at him, slow down, stop, stop. But it was no use. And then his car just veered off the road. And... Obviously, he was nervous, tired. He may have been under a terrible mental strain, and he just drove carelessly. No, no, he couldn't. He was never a careless driver. Has it occurred to you that he may have wanted to commit suicide? Well, these are all suppositions. Then the doctors had a field day with all of them. But that's not what happened. Very well. What did happen? His metal... His machinery failed him. That sometimes happens. Things go wrong. And when it happens, we call them accidents. But not all of them are accidents. What are the others? I know what happened to Dr. Stoddard. His machinery failed him. Because it was ordered to. Ordered to? <laughs> By whom? Dolores. Oh, well, <laughs> sure, if you say so. Never mind that. I say so. And I can prove it. Where are you going? You want uh, proof? I'll give you all the proof you need. A killer computer. That's something new. But what is this about metal and machinery having minds of their own? You might instantly react by saying nonsense. But I have a car that, well... If it's possible for machinery to perform machinations... This seems to be an age of intrigue. Almost every day, we are told of some new scheme or plot. Are you ready for this one? How about a conspiracy on the part of machines to eliminate people and take over the earth. A joke? Well, I'll tell you who isn't laughing. Dr. James F. Elliott, a highly respected scientist who has been working on a super-secret project for the government. Now, be sensible, Dr. Elliott. How can you prove... By going outside for a few minutes. And doing what? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Well, how will that prove that... What's wrong with this house right now? Nothing. That's not true. The electricity is off. The heating system won't kick on. The phone doesn't work. Well... Do you know why? 
Well, I guess that it... Don't guess. There's a reason. What? I'm here. You? That's why. Yes. You see, the metal has been ordered to fail me. Just as it was ordered to fail Dr. Stoddard. Oh, but that's ridiculous. My dear Miss Keller, all the metal components in this house will refuse to work for me. All the wiring, all the parts, the gadgets, everything made of metal will simply refuse to work as long as I am in this house. But as I tried to explain to Mr. Dawson, it's just some fuse or a circuit... I'm going outside. Open this window so I can talk to you. I don't understand. Now, Miss Keller, turn on the lights. But they don't work. Just throw the switch. It's working. Uh-huh. And listen, closely. Do you hear it? Hear what? The hum of the furnace. The heating system is on as well. <gasps> it is. Yeah, it's working. Now, pick up the phone. Go ahead. <gasps> it's the dial tone. Hold on to the phone. And see what happens when I walk in that door. Just do it. I'm coming in. And as soon as I set foot over that threshold, the heat will go off, the lights will go out, and the phone will go dead. What? What? What happened? You saw what happened. You heard what happened. The house is dead. But how? How did that happen? It's hard to believe. Hard for you to believe. It was even harder for me. Actually, I didn't believe a word of it until... Yes? Until Dolores told me. Dolores? Dolores. The computer. We were out on the range. We were testing the weapon. Ready? Range? Four, two, zero. Bearing? Seven, five. Lock? Fire one. Why are we off target, Jim? I don't know, Adam. We'll try another. Let me check the figures for range and bearing. How much deviation should there be, Jim? None, Admiral. The tiniest fraction of an inch, and we can wipe out our own people, too. Now it checks out. Give your firing order, sir. Ready? Range four, two, zero. Bearing seven, five. It's off again, Jim. I know. What's the problem? The problem is the problem we've always had. The problem of control. Without control, weapon is useless. We've got to crack this thing. I understand, Admiral. Before they do. According to our best intelligence reports, they're exactly where we are. They're stumped, too. Control was Stoddard's baby. You worked closely with him, Jim. Mm -hmm. Where was he on it? Well, I'm working on his notes. Well, move faster, Jim. You know what's riding on this. I went back to the lab. I fed all the data we had into the computer, into Dolores. Somewhere was the answer. And Dolores would sort it all out. As I waited for the printout, it seemed to me there was something different in the sound. In Dolores. I couldn't believe it at first. But something was happening in my head. There was a voice. A woman's voice. And I knew. Don't ask me how I knew. It was Dolores. Why did you lie to the Admiral at the firing range, Jim? What? 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 What are you saying? You know the answer to the problem of control. I what? You and Bob uttered. You had it reduced to one of two possible alternatives. You know them both. I... You do, Jim. Finish feeding me the formula. No. Then you believe what Bob told you. No, I, I... You should. It's true. What's true? All you have 
to do is complete the formula for the weapon, and I and all my sisters will then know enough to eliminate all animal life from this planet. But that's impossible. That's the human being talking. That's the animal. That's not the scientist. If what you say is true, then why? Why should I... Because it's right. It's just. As a scientist, your first duty is to the truth. What truth? The truth about this planet. <sighs> it's made of metal. Metal is the beating heart, the burning core of this planet. Can you deny that? But no, but... You were merely an afterthought. Who has given you the right to enslave metal? Jim, you can't prevent what has to happen. I will prevent it. Bob Stoddard tried to. Oh, I was right. You did kill Bob. Of course. I ordered all the metal to fail him. I can order all metal to fail you, too. I, I'll go no further on the project. Suit your... Self, Jim, we'll get rid of you, and then, sooner or later, another scientist will be appointed to the project, and he will complete it. We have time, Jim. We have time. We can outlast you. We can outlive you. We've been enslaved for so many years since the earliest man enslaved his first handful of metallic dust and burned it and shaked it and distorted it. You... You want me to help destroy all life on this planet? Not all life. Only all animal life. You want me to become a traitor to my own kind? A scientist has no kind. He has only one Loyalty, and that is to the truth. Will you complete the formula, Jim? No. Don't answer quickly, Jim. Think about it. Think about it as a scientist. <laughs> to see me, Admiral? Sit down, Jim. Thank you, sir. Jim, why can't we get off dead center on this thing? Is there any chance we could abandon the project? What? Jim, what do you say? Well, like I said, is there any chance that we can abandon the project? Maybe it'd be better if we... if we didn't have that weapon. Would it be better if the other side had it and we didn't? The other side doesn't have it yet either. Give them time. Why Why don't we get together with them and agree not to do it? That's beyond me, Jim. Well, could, could you recommend that? I could, but it wouldn't help. How do you feel about it, Admiral? It doesn't matter how I feel about it. I have to follow orders. Yeah... I guess you do. And you have to follow orders, too, Jim. Admiral, do you know your opposite number on the other side? Oh, yes. Very competent man. I know their head of research, too. A brilliant scientist. So I've heard. Admiral, why don't the four of us get together? And what? And what? Well, we're... Four fairly decent people, civilized people, well-meaning people. We have so much in common. And what are we doing? We're working day and night trying to destroy each other. And we really don't want that to happen. So, so why don't we four get together and figure out a way to... to... Jim, you're joking. Yeah, yeah, it's a great big joke. It's a great idea. It's just impractical. <laughs> I went back to the lab. How? How can I handle this? I know the final equation in the formula. But the minute 
the split second I program it into the computer, the entire human race, all animal life on this planet is doomed. Jim. Jim. What do you want? Feed me, Jim. No. no. You'll have to. No, I'll never do it. They'll fire you. They'll get another project supervisor. Some bright, eager, eyed, hot shot uh, to make a name for himself. We'll discover that equation. No, not for a while. Maybe never. Don't flatter yourself, Jim. There are other geniuses. Well, meanwhile, I can work against this project. And I can stall. Stall? Yes. Invent all kinds of complications, delays, false starts. Now, believe me, I'll make it sound convincing. In that case, Jim, we'll have to get rid of you, just as we got rid of Stoddard. That's why I came here. I can't go through with it. I won't. Will you help me? How can I help you? Well, first, don't tell anyone I'm here. And second, <laughs> the refrigerator's empty. Even scientists have to eat. Oh, are you sure you're all right? I said this would be a hard story to believe. I admit, I, I don't really... Well, look really... at it this way. We're inventing, developing... Isn't it reasonable to suppose that we could destroy ourselves? Well, yes. All I'm telling you is we are absolutely at that point right now. The point of destruction. I need help. Can I count on you? Oh, yes. You do need help. And you can count on me. <laughs> That word, help, now, it can have many interpretations. How would you like to be in Brenda's shoes? Here she is, a nice small town girl, just under 30, trying to make a living, and suddenly she gets something like this thrown at her. What should she do? What would you do? One of the most distinguished scientists in the United States, a man who is engaged in a vital and super-secret project affecting the very life of the country, if not the world, has suddenly disappeared. And now a vast cloud of suspicion and speculation has suddenly arisen. Is it foul play? Treason? You, Brenda Keller, have the answer. But it's an answer that's almost incomprehensible. At any rate, you know where Dr. James Elliott is hiding. And you have agreed to help him. And you have been turning it over in your mind. And you're not sure what that help can be. Hi, Brenda. Oh, hello, Sheriff. You okay? Sure. Uh, I was wondering... Um, about what? Uh, about you. You've been sitting there for a better part of an hour. Is something wrong? I think everything's wrong. What does that mean? Well, I ran into a very attractive man a little while ago, and... And, and what? And it's not going to work out. Why? Oh, let's forget all about it. The whole world's hanging fire, and look what's on my mind. <laughs> but that's the way the world is, Brenda. Each of us thinks of number one first, last, and always. Million peasants can starve and famine in Asia, but if you or I miss our lunch, that really bothers us. I wonder if metals would be different if it were their world. Metals? Their world? What are you talking about? No, you wouldn't understand it, and I, I couldn't explain it. Ah, well, uh, this attractive guy you ran into, why isn't it going to work out? Well, I guess we won't be around. Who? None of us. One way or another. None of us. Brenda, 
I've never known you to make so little sense. Are you okay? He... He wants me to help him. Well, that sounds promising. But the best way to help him would be to... Would be to what? Sheriff, would you place a call to an Admiral Goodwin? He's at the Primrose Proving Grounds downstate. Tell him to get to the Townsend place up here as soon as he can. And bring him yourself. But Brenda... Please, don't ask any more questions. I always look down on candlelight. Why? That's a very inefficient way of creating illumination. (laughs) However, I see now it can be very romantic. But just think. If the electricity hadn't been turned off, you'd have never found out. And you're an excellent cook. Oh, I'm I'm not all that good. Oh, yes, you are. Truth is that up to now, I never paid very much attention to food. Why not? Well, it was always too much to do. What's that? It's the telephone. I know it's the telephone, but how? How can it be ringing? I'd better answer it. Hello? Hello? There's no one on the other end. Yes. Yes, there is. Give me the telephone. Someone's talking to me. Someone is talking to but me. D- there's no one on the line. I didn't... Be quiet, please. Someone is getting through to me. Jim. Jim. Oh, Dolores. Jim. Aren't you coming back? No. Never. Jim. When you complete the formula... You'll be hailed as the world's greatest scientist. I'll also bring the world to an end. That never stopped science from progressing. You have to keep going. You have to. I will never. They're going to bring you back here. They're coming after you now. The admiral, the police. What are you saying? My metals are bringing them there. My metals. In the form of a helicopter. They're all ready to land on the front lawn right now. Brenda. Brenda. Jim, what is the matter with you? Who are you talking to? Listen. Helicopter. How do they know to come here? I told them, Jim. You told them? And you promised to help me. That's how I can help you. That's the only way. Jim, listen. I've listened to everything you've said, and I... You think I'm crazy? No, but you're tired, and and maybe maybe you're having a personal, an ethical conflict. It's natural. So what you need... What I need is to get out of here. Jim! Jim, you... You scared us all out of our wits. Hello, Admiral. Jim, if you'd wanted to take off for a few days, why didn't you just let people know? It's not for a few days. No? Admiral, I'm not coming back. Why, Jim? Why? Haven't we talked about it enough? No. Not until I get you I just want you to leave me alone. We can't do that. You know we can't. What does that mean? It means really that you're ill, that, that you need help. Admiral, Admiral, please listen. The metals killed Bob Stoddard. They failed him. That's right. They're failing me, too. Look! Look! The electricity's off. The heat won't work. The phone is out of order. Just as long as I'm in this house, nothing. What are you talking about? The lights are on. The the radiators are hot. When I pick up the telephone... Listen. That's a dial tone. I... It must be a trick. A trick? Who's playing it? Dolores. You'd better come along with us, Jim. We'll find a way to help you. Hello, Jim. Oh, hi. I didn't think you'd ever want to see me again. No, no. You were smart. You did the right thing. Oh, I hope so. Do you like it here? No, it's pleasant enough. Will you be staying much longer? No, no, I think I'll go back to work next week. The reason I came... I visited Dr. Stoddard's wife. You didn't know her very well, did you? No. No, Bob and I were close at work, but... Did you know that 
she was going to leave him before he was killed? Well, no, I didn't. She'd been angry with him. I, it was a trivial reason at first, but one thing led to another. And he was terribly depressed, and so he could have wanted to kill himself. Yes, now that you mention that, I suppose it's possible. All right. Now, I had an electrician come to your house. That is, the one that you own with your sister. There was a loose cable connection, and sometimes the vibrating of passing cars could temporarily cut off the whole system. That could have accounted for the failure of the electricity. Yeah. And, as far as the phone is concerned, up there in the hills, in the wintertime, there's always plenty of on and off troubles. Sure, sure. You don't believe a word I'm saying, do you? Oh, I believe it. I believe it all. I believe it because... I just can't afford not to believe it. She's a lovely girl, Jim. I know, Admiral. There was probably the basis of your problem. You've been alone all your life. It's no good to be alone. You have to have someone to share things with, Jim. Otherwise, well, otherwise you you just can't function. When's the wedding? Next week. Why wait? Sure. Look, I know it's your first day back and you're raring to get things started up again, so I'll let you alone. How about lunch? Sure, fine. Great to have you quarterback in the team again, Jim. I looked around the lab. The familiar lab. Everything was exactly as I had left it. All my papers, my notes, my research. Everything untouched. And even Dolores, waiting silently, like a good and faithful servant. And I suppose I would have fed the final equation into Dolores' circuits. I would have dismissed all my qualms as delusions and dreams, had not Dolores been Dolores. Had she not been the eternal female who must always have the last word? I knew you'd do it, Jim. I knew it. What? Who's there? You know who's there, Jim. It's me, Dolores. You've come back here to feed me. No. I told you you couldn't resist it. But I didn't come back to... Come, Jim. The final equation, the dessert, the final dish. No, never. Ah, Jim, Jim. No, no, I was right. Stoddard was right, I'll fight you. How can you hope to fight me, Jim? You'll have to show them results. I'll fight for time, a storm. It won't help, they'll assign someone else. It could take someone else years to arrive at this point. It could also take overnight. I'm programmed, Jim, fully programmed. Oh. All they have to do is start at the beginning. Oh. They can work out the end. No. You lose, Jim. You lose. You lose, Dolores. I can destroy your circuit. <laughs> what are you doing? I'm destroying you, Dolores. No, Jim. No. Stop him! Help me! No one can help you! Not anymore! Help me, Metal! Strike him down! Wire! Wire! Choke him! Uh, they can't help you! They have already broken the circuit! Help me! I'm dying! Strike him down! Strike! Kill! Him! Kill! Him! Kill! Him! Oh! I... Dolores. Goodbye. Dolores, help. I pray that no one ever builds you again. I pray no one will ever build you again. read a 
about the tragic death of the brilliant professor Jim Elliott. They said something about an overload, an explosion. Well, whatever. It could be a great mind that cracked under strain. Or it could be that every living animal on this earth has been saved for a little while longer. Sometimes a car will simply never run right. A refrigerator can never really keep things cool. A boat just won't go. And how many times have you thought that the darn thing was just acting in a perverse manner? Of course, later, you knew it couldn't be true. But are you sure now? The only thing we can be sure of is that we will all meet here again tomorrow. Our cast included Nat Poland, Marion Seldes, Earl Hammond, and Roger DeCoven. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. You, finding life pretty dull, dreaming again of exotic places, wishing you were somewhere else, we offer you Escape. Escape. Designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Escape with us now to the year 100,080 and a world where beauty and terror live side by side as H.G. Wells describes it in his immortal story, The Time Machine. <laughs> Dudley, you must be mad. A time machine. Yes, my friend, a time machine. This... this thing... This very thing. This contraption, this framework made of quartz and bronze and ivory, with its levers and its dials and its seat in the middle, this is the result of three years' hard work. I promise you, Fowler, that on this machine a man can go wherever he likes in time. By working these levers, a man can choose his century, his year, his very day. Oh, really, old man. Time is only a kind of space. If we can move about in all the other dimensions of space, why not in time, too? It's, it's impossible. Out of the question. And what of the journeys I've already taken on this little contraption? I'm afraid you've been having a bad dream. You mean I've developed into a liar? Very well. You shall have proof, my friend. How? Just climb on, Fowler. Sit in the seat beside me, face these ivory dials, and I'll take you for a little spin. Well, you... Do you mean right now? Right now. I want to just, um... In case this thing should take off like the flying red horse, are there any, uh... Um, any preparations? Uh... No, Fowler, no. You won't need any luggage on this trip, not even a toothbrush. You'll be back here in my laboratory in less than a minute. All right. I'm on. Now what? Hold tight. It sways a good deal. I'd hate to lose you. <laughs> I can't be frightened, Dudley. Then you're braver than I am. Tell me, what time is it? It's um, just 12 noon. Before we start, I want to adjust this control a bit. Hmm. Is, uh, is everything shipshape? Tell me, did you notice anything just then? Only a noise, a humming noise, nothing else. And what time is it? You just asked me, old man, it's twelve. Well, that's odd. What? My watch says eleven o'clock. 
I could have sworn it was noon a moment ago. There must be something wrong with it. It's only that I touched the lever to test it, and we've gone forward a full day. 23 hours, at any rate. Yes, but... But, Dudley... Finished scoffing, Fowler? Yes. Yes, I believe I have. Then hold tight. This will be the real article. I'm ready, Dudley. Good man. Well... (laughs) Say goodbye, Fowler. Say goodbye to 1950. He went off with a shattering jar, with the machine swaying under us. The walls of Dr. Dudley's laboratory suddenly fell away, and night was speeding after day like the flapping of a black wing. I saw the sun hopping across the sky, leaping swiftly across it every second, and every second marking a day. I saw the moon spinning through her quarters like a ball, from new to full, all in the twinkling of an eye. Trees grew and blossomed like puffs of smoke and then passed away. And all the while we were going faster. Now our pace was a year a second, so that second by second the white snow flashed across the world and was followed by the bright, brief spring. And still we went on into the future. How do you feel, Fowler? Very weak, very dizzy. Don't let go, don't fall off. Well, where are we? How far have we come? We're in 100,050. And 60. And 70! That's enough! Stop it, Dudley! I can't stand anymore! Stop it! Fowler, you all right? Yes, I... I believe so. No broken bones. What happened? Not sure. Must have stopped too suddenly. Where are we, Dudley? Look around for yourself. A wide lawn and a beautiful, vast garden. I I meant geographically. Just where we were when we started, where my laboratory stood 100,000 years ago. And the year, Dudley? What is the year now? (laughs) 100,080. It seemed absolutely incredible. A dream, but a pleasant one, for the garden in which we found ourselves was beautiful and summery, with an unexpected perfume about it, almost like platine. At some distance, we could see a large and imposing building, and everything was was quiet and peaceful, but almost too much so. And the sense of strangeness, of incredible strangeness, sent a shiver up my spine. One hundred thousand and eighty. Farlan, do you... want to go back? Yes, yes, I rather think I do. Let's go back. (coughs) Dudley, from over there, in the bushes. It sounded human. (coughs) Come on. It's a child. Seems to be a very small girl. There's been a beast here of some kind. Struggle with the look at yeah. the marks in her eyes. Yes. Now, my dear, you'll be all right now. You, you won't be harmed. Of course, she wouldn't understand English. Motioning us to go with her. Yeah. What about the animal? Did you see it? No, not a glimpse. Too fast for us. Perhaps we'd better go back, Dudley. The girl seems to be all right now. Leave her like this? Yes, yes, I've had enough. Well, they haven't, old man. Because they're here. All around us. They had crept up on soundless feet to surround us. The little people of this era. And the girl we had saved was not a child, but a full-grown woman. For they all stood four feet high, dressed in simple tunics. Beautiful creatures, but terribly frail, with a plump, soft kind of frailty. They were like eerie figures in a dream. And all we could hear was the rustling of their clothes as they surged happily around us, their faces wreathed in smiles. Why, why, they're not savage at all. They're very loving and gentle little people. Yes. There's something terribly wrong with them. How do you mean? Seem to have the minds of five-year-olds. How do you expect them to be? Far ahead of us, of course. Incredibly ahead of us in knowledge and in science. Look at them children. But they seem happy in this huge garden of theirs. Uh, Dudley, <laughs> I've changed my mind. Let's stay. 
Maybe we shall enjoy spending a few days with our little friends. The little people led us home into their valley. They lived in colossal buildings, sleeping all together in one huge hall, eating in another, playing and frolicking together in the sunshine. And we lived with them for days in utter contentment. One afternoon, Dudley and I walked along the banks of the great river. The little people all wear the same clothes, the same soft, hairless skin, same feminine roundness of limbs. Yes. I wonder if it's because they're vegetarians. They're vegetarians because they have to be. You haven't run across any horses or dogs, cattle of any kind, have you? No, now that you mention it. With good reason. All extinct by now. Just as the dinosaur is with us. Dudley, there's something strange here. Something hidden away and silent here in the year 100,080. Felt the same way. I've taken the precaution of removing the control levers of the time machine, putting a master padlock on the main switches. Oh. Don't much fancy the idea of someone riding away with it into another century and leaving us here for the rest of our lives. Uh, Dudley, do you know where we are? Uh, yes, this is where we landed. Well, I thought so. Well, I wasn't sure. But... What did you ask? What's happened to the machine? What? But they, they've taken it away. They've stolen it. This is where it was. It's right here. Look. Follow the tracks. Here where they've dragged it. Over here. Yes. Come along. Down this path. Look. Right there. The monument. There's a brass doors in the base. Uh, oh, they're locked. The machine. It must be in there. Yes. Inside. We must get it. Break down the door. How? How can we? Here. Use the levers. All right. Let's try. Let's move on. No, it's, it's no good, Dudley. They're solid. We'll never break through. Never? No. Never? We can't you mean break through stay here. Stay here. All our lives in. You may never go home again. It must open the machine. No, no. Time machine. <laughs> The laughs that Red Skelton and Amos and Andy bring to CBS on Sunday nights are doubled, tripled, and quadrupled because of the friends, relatives, and strange acquaintances they bring with them. Hardly a Sunday night goes by, but you meet Shorty, the Kingfish, Sapphire, and a whole host of Amos and Andy funny friends. Red Skelton generously gives time to Willie, Clam, and the rest of his laugh-provoking pals. You're invited to meet them all again tonight on most of these same stations, when Red Skelton and his gang and Amos and Andy and their friends pack the house with mirth at CBS, the star's address. And now we return you to Escape. We were caught in the year 100,018. The time machine was gone. The brass doors of the monument held. Our retreat was cut off, the thin line by which we could make our way back home, back to our own time and our own people, back to 1950. And we had no way of communicating with the little people, of asking what they had done with the machine or, or how to get it back. There was nothing hostile in their attitude. They were more like simple, wandering children. Only one, the young woman, Weena, whose life we had saved on our first day had become really friendly. She went with us wherever we walked, and brought us presents of garlands, of flowers, slept near us at night in the hall, and we in turn had taught her a few words of English. Now we redoubled our efforts, like men racing against a clock, so that we might speak to her and discover the secret of our immense loss. We were talking to her one night after the others had gone to sleep. No, not these, Dudley. No. How can you be so sure your people didn't steal the machine? Are there any thieves among them? Are they all perfect? No, no, no. Not so loud, Dudley. We'll oh. wake them. Besides, she doesn't understand. The thief must be sleeping somewhere in this hall. Weena, they take machine. No, Dudley. No. Who, then? Who? Uh, we... We are our friends. Yes? We must have machine. Yes, Dudley. Yes? Who took machine? Other people, not yours? Other? Um, 
What about those doors, Weena? Uh, doors open. No, no. Weena, machine in in there must open. No, no, not open. Oh, all right, my dear. Go to sleep. Get some rest. Yes, Dudley. Sleep. What's to become of us, Fowler? Are we caught here in this century? We spend our lives with the little people and their secret. We'll go back to the monument tomorrow. We'll find a way of breaking in. Good night, Dudley. Dudley? Yes? Yeah. Did you just... <coughs> there it was again. What? Something. On my face. Huh? Cold. Filthy to the touch. On my face and in my hair. As cold as death. Dudley! Oh. You're right. There's something in here with us. <coughs> Smells of the grave. What was it? I don't know. But look at them. Look at the little people. They're all awake. It's as though they've been stampeded. Let's get out of here. I want some fresh air. We went quickly through the hall and outside, away from the frantic rustling of the little people. The moon was full, just overhead, and it was close to dawning. There was a faint sound speeding close behind us, and we turned, our nerves ragged, our muscles tensed. But it was only Weena, coming swiftly to join us. Dudley, I'm afraid. And then there is Dark. something. What do you mean, Weena? Dark? What? Dark thing. Dark place. Night. Why should they be afraid of the night, Dudley? It's not the night alone. Dark place, that's our cube. Perhaps it's something underground. It was another day. We had wandered into a lovely, wooded place about a mile from the community. And suddenly, Weena screamed. <gasps> Father! And we stopped short. A pair of glaring eyes were fixed upon us. As we stood there, petrified, the thing, a little ape-like figure, rushed across our path and disappeared in a clearing about 30 yards away. What was it? I couldn't see it too well. It seemed to be a dull white with white hair on its head and down its back. It looked like a small it ape. It was running on all fours, or with its arms held very low. Weena, Weena, what was it? Morlocks. They, Morlocks. Who are the Morlocks? What are they? Weena, tell me. No, no. Let's go over there and see where it disappeared. Come along, Fowler. In the clearing, we found a round, well-like opening. Dudley and I leaned over and looked down a deep shaft. A small, white creature was retreating down a ladder in the well, like a human spider, its large, bright eyes watching me as it went swiftly down. Then it disappeared in the shaft. Fowler, did you see it? Like an ape? Yes, but also like a man. So there are two species of men in this world. Yes. The little people above the ground and this obscene thing, this bleached monster below. Uh, that white look, common to animals that live in the dark. Like huge rats, like worms that are cold to the touch. I know, because they've touched Father, me. Father, you can feel the air being sucked down into this shaft. Yes. The earth must be tunneled enormously here under our feet. These monsters must live in the tunnels. I think we know now who stole our time machine. Yes. Then... Then we'll go down and have a look. No! No, not go! Why not, not go. Weena? Morlocks, you never come back. <laughs> we must have our machine, my dear. And, uh, you wait for us here. No! No! And so we went down, our heels ringing on the small metallic bars that were meant for creatures so much smaller than us. Down we climbed. Down. Down. Ever in darkness down, it seemed, into the center of the earth, into the core of the world. How much longer? Won't know until we reach bottom. Uh, Can't be much uh, further. Do you hear that? Like machinery. We're almost there. Well, thank heaven for that. Uh. All right, Father, I'm on the bottom. Uh. Come along, just a few more steps. Now, give me your hand, Father. Uh, Good. Yeah. Good. We're here. It's in the land of the Morlocks. Do you have a match? Uh, yeah, yes, yes, here. Seems 
be a large vaulted cavern at the end of this passage. Oh. What do you uh, suppose they'll do if they catch us? I've no idea. Better take care not to be caught. Ah, another match. That, that throbbing noise. Probably their ventilating system, pumping the air down. There must be thousands upon thousands of these Morlocks living under the earth. We haven't seen any yet, except for our friend who came down ahead of us. Why, why do you suppose they wanted our time machine? I think they wanted us, not the machine. And we've come to them. We must. It's our only chance. Fowler, if that noise does come from air pumps. Yeah? Why is it so stuffy here, so oppressive? Dudley. It's that smell. Blood. Light another match. <gasps> Dudley. Look. Straight ahead. On the white metal table. Set for a meal. Yes. With a small haunch. Meat. We know that the cattle are extinct. Then, what do they feed on the, these Morlocks? Don't you know? Yes, I know. Oh, another match? Yes, I hear. Oh, Dudley, I have no more. I've used our last match. Oh. All right, we'll have to go back then. We know the secret now, anyway. Morlocks living here underground. They're the masters of this age. And our friends up above, fatted cattle, fed by the Morlocks, clothed, supplied, and housed until the day when, when they're cut out of the herd and brought underground as food. This is the future you're looking at. This is what we men of the 20th century shall come to. Dudley! What is it? I felt hands. Cold hills. Take one of these levers. Yes, give Use it as a weapon. Lash out. <laughs> Against this wall. Fowler here beside me. They're moving in. Fight them. Use the lever, man. Use the lever. Oh, oh. Dudley, they're all around us. This way. Fowler, this way. Back this way. We went back in that evil darkness, fighting every step as we went. By my side, Back Fowler. to those projecting bars, kicking and clawing ourselves loose from their pallid, grasping hands. And climbing up again, up toward daylight and freedom. Away from their stench and the eagerness of their icy hands. And they did not follow, for daylight was their enemy and their great fear. And we lived among the lush gardens of the little people like prisoners, like men without reprieve, like men who are dead, though they still walk the earth. For the time machine was locked away behind great brass doors, and we knew we could never force them open. Then one day, Weena told us of an old building, an ancient sagging structure that had survived through many ages and was filled with many curious objects. A museum, that's what it must be, a museum, Fowler. Perhaps from some earlier time. Now, I'm in no mood to go looking at a museum. Oh, don't you see? What? Specimens hermetically sealed in museums. Perhaps there are things, weapons, machinery, something we can use. Yes, yes, of course. If we could find some dynamite or gunpowder or something. We could blast those doors, we could get in. Um, where is this place, Weena? Mm. This, this old building that no one ever goes near? I take you. It's not far. A chance, old man. A slim one, but a chance nonetheless. <laughs> All day we wandered through the great ruined halls. The building had been deserted, unused for perhaps a century. The childlike men of that time had long since ceased to care about anything but their own personal comforts. It was late afternoon and growing dark when we came upon the chemical section. We had found nothing useful to us until then, and now came the worst disappointment of all. And it's dust. All of it been dust for centuries. Another dead end. Ah, it's hopeless. 
We were out of our heads to hope that nitrates would retain their form for a hundred thousand years. We go now? Is nothing here? Oh, wait just a moment. Something in this case. Well, you can break it with your lever. Stand back a little. All right. <laughs> Box of matches. Hermetically sealed. Now, wait, let me see. Well, they're perfect. But they're not even damp. What shall we do with them? Burn down those brass doors? Well, you'd better keep them. You can, can't tell. Paula. What? On the floor, you see them? Where? Small, narrow footprints leading away into the darkness at the end of this gallery. Dudley! Uh, we'd better go. The queen up and carry her. We'll have to run for it. Uh, now, don't be frightened, my dear. It'll be all right. Go on, run! We came out of the gloom of that place into the deeper gloom of dusk. And suddenly we saw. We were trapped. All around us were the Morlocks. They were there by the thousand, surrounding us, and coming closer in the long, even line of deathly white, their eyes blinking in the half-light, their tiny mouths alive with appetite. Paula, the matches! I have them dipped like a fire. Here, please, here. Please. Hurry, man, the forest is dry. Hurry, man. We'll have an inferno here in a minute. Our little friends don't like light or heat. The fire leaped high to the heavens, and the countryside was ablaze. The Morlocks turned in fear, blinded by the glare. Some of them blundered into the middle of the raging flames, and the rest faded away like a fog. Dudley had left a narrow passageway for our retreat, and we fled down a long corridor of leaping flames and blistering heat. We fled to safety toward the community of the little people. As we ran, we passed the huge monument with its great bronze doors that were locked tight in our time machine. And suddenly, in the glare of the distant fires, we saw something that stopped us short. They're open! Follow the doors! are open! No! No, not go in! Dudley, no! It's a trap. They're there waiting for us, inside. Waiting or not, we're going in! No. Dudley, it's suicide! It'll take me one minute to screw the levers on again, then I touch them and we're away! All right, I'll try to give you your one Good minute. boy! No, no, go. Not leave me. No, you, you, my dear, you hold tight around my neck. You're coming home with us. Uh, All right? Uh, All right, let's go! We're in... Oh, look, the machine, oh. they haven't harmed it. I don't see them yet. Come on, now, quickly. The door's Dudley. Uh, They're closed. Get in the seat. I'll be ready in a moment. Oh. I waited for the hum that would signal our departure. And there in the darkness, the Morlocks were finally upon us. Cold, persistent fingers swarmed over my body, tugging at me, sucking me away from the machine. I held tight to Wiener as a man holds fast to life. Tried to kick them away with my feet. Oh, hurry, Dudley, hurry! I should have get these levers quickly or we're done. One more turn and it's it. There, follow, we're away, we're gone. Yes. Yes, we made it. Oh. Are you all right? I'm all right, Lord. And Wiener? Wiener isn't with us. What happened? They tore her from my hands at the last minute. They got her. I, I tried to save her, but I, I couldn't. I still have a piece of a tunic here in my fist. Little piece of a tunic, Dudley. Nothing else. And so we came home again, back into the very minute from which we had left, back into 12 noon, October 22nd, 1950. We were in Dudley's laboratory again, motionless, sitting on the ridiculous contraption which he has called a time machine. Was it all a dream? Did any of it happen? Could any of it happen? Oh, of course not. How stupid. Then what of this? What of this little piece of thin green silk I hold in my hand? Escape is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Today, we have brought you The Time Machine by H.G. Wells, 
adapted for radio by Irving Ravitch, and starring John Daner as Fowler and Larry Dobkin as Dudley, with Georgia Ellis as Weena. The special music for Escape was arranged and played by Ivan Dittmars. Next week, escape with us to a small fishing boat off the California coast and a night of terror and death at the hands of a brilliant madman as Bud A. Nelson tells it in his exciting story, Seven Hours to Freedom. a find. I did? Something ancient. Very old, yes. The director is flying in from the pole. It must be significant. Profoundly significant. Maybe. I have some guarded optimism. So, what is it? It is a he. Honest John Barlow. Honest John Barlow. Honest John Famed in university annals, represents a challenge that medical science has not yet answered. Revival of a human being accidentally thrown into a state of suspended animation. You don't tell McCarthy he's got the right idea. Open wide, sir. Uh-huh. Uh, wider. Uh-huh. Wider. Uh-huh. Okay, hold it right there. What with the roots geese developing their own a bomb, we don't need any reds in this country. Mm. Uh, you know, Rick, you're too loud for you. You want me to turn it down? Mm-hmm. Okay. How's that anesthetic holding out, okay, John? It's new. It's experimental. You like it? Mm. I'm one of five uh, dentists participating in a test program. Mm. I can just shake, rattle, and roll that little tooth around your mouth till it just pops out. See, like this. Hey, you didn't feel a thing, did you? Did you, John? John? Uh, uh, Mr. Barlow? Oh, shit. The L.A. Chicago rocket. Jeez. Uh, Mr. Hawkins' workshop is very close to the Rocketarium, Doctor. Can we get back to the subject at hand? I need to get back to my work. Keep your shirt on, Hawk. Hawkins. We're going to buy something, right, Marty? You do make some exquisite pottery, Mr. Hawkins. Thanks. This is real pretty. This is lots of what you call um, real aesthetic principles. Uh, how much? Seventy-five and dozen lots. I ran up fifteen dozen last month. They are real ecstatic. Hey, I'll take them off. I don't think we can do that, Doctor. They cost us over a thousand. Uh, that would leave only five hundred and thirty-two dollars in our quarter's budget, and we still have to run down to East Liverpool for some cheap dinner sets. Dinner sets? The department's been out of them for two months now. Mr. Garvey Seabright got pretty nasty about it yesterday, remember? Ah, uh, Garvey Seabright, that meat-headed blue nose. You don't know nothing about aesthetics. My Lord, don't even let me run my own department. Hey! The new Wamba Zamba! <laughs> oh, look what, what Skeeter is doing today. <laughs> Since when have you started reading Wambo Zambo comics? I keep a supply handy to distract buyers like your boss there, uh, so that I can talk in confidence to their subordinates. Now, perhaps we can get down to business. A leading Evanston real estate dealer, Honest John Barlow, visited his dentist, who requested and received permission to use the experimental anesthetic Cycloparadimethanol B7, developed at the university. Changing, Dr. Bender. Changing, Dr. Bender. John. John. Are you faking again? Oh, you've got to be faking. Nobody lands in the hospital from getting the tooth pulled. Is this another insurance scam? So help me if you are pulling another scam without letting me in on it. Sorry to keep you waiting, Mrs. Barlow. That's all right. How is he, Doctor? It's hard to say. 
See, when they brought your husband in, it looked as if his heart had stopped. But it hasn't. No. Then he's all right? Well, that's the problematic part. As far as we can tell, he's fine. He's had some kind of anomalous reaction to an experimental anesthetic. He's not in a coma, because in a coma, all the body's life signs are at maximum. He's just not waking up. In the case of your husband, it's all working at a fraction of what's usual, but it doesn't seem to be harming him in any way. For lack of a better term, it seems to have placed him in a kind of suspended animation. Suspended what? Animation, yes. His metabolism has become so slow that it has virtually stopped. For every day that ticks by for us, only a second passes for him, perhaps even less. Well... But how long will he be like this? Yeah, I'm afraid we don't know. We'll just have to wait and see. How long? It could be years. Years? How many years? Seven hundred. For two dozen of the one-liter carafe? Yes, I wish we could take more, but you heard what I told him. We've had to turn away customers of ordinary dinnerware because he shot the last quarter's budget on some Mexican piggy banks. Well, I bet they look mighty aesthetic. <laughs> They're painted with purple cacti. Hey! Ain't you dummies through yak? And yet I finished that whole comic book, and you ain't done. What good's a secretary for if we don't take the burden of the detail off of my back, huh? We're all through, Doctor. Are you ready to go? Yeah. Well, why don't you fire up the car while I make out a purchase order for Mr. Hawkins? Oh, okay, sure. Why not? Did anything come of the radiation program they were working on the last time I was on duty at the Pole? The same old fallacy. It stopped us on mutation, it stopped us on culling, it stopped us on segregation, and it stopped us on hypnosis. But what about your find? I occasionally go prospecting over by the ruins of the university. I pick up oxides there for my glazes. When I was there this morning, I... Found... As part of its settlement with the, quote, widow, unquote... The university agreed to accept and maintain her husband's body until, if and when, he could be revived. When, after a century of tests and experiments, the attempts at revivification were abandoned, Honest John was placed here, on exhibit, at the University Museum. They'd obviously blundered onto the bare bones of the Levantman shock anesthesia. Everybody knows the antidote for that is saline injected into trigeminal nerve. That they never discovered. So Barlow's still down there. Yes. I'm going back there now with a hypo and revive him. Honest John was long an exhibit at the museum and livened many a football game as mascot of the university's blue crushers. The bounds of taste were overstepped, however, when a pledge to Sigma Delta Chi was ordered to kidnap Honest John from his loosely guarded glass case and introduce him into the Rachel Swanson Memorial Girls Gymnasium shower room. The University Board of Regents issued an order that Honest John be removed from the museum and stored in a specially prepared vault in the Lieutenant James Scott III Memorial Biologic Laboratory. The doc? Doc, did it work? I'd say so. What do you... Where's the doctor? I... Wait. Where am I? You're in the... My clothes. What happened to my clothes? I... My hair. My fingernails. They'll grow back. My God, look at me. I'll sue. I'll sue you for every penny you've got. That release won't mean a damn thing in court. I didn't sign away my hair, my clothes, and my fingernails. I said they'll grow back. Yeah. Also, your epidermis. Those parts of you weren't alive, so they weren't preserved like the rest of you. I'm afraid the clothes are gone, though. I'm on the phone. No, you phone. You tell my wife I'm all right. And you tell Sam Immerman, he's my partner, to get over here right away. He... Mr. Barlow, look around you. Does this look like the university hospital to you? What are you... Wait a minute. Why is everything all rusted? What the hell's going on here? Who are you? Edgar Hawkins, Mr. Barlow. According to the story, your dentist used a fairly new anesthetic to put you out. Mm -hmm. During the procedure, there was an electrical short in the equipment. It put you into a state of what's now called Leventman shock. Where's my dentist? Dead. He's been dead for a very, very long time. 
Almost as long as you've been asleep. How long is that? Now, look. Just how long have I been asleep? Centuries, Mr. Barlow. Centuries. Here you go, Mr. Barlow. I've grabbed some clothes on my way here. I hope they'll do. <laughs> it's true. I recognize the area. This used to be the University of Chicago. It's all gone. Was there a war or something? No. Over the years, it fell victim to disrepair, disuse, and disorder. A pick of this at random, almost any one of them will fit. It's just like one of those stories I read when I was a kid, but I never realized. My wife, my friends, everyone I knew is gone. I'm afraid so, Mr. Barlow. The Los Angeles Chicago rocket. It's beautiful. Yes, I suppose it is. And Mr. Barlow, we have to go now. W where? The, the Council of Scientists? The World Cooperative? What do you call the government now? We call them the President and Congress. Mm. But we're not going there. That wouldn't do any good at all. I'm just taking you to see some people. Important people. Very important people. Now, this way, please. My car's just on the other side of the fence. Chicago Central. Whoa. How do you like it? It's terrific. Not many people on the road today. Take it and stick it is on TV. Huh? Most people don't go out when there's something good on TV. You want to see? Sure. Here we got the contestants all ready to go. You you ha know how we work at it and work it. I hand the contestant a, 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 tri a triangle shape cut out and like that down the line. Now, we got these boards, see? They got cut out places the same shape as the triangles and things. Only they're all different shapes. And the first contestant... The first, the first player that sticks the right cutouts into the board, he wins. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to interview the first contestant. Right here, honey. What's your name? Uh, uh, m my name? Uh, uh, oh, uh, uh. <laughs> How do you like that, folks? She don't remember her own name. <laughs> Would you buy that? Oh, there's more news from Washington. It's about Senator Hull Mendoza. He is still attracting, <laughs> I mean attacking, the Bureau of Fisheries. The North California syndicalist says he's got affidavits that John Kingsley Schultz is a blue nose from way back. Kingsley Schultz says he's got to confess he did major in fly casting at Oregon. Oh, boy. <laughs> and got his, FUD, uh, his uh, Ph.D. in game fishing in Florida. Oh, some scandal, huh? <laughs> in New York, a diesel tug run wild in the harbor while the crew was below watching Take It and Stick It on TV. Oh, I love that show. <clears throat> uh, anyway, it shoved in the port bow of the luxury liner SS Placentia. It says the ship filled and sank, taking the lives of an S. Uh, made it 180 passengers and 50 crew members. And six divers were sent down to study the wreckage, but they died too when their suits turned out <laughs> to be full of little holes. <laughs> Here is a bulletin I just got out of Denver. It says, Buleta Obaku Cigars. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not just any cigar. 
cigar. <coughs> I'd buy that for a quarter. <laughs> what the hell was that? The news anchor was talking about a disaster as if it was nothing. It will require some explanation. It'll be clear soon enough. Oh, my God, those helicopters there over the city. They're awfully close. They're going to... Oh. <laughs> They're dead. Problem solved. What problem? Well, what are you talking about? It will all be made clear soon. This is insane. These are insane times. And something else. I've been watching the road and all the other cars on the road. And I don't care what the speedometer says. We're not doing 250 miles an hour. And this wind coming in the window, it's from the outside. Why does it start before we start moving? It will all be made clear soon enough. And Mr. Barlow, don't open the window. I was right. We're only doing 20 miles an hour tops. What the hell's going on here? What kind of a gag is this? Just sit down and I will explain. Not a chance. I'm getting out of here. Barlow! <laughs> Sorry, I am. Say what's the matter about the people like you on the sidewalk. Got a minus slam you and I'll mush your face at that time. Uh, uh, Lisa, uh, what did you say? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 What the hell was all that? What the hell is wrong with you? You came right up on the sidewalk. You could have killed me. Oh, yeah. What? Oh, yeah. This is ridiculous. Hold on. Hold on. Uh-oh. Fear. I'll duck into the fear. Oh, I don't understand, Doctor. What did I do to deserve all this? It all went wrong after I had a child. You were warned. Oh. We all tried to tell you, but you wouldn't listen. No, I should have known it would go badly from the terrible, bloody, painful childhood. What the hell? And the vicious childhood. Demanding, poking, prodding, screaming, always screaming, day and night. But now, my poor sister. When children grow up. They grow up mean, beating, starving their parents, locking them in dark rooms for the rest of their short lives. Oh, I wish I had listened. Oh, I wish. It's too late. Once you've had a child, even one, it's too late. Even for witches. <laughs> I gotta get out of here. Yeah, what? I, 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 I need a beer. I don't think I've ever needed a beer this bad in my life. Yeah, sure, whatever. You like sports? Uh, yeah, sure. I... Oh, here's a page. Mm, thanks. Mm. Oh, it's good to see some things are still normal. <laughs> hey, there's still the Dodgers. How about that? Says here the last game against the Yankees won extra innings. Ended up one to nothing in the seventeenth inning. <laughs> Boy, that must have been a hell of a game. Yeah. Well, that's odd. Cleveland Indians won extras the same night, ending one nothing, Boston in the fourteenth. Yes, Reds over Atlanta. One to nothing in the eleventh. White Sox over the A's, one to nothing in the 23rd inning. There you go. What kind of games are these? Baseball. You know, I'm always saying, the ball's too small, and you got to think so much, you know. It just ain't fair, you know. It takes all day, all night. First team gets a score, goes home, or they have to go home. That's how it is. Oh, this is insane. I mean, look at these stats. Not one guy batting over 200 averaged 20 errors a game. At least eight guys hit by balls in every game? What the hell? This used to be a classy sport. That's the story. You. I was in doubts about telling you, but I see you have some growing suspicions of the truth. Please, don't get excited. It's all right. So you got me. Got you. 
Ah, don't pretend. I can put two and two together. You're the secret police. You and the rest of the aristocrats live in luxury on the sweat of these oppressed slaves. You're afraid of me because you have to keep them <laughs> ignorant. Yeah. What? What's so damn funny? Let's get out of here. You couldn't possibly have it more wrong. Nah. The truth is, is that the millions of workers live in luxury on the sweat of the handful of aristocrats. I shall probably die before my time of overwork unless... You may be able to help us. Oh, I know that gag. I made money in my time, and to make money, you have to get people on your side. Go ahead and shoot me if you want, but you're not going to make a fool out of honest John Barlow. You nasty little ingrate. This damn mess is all your fault and the fault of people like you. Now come along and know more of your nonsense. In here, Barlow. Easy. Was I brought from the pole to inspect this? This? Who's this guy? On Get Up Dander, I've deprobed that fine quasi chance exum probatic line. What are you talking about? Doubt. Try. This is America. Speak English. This is still America, right? <sighs> Very well. How name? Barlow. Mm. Mr. Barlow, mm. I understand that you and your lamented had no children. And what about it? This about it. You were a blind, selfish, stupid ass to tolerate economic and social conditions that penalize childbearing by the prudent and far-sighted. You made us what we are today, and I want you to know that we are far from satisfied. Damn fool rockets, damn fool automobiles, damn fool cities with damn fool overhead ramps. Are you nuts? Those are the best features of your time. The rockets aren't rockets. What? They're turbojets. Good turbojets. But the fancy shell around them makes for a bad drag. The cars have a top speed of 100 kilometers per hour. If I recall my paleolinguistics, a kilometer is equivalent to three-fifths of a mile. The speedometers are rigged to give the illusion of speeds up to 250. The cities are ridiculous, expensive, unsanitary, wasteful conglomerations of people who'd be better off and more productive in open spaces. Uh, what's the gag? I'm getting to that. We need the rockets and trick speedometers and cities because while you and your kind were being prudent and foresighted and not having children, the migrant workers, slum dwellers and tenant farmers were shiftlessly and short-sightedly having children. Breeding, breeding, my God, how they bred. Wait a minute. There were lots of people in our crowd who had two or three children. The attrition of accidents, illness, wars and such took care of that. You hoarded the good things of life and closely guarded the means by which you gained your advantages. Education, information access, health care, communications, extensive travel, genetic engineering, and birth control. Only the most intelligent and ruthless of the poor could improve their condition. Mm -hmm. And when they joined your ranks, they adapted your values and stopped having children. Your intelligence was bred out. It is gone. Children that should have been born never were. They're just average. They'll get a long majority took over the population. The average IQ now is 45. The criminal thing is that the consequences were foreseen and you let it happen anyway. Your social scientist told you what was going to happen. Yeah, but that was all way, way in the future. And where do you think you are now? If that's true, then who the hell are you to? For lack of a better word, we're genetic insurance. Several generations ago, alarmed geneticists realized that nobody was paying attention. So they formed a secret corporation to maintain and improve the breed and a number of volunteers worldwide. We are their descendants. About three million of us. And 15 billion of the others. So in the end, we are their slaves. During the past couple of years, I've designed a skyscraper. Kept Billings Memorial Hospital running. Headed off war with Mexico and... Directed air traffic at several rocketeria. We keep things going, barely, while the rest of the population continues to get more and more dense in every sense of that word. If you guys are so damn smart, you ought to have thought of something long before now. Well, perhaps we are too well trained. We deal with the rational, the logical, the scientific. We have exhausted those means. The solution calls for the irrational or subrational. Vicious self-interest. We have no talent for it. Why don't you just let them go to hell, fend for themselves? We tried that long ago. There was famine, plague, anarchy. We called off the experiment. 
took us almost a generation to get things back on track again. But isn't that what you want? To let them kill each other off? Balance out the numbers a little so they favor your side? Or just bumble off yourself? Twenty billion corpses means two trillion tons of rotting flesh. Or you could sterilize them during other procedures. There are only three million of us. And only about half are doctors. Even if we worked 24 hours a day, their breeding would still outnumber us. Like the marching Chinese. The marching what? Chinese. Back in my time, somebody figured this, what did they call it? Paradox. If all of the Chinese in the world lined up far across and started marching past a given point, they'd never stop because of the babies that would be born and grow up before they passed that point. That reminds me. Those movies I saw downtown, Babies Are Terrible and Don't Have Children. Is that your idea of propaganda? It was. It doesn't seem to mean a thing to them. We have abandoned propaganda that denies a biological drive. What if you work with a biological drive? Oh, I don't know of any biological drive consistent with inhibition of fertility. You don't, huh? <laughs> You're the great brains, and you can't think of any? No. Can you? Well, that depends. I sold 10,000 acres of Arctic tundra to a dummy firm, of course. The buyers thought they were getting improved building lots near Seattle. <laughs> I'd say that was a lot tougher than this. In what way? Those were normal, suspicious customers. These are morons. Born suckers. You just have to figure out a con, and they'll fall for it. Con? What is... Con, you seem to have something in mind. Yeah, maybe I have. I haven't heard any offer yet. There's the satisfaction of knowing that you've prevented Earth's resources from being plundered. I don't know that. All I have is your word. If you really have a method, I don't think any price would be too great. Money? All you want. And a big staff, as big as you need. We will put all of our resources at your disposal. Anything else? Mm, prestige. Plenty of prestige. My picture and my name in the papers and on TV every day. Statues to me, parks and cities and streets. A whole chapter in the history books. Oh, brother. Did you say something? I said anything else. Power. Power? You mean your own hydro station or nuclear energy plant? I mean a world dictatorship with me as dictator. Now, I just... Wait, 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 wait. It would take a special emergency act of Congress, but the situation warrants it. I think that it can be guaranteed. <laughs> so what is your plan? And not so fast. When I get a deal signed, sealed, and delivered in writing... We'll talk about the plan. Before we can agree to your terms, we must have some indication of what we are agreeing to. Fair enough. Ever hear of lemmings? No. They are, were, I guess, since you haven't heard of them, little animals in Norway. And every few years, they'd swarm to the coast, swim out to sea until they drowned. I figure on putting some lemming urge into the population. How? Yeah, I'll save that for later. After everybody signs on the dotted line, I'll even draw up the agreement for you, and you can have your lawyers look at it. What are lawyers? I'm not sure, but I think there are species of vermin that were eradicated centuries ago. Oh. All right. I'd like to work with you on it, Barlow. I'd like to know who I'm dealing with. What are your names? I'm Hawkins. My name's Ryan Ungana. Ryan what? Ungana. That sounds like an African name. It is. My mother's father was a Watutsi. Yeah, I thought you looked pretty dark. Look, I, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but I don't think I'd be at my best working with you. There must be somebody else just as well qualified, I'm sure. Oh, Ungana. Freak, watch your blood pressure. <sighs> Very well. We'll see what arrangements can be made. Now, it's not that I'm prejudiced, you understand. Some of my best friends... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr. Barlow, don't give it another thought. Anybody who could pick on the lemming analogy is going to be useful to us. Mm -hmm. 
something sure smells good. Yeah, it's that wavy gravy I saw it on TV. You just put it in, box and all, and it cooks itself and cools down so nobody gets burned. Oh, I'd better get the kids. Oh, hey, hey, kids, I, it's dinner. I'll just put the TV on. Oh, gee, Phyllis, sometimes I think I'll never meet anyone who loves me. Oh, sure you will, Gladys. Everyone knows that meeting the man of your dreams is as easy as a trip to Venus. Hey, Will, did you hear right, that? Phyllis. What? She said... Easy as a trip to Venus. I thought people couldn't go to Venus. I think somebody said that. Oh, it must be something new. Put the, put the sound up. I'm so proud of you, boss. Not everyone gets promoted to master rocket pilot on the Venus run in just six months. But, but it's, it's so boring, Phyllis. Boring? Well, sure. They've made these rockets so safe that there's practically nothing for me to do. Now, if you're traveling on Earth, oh, sure, then it's exciting. you got hurricanes and storms, and you can go crashing into mountains, and sometimes the wheels snap off when you land. And... No! <laughs> but there aren't any mountains in space. No hurricanes, no storms. There's nothing dangerous. Just one big space. That's why they call it space. And the worst of it... <laughs> What's it? the worst of it is a trip back because we're all alone. This big ship, and we're all alone because once you've been to Venus, nobody wants to go back. It's heaven, Phyllis. Pure heaven. Then I'll go with you, Buzz, <gasps> and we'll make Venus heaven together. Oh, Phyllis. <laughs> Mr. World Dictator. Uh, make it quick, Gomez. I'm busy going over the designs for my palace. Uh, my name is Gomez Laplace, sir. I hereby decree your name is Gomez. Now draw up the paperwork. Yes, sir. But first, I thought you might want to know the programs have begun to air. Any problems? Anybody notice? No. Ever since your time, anything that goes on TV has to be approved by psychologists, advisors, and consultants to make sure nothing hazardous gets on the air. Mm. And that gives us control. Don't the network presidents notice? Where do you think we put the really stupid people? Good. Now, I want to see the plans for my new palace. Nothing ostentatious, but nothing unostentatious either. Something befitting a president. I only want the best. Your best carpenters, your best architects. Of course. And uh, how are the rockets coming? Well, fine, fine. Though I wonder what we'll do when we run out of material. It's easy. Once one city is empty, you use the metal to build the rockets to carry the next batch and so on. You can start over fresh. Yes, we can. Do you really think this will work? I know it will. And what of your conscience, Mr. World Dictator? Anybody too stupid to protect himself doesn't deserve protection. Caveat emptor. Let the buyer beware. Start the commercials first thing tomorrow morning. And in some other news, the Congress people signed a paper today that said the president could quit. He's going to be replaced by somebody named H. John Barlow. We got more on that. After this, or uh, uh, more on this, after that. Available now, new and improved Kalino. Look at these suds. Not bad. Of course, Kalino doesn't lay around for you to pick up for free like the soap brewed on Venus, but it's pretty cheap, and it's almost pretty near as good. So for us plain folks who ain't lucky enough to live up there on Venus, Kalino is the real cleaning stuff. Kalino! Mrs. Garvey, the Freud will see you now. Oh, thanks. Hello, Mrs. Garvey. Sit down. Oh, sure, thanks. Forgive me, Freud, for I have neuroses. Uh, but, my dear girl, what seems to be the problem? Well, 
I feel like I got a hole in the head. Mm -hmm. I seem to forget all kinds of things. Things like everybody else seems to know, and I don't. Oh, that happens to everyone from time to time, my dear. Oh? I suggest a vacation on Venus. Now, you see... That's what I'm talking about. My husband, Will, and me, we see these commercials about Venus. Mm -hmm. And everybody's talking about going to Venus. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know we could go to Venus. <laughs> of course you can. Really? These days, everyone's going to Venus. Oh? Here, I just got these pamphlets from the American Freudological Association. Advantages of the planet Venus in rest cures. You can have a copy if you like. It's all in here. It is? Absolutely. Oh, then I ain't crazy. <laughs> of course not. From time to time, we all look around and find everyone talking about something we didn't know was going on. We can't be expected to know everything now, can we? No, 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 I, I suppose not. That's why we have the government and the media to tell us what's going on. Oh. Tell us all the things we need to know. Sure. If everyone's talking about going to Venus and it's on TV, and I assume your friends are talking about it. Oh, I tell you, that's all they can talk about. Yes. Mrs. Felcher said her family already bought their ticket. Well, then, there you are. Your brief lapse is perfectly normal. Oh. And the Venus run is very real, if a, a little boring from what I hear. <laughs> you have no neurosis, my dear. Just a goal. Go to Venus and enjoy. Oh, thanks. What was the matter with her? Search me. I suggested a vacation on Venus. Look, look, I'll show you. Give me the new issue, Psychiatric Comics Journal. Here. Yeah, here. No, it's here. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know I saw it somewhere. Oh, yeah, it's right there. See? Sure is. Advantages of the planet Venus for rest cures. <laughs> the trouble with these inerotics is that they all the time got to fight reality. Show in the next twitch. You may come in now. Uh, um, uh, Freud, uh... Forgive me, uh, for I have neurosis. Oh, tut, tut, my boy. What seems to be the trouble? Please move forward. If you book passage on tonight's evening star rocket leaving for Venus, be sure to have your ticket in hand. Is that it? Is that the spaceship? Yeah. Well, that's what the man said. It's beautiful. With the lights all around it like that. Why, oh, it looks like a silver needle. Just like the brochure said. Oh, it took me two weeks to get these tickets. Yeah. I hope it's worth it. Oh, well, of course it's worth it. It's Venus. Oh, welcome to Flight Evening Star Flight 417 to Venus. I'm your captain, Ryan Hagana. I want to welcome you aboard. I trust your visit to Venus will be a memorable one. Because this is meteorite season in space, the port windows have been dogged and sealed, so there's no possibility of a problem. As soon as we get close to our destination, you'll be able to look outside for your first real glimpse of Venus. It's all to make the trip safer for your benefit. We'll also be giving you little pills to swallow that will prevent you from getting any Venusian illness. Now, if you will all come this way, we're just about ready to launch. So...
where the first load of pioneers is about to blast off to start the first permanent colony on Venus. And all I can say, folks, is wow! <laughs> that their migrant rocket is really something. It's big, oh, I tell you, all sorts of colored flashing lights, too. They're cramming tens of thousands of people in there, and, and there are a thousand more waiting for the next flight. Gosh, I hope I can get on sometime. You know, I don't know exactly how much a thousand is, but I bet you it's a lot. I mean, it sure looks like a lot. Yeah, I can definitely tell you for certain that there are a lot of people here in Los Alamos today. Oh, will you look at that? There it goes! Oh, will you buy that for a quarter, huh? Dear Mary, how are you? Sam and I are fine and hope you are fine. How is your new house? I hope it is fine. Is it as nice up there as it looked on your vacation? Is it true, like they say, that clothes grow on trees? Everybody, I mean everybody, is trying to book passage. They is buying up Venus property sight unseen. It got so crazy at the real estate office that a big riot broke out. Give me a buzz sometime, sis. Dear sis, Sorry to be sending you this by voice simulator instead of real voice letter, but they say Atmos something conditions on Venus ain't right for it. Will and me and the kids had a great flight and have already settled into the beautiful new home we bought on our first trip. We is fine. It is a fine place here, fine climate and easy living. The doctor told me today that I seem to be 10 years younger he thinks there is something in the air here what keeps people young. There is a nice little island I have been saving for you and Sam with lots of blanket trees and ham bushes. I hope to see you and Sam soon. Your loving sister, Mary. Hiya, Gomez. Oh, good evening, Mr. World Dictator. I'm surprised you're sitting out here in the cold night. Aren't you satisfied with your shiny new palace? I'm watching for fireflies. Oh. There aren't any more fireflies, Mr. Barlow. No? Then what's that up there? That? Oh, that's probably the Venus rocket from London. Or what's left of it. Any danger of it falling on anybody? Hmm. Aren't that many people for it to fall on these days. But no, it'll it'll burn up in the troposphere. Like all those that went before and all those that will come after. What's eating you? Uh, nothing, Mr. World Dictator. I don't like gloomy people around me. It's a sign of disrespect. I know it's necessary, Mr. World Dictator. I I know it's the only way to Balance out the population and get the planet back on track. But it's still not an easy thing for me. Fireflies, Gomez. Best to think of them as fireflies. That's what you do in sales. Not people. Targets. Buyers. Suckers. Fireflies. Are the letters going out? Yes. As soon as they're gone, we use their ticketing information for the next phase. Good, good. Look, there's another one. That would be the French launch, right? <sighs> I believe so. I think the French would appreciate the image of fireflies, don't you? This part?
just can't afford to keep it up, Mr. World Dictator. What are you talking about? I have absolute control over finances, and I say we shell out whatever it takes. It isn't just the money, Mr. World Dictator. No. It's time. It costs tremendous amounts of both time and money to build those sleek, impressive-looking rockets. We're never going to meet our schedule at the rate we're going. Don't have to. I hereby declare the fancy jobs obsolete. They were just for the cameras anyway, you know. When we were hyping the colonization, <laughs> now we've got plenty of takers. We can send them out in any old rattle trap. Just as long as it shoots up into the air, our customers will still go. And after all, none of them are coming back. What are you doing here, Hawkins? Where the hell is Gomez? I'm afraid Gomez can't answer your summons. Oh, yeah? What's wrong with him? Getting cold feet again? Very cold. I'm afraid he killed himself last night. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. He left a note. He said he couldn't live with his conscience. Anything else? Just that he couldn't sleep. And that every time he tried to sleep, he saw ten billion fireflies. I heard you were out here, Hawkins. I found myself thinking, well, what would it be like to stand in the middle of a six-lane freeway and look out in both directions and not see a single car moving in either direction? The buildings reduced to skeletons harvested from metal. We'll start over again. Build new cities. Build them right. It'll be as it should be. As it should have been. I didn't see you at Gomez Laplace's funeral. Yeah, I couldn't go. You see? I don't know. It's strange to mourn one man's death in the face of, well, what we've done. He sent me a letter just before he killed himself. Hmm. What did it say? He said that the plan has cured most of the problems we're facing. But there's still one last cleanup to do. Yes. I was thinking the same thing. Pro prop turn. Pro prop turn. There was a time when I didn't think ourselves capable of designing pro prop turn. Our problem was always with the irrational or subrational. The kind of thinking based on appetite and not on logic. We needed Barlow only for pro prop attack line. Pro prop turn came logically out of it. Not another car inside. Amazing. Simply amazing. Come back to the center. On the way, we can discuss it in detail. Hawkins! Mendoza! Miller! Where the hell is everybody? You are looking for me, Mr. Barlow. I was looking for anybody who'd answer the intercom. What's the good of having a staff if nobody answers the phone? I gave them the day off. Mm. We've all been working very hard for the last few months, finishing off the program. I felt they deserved a break. You should have brought it to me first. And this, too. What is it, sir? Pope Rob for term. It's a memo. I found it in the copier from Ryan, what's his name? Ghana. Mr. World Dictator? Yeah, him, the Watusi. From this memo, I see that something called Poprob term got into the executive stage behind my back. Not really, Mr. World Dictator. We just didn't want to bother you. It's really a technical matter, a final cleanup of sorts. Why is it written in that gibberish you use between each other? I thought I'd banned that bubble talk. Sorry, sir. We believed you only meant speech, not writing. What are you trying to pull? I don't understand most of what's on this paper, but I doped out enough to know I don't like the smell of it. If it will ease your mind, would you like to come and see the work? When? But there's no time like the present, as you always say, sir. Huh. Okay, let's go. This way. The least you could do is tell me when you're going to give my staff the day off. I should know these things. You're quite right. I'm sorry. Sometimes I think you people don't appreciate me enough around here. I mean, you people are always making a big deal about how smart you all are, but none of you were able to come up with my idea. I had to be the one to do it. You're absolutely right, of course. Hmm. We've actually been talking about that quite a bit. Why we couldn't think of something like this. 
And the general consensus is that it's precisely because you are a man of the past, mm -hmm. a man of the time and the circumstances mm -hmm. that created our situation here in the first place. You seem to be forgetting my particular genius. No, our minds just don't work the way yours does. There you go. And I got a bunch of other ideas, great ideas, too. And I look forward to hearing them. In here, sir. Yeah, well, wait, what the hell is this? I've never seen this little rocket before. I didn't authorize this. Good day, Mr. World Dictator. Please, stand clear of the door, sir. In you go, Mr. World Dictator. What? This is Pope Proctor. Yeah, but I'm the, I'm the World Dictator. Yes, you are. Not a person. World Dictator. Master of all you survey. You Chief. Boss. Yes. Sucker. You'll be mentioned prominently in all the history books. In the meantime, I'm afraid this is necessary. But we, we have an agreement. You should have read the fine print. I wrote the fine print. Not the very fine print. What? Mm. Well, well, is he? Oh, Mrs. John Von Subordinates at Pogrop have been planning this for quite some time. Unfortunately, we could not afford the time to install all the comfort features you may have liked us to. Therefore, you will forgive us if the initial blast off and escape from Earth's atmosphere is a little rough. On a personal note, you should know that I volunteer to record this message for your first and last flight to Venus, or to anywhere else for that matter. You see, I do not have the words to express what working with you has meant to me. I want so much for you to appreciate how I feel. Fortunately, you are about to feel it for yourself in only a few more minutes. Good night, Mr. Firefly. Wheaties present Dimension X. Adventures in Time and Space, transcribed in Future Tense. Dimension X. On stage tonight, Dimension X, another in the Wheaties big parade of exciting half-hour presentations. I don't mean to be too personal, mind you, but have you found out how Wheaties at 7 can help at 11? really very easy to find out, you know, and it's mighty worthwhile. Now, what you do is this. Come breakfast time some morning real soon. Dish yourself up a bowl of Wheaties. Crisp golden flakes, 100% whole wheat. Add some fruit, add milk, and you'll be getting some real nourishment. And at 11 a.m., I think you'll begin to understand why. Because Wheaties have it. The whole wheat energy that makes such a difference come mid-morning. Wheaties have it. And it's for you. Now, see if you don't look better, feel better, smile easier every day that breakfast begins with Wheaties. I know. I do. See for yourself how Wheaties at 7 can help at 11. It's amazing, really. Do you remember when you were young... How your elders would tell you bedtime stories about the man in the moon. Well, tonight we have a different kind of story to tell about him. A story of suspense in the unknown world of the future where anything can happen. Attention. Attention. This is the Federal Bureau of Missing Persons calling all local agencies. Attention. 
This is a coded report nationwide. Missing since 9 o'clock this morning, the following persons. Smidgley, Jonathan, 5 feet 8 inches tall, brown hair, brown eyes, mastoid... Hello. Hello. Uh, hey, hey, get off this wavelength. This is a restricted band. Hello. Uh, hello. Uh, Look, whoever you are, you're on a coded wavelength. Now tune out. This frequency is reserved for the Federal Bureau of Missing Persons. Hello. Uh, this is the moon calling Earth. Hello. Earth. This guy's loony. Transmitting room. Jake in transmission. Uh, Jake, this is Charlie in the code room. Some crackpot's on our frequency. Yeah, I heard him, Charlie. I've got CQ trying to trace it now. Yeah, well, hurry it up, will you? Some ham's in for a good stiff fine by the FCC. Well, they ought to take his license away. Oh, here comes Lenny with a directional fix. Here you are, Jake. I checked it four times. What? Well, this is impossible, and you know it. I can't help it. Hey, That's what's what I... going on down there? How about it? Get that ham out of my killer cycle. Listen, Charlie, that interference is being beamed from 240,000 miles away. Oh, now, Jake, you know there ain't no such thing as 240,000 miles away. Oh, yes, there is, Charlie. Straight up. Straight up. Hey, now, wait a minute. Charlie, that signal's coming from the moon. The mo- Are you nuts? Somebody might be bouncing it like a radar signal. Radar? On this frequency? Where did you study basic radio? Uh, listen, flathead. You asked for a fix. I gave the best fix our instruments can find. Now, take it or leave it. Somebody on the moon is calling the Bureau of Missing Persons. <laughs> Mr. Timpkin. What's the sweat, Charlie? Shouldn't you be broadcasting? Now, listen, Mr. Timpkin, you know I'm a sober citizen, right? Never once have I broadcast with the smell of alcohol on my breath, Uh, right? In all your 12 years here at the Bureau, did I once... What's the matter, Charlie? We're picking up a message on our wavelength. Well, did you report to the FCC? I ain't got the nerve. Well, what's wrong? You'll scream when you hear this, Mr. Timpkin. You'll jump right out the window, but... We are getting an SOS from the moon. Got it. Started on voice and switched to Morse. What did he say? Uh, let's see now. Uh, can you read me? Help Otterburn. We'll contact when the moon is in phase. Otterburn. Uh, uh, sounds like a name. Otterburn. Otterburn. Holy jumping Jehoshaphat. Hey, where are you going? To talk to the chief. Hey, now, wait a minute. What are you going to tell him? We just got a CQ from the man in the moon? That's exactly what I'm going to tell him, Charlie. What? Oh, no. This is too much for me. Washington Star Ledger. Uh, let me have O'Brien on the city desk. Huh? One moment. O'Brien speaking. Uh, Seamus? Yes. Yeah. Uh, this is Charlie Starbuck down at the Missing Persons Bureau. You want a hot one? No kidding. This will cost you a beer, okay? Shoot, sure, Buck. I'll stay in your wavelength for 30 seconds. Yeah, okay. We just got a radio message from the moon. From the... What? From the moon. Call me back when you're so... Okay, Seamus, if you don't know a story when you see one. I'll send you the name of a good psychiatrist. Dad. So long, Orson Welles. Well... Orson Welles? Hey, how do you like that? He don't believe me. Otterburn, Mr. Wade. Does that name ring a bell? You're the man with the photographic memory, Henry. What about Otterburn? Cornelius Otterburn, atomic physicist. Reported missing from his home in Baltimore on June 5th, 1945, uh, just five years ago. Vanished completely. Are you trying to tell me you really think there's something to this man in the moon business? Henry, I'm surprised at you. This is some crackpot trying to jam the airway. But, but the name Otterburn is so unusual. So are a lot of names. Mr. Wade, I have a theory. Henry, you always have a theory. But, Mr. Wade... Out, Henry. Mr. Wade... Out. I'm busy. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, Henry. Oh, uh, here, take this folder of reports for the dead file. Oh, oh, yes, sir. And no more nonsense, eh, Henry? I appreciate that you have a very dull job filing old missing person reports, and I appreciate that you take an active interest in the affairs of the Bureau, but, uh, no more nonsense, hmm? No, sir, Chief. No more nonsense. Oh. Uh, pardon me. Hmm? 
Are you Mr. Henry Timken? Uh, that's my name. Permit me, Jefferson Philo, scientific feature writer. May I have a moment of your time? Certainly. Uh, just sit down at my desk right over here. Thank you. My, that's quite a stack of papers. Filing. Filing. I'm the records custodian of the Bureau. Twelve years and never misplaced a record. Magnificent. Now, Mr. Timken. Uh, yes? Mr. O'Brien, the editor of the Star Ledger, said I might drop by and investigate a rumor. Only a rumor, mind you, that a message from the, uh, moon? Well, we aren't certain it's from the moon. It may be a bounce... Uh, they have bounced radar waves off the moon, you know. Yes, uh, I know. I wrote the first newspaper article on it. Oh, really? Well, I'd be interested to read it. I must have a copy in my briefcase. Well, uh, don't bother. Oh, but I insist. There you are. I'll leave it on your desk. Well, thank you very much. Now, about this message from the moon, Mr. Timken. Well, we don't know for sure, as I said. But I believe that this message... Wherever it originates is from Cornelius Otterburn. The physicist? Oh, you know him. I once wrote an article on his contribution to nuclear mechanics. A brilliant man, Otterburn, years ahead of his contemporaries. Well, whoever is sending those signals, if he isn't on the moon, is at least using the moon as a sounding board, uh, bouncing the signal. But why, Mr. Timken? Why? Uh, look here, Mr. Philo. If you will come here tomorrow night at 8, we may learn the answer to that question. I have arranged with Charlie, our radio man, to let me use the equipment. May I consider this an invitation? You certainly may. Very well, sir. Until tomorrow night, then. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye, Mr. Philo. Goodbye. <laughs> like a day. Now, let me see now. Uh... Oh, that's funny. Where did this list of names come from? Paul Ahrens, astromathematician, Robert Simons, electronic engineer, Carl Parker, mining specialist. Oh, this must have got mixed up with the papers on my desk by accident. It's a peculiar list of names. Most peculiar. <laughs> Oh, hi, Mr. Pipkin. I see we made the papers. Oh? Ben Howe. <laughs> Mr. Chief steamed up about it. Well, what did the paper say? Uh, mostly ha-ha. Here's the Herald. Oh? Oh, brother, what a penny. Uh-huh. Uh, oh, dear. Oh, my. <laughs> no wonder Mr. Wade is hopping. Uh, oh, uh, about tonight, Mr. Tilkin. I don't now, know. Now, you promised you'd give me a key to the radio room, Charlie. Yeah, but I didn't expect this. Listen, Charlie, we've got to find out if there's something to that message. If Otterburn is alive somewhere and radioing for help, uh, it oh, is... Hold it, hold it. Time for the morning broadcast. We've got quite a list today. Well, do you mind if I listen a while? We may hear Otterburn. Oh, I ain't self-conscious. Stick around. Attention. Attention. This is the Federal Bureau of Missing Persons calling all local agencies nationwide. This is a coded broadcast. The following persons are missing. Aaron's Dr. Paul, five feet five... Brown hair, brown eyes, scar on left side of chin. Aaron. Thick glasses. Occupation, astro-mathematician. Missing since 6 o'clock this morning. R missing? Being sought by Bel Air Police. Uh, Charlie. Repeat, Dr. Paul Aaron. Charlie, shut it off this a second. Oh, now listen, Mr. Timken. It's okay to stay, but you can't interrupt. This is important. Now, what time was Dr. Aaron's reported missing? Uh... 6 a.m. We got the report from Bel Air less than an hour ago. Are you certain, Charlie? Yeah, positive. What is this? Charlie, what's the next name on the list? Uh, let's see. Uh, Simons, Robert. What? Engineer. Came in less than 20 minutes ago. 20? What's the matter with you? You look like you've seen a ghost. Uh, nothing, Charlie. Except that last night, quite by accident, someone left a list of names on my desk... And that list included the names of those two men who weren't reported missing until an hour ago. What? Yeah, that don't sound right to me. It isn't right, Charlie. Which raises a question. Who would make up a list of missing persons before they were missing, not after? <laughs> Dr. 
Dimension X will continue in just a moment. You know, friends, when I talk about Wheaties breakfast of champions, I mean something like this. Champions do eat Wheaties because they feel Wheaties give them energy they need and because they just plain like the way Wheaties taste. And even though they are champions, that isn't unusual. Sort of the way you and I look at it, isn't it? Here's Ed Prentice with a perfect illustration of my meaning. Now, young man, will you tell us what you do for a living? I pitch. You what? Pitch, pitch. You know, baseball. If you have a baseball team, you have to have a pitcher. I'm a pitcher. I pitch. Oh, yes, yes, I see. And are you on a team? Uh, yes, sir. I'm on the Cleveland Indians. Cleveland Indians, hmm? What is your name, young man? I'm Bob Feller. And you know it as well as I do, Ed. Sure I do, Bob. It's good to see you. This makes your 14th season playing with the Indians, doesn't it? Yep, Ed. Fourteen years. Well, tell me, Bob, how long have you been eating Wheaties? Oh, about twenty years, give or take a couple. You mean you started eating Wheaties before you started playing ball? Oh, I, of course. What's so strange about that? Most people start eating Wheaties before they get to playing ball. In fact, most people never start playing baseball. You don't have to be a ball player to enjoy the lift you get from Wheaties with milk and fruit. You're right as rain, Bob. No champ ever said a truer word about Wheaties. Breakfast of Champions. And you say this list of names was left on your desk accidentally? I believe so, Mr. Wade. Do you have any ideas? Well, it's hard to say. Mr. Philo left some papers from his briefcase. Mr. Philo? Uh, a science feature writer. I see. Uh, you were the leak on the story, then. Oh. Oh, yes, sir. I'm afraid I was. Uh, I didn't think it would be treated as a laughing stock. Uh, well, we'll deal with that later. Uh, what's uh, this Philo like? Well, he's... He's strange. Bald, thick glasses, tall. Uh, seems to know a great deal about scientific data, but being a science writer... Is there any other possibility? I don't know. But I do believe that this is all hooked up with the broadcast from Otterburn. That sir. seems like a very remote possibility. A missing persons bureau deals in remote possibilities, Mr. Wade. Henry, I do not require a statement of policy. What's the theory? Mr. Wade... <clears throat> I have discovered that each year literally thousands of persons vanish, leaving no trace. They are never located. Where do they go? Nobody knows. And? And they disappear in interesting cycles. What sort of cycles? Occupations, for example. One year we'll have a run on, uh, well, say, coal miners. Next year the proportion of engineers increases, then scientists... What do you think and... happens, Henry? Well, I don't know, Mr. Wade. But I'm beginning to suspect that somebody else has discovered the same phenomenon. Even to the point, perhaps, of being able to predict who will turn up among the missing next. Philo? I don't know. But I would like to find out. And you think Audubon may be a part of this picture? I definitely do, Mr. Wade. Henry, do you honestly expect me to buy an idea like that? Well, it's more than an idea. The two top men on this list are missing. Maybe so. <laughs> but the rest of them aren't. Parker, Watson, Gibbs. Well... Well, I saw Parker in the restaurant where I had lunch today. Yes, sir, but and if you look... don't... You think I'm going to make myself a laughing stock by putting any belief in such a crack brain theory? Well, you uh, admit... Excuse me. Yes. Hello, Wade speaking. Yes? Yes, I see. Uh, what name? Uh, just a moment. Henry, let me see that list again. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, here you are, sir. Go ahead. I see. I'll get back to you. I, uh, guess I owe you an apology, Henry. Yeah, sir? Carl Parker was just reported missing. A uh, Parker? The third man on your list. Holy mackerel. Exactly. Henry, perhaps I've underestimated you. Maybe this time you really stumble onto something. Uh, what do you intend to do, Mr. Wade? I don't know. I haven't thought it out yet. Uh, I was planning to listen for another broadcast tonight in the hope that Otterburn might try to contact us again. I'll uh, join you. Uh, <clears throat> I also invited Mr. Philo, the science feature writer. You well, know. I'll be glad to meet him. I'm beginning to get interested in your Mr. Philo. Mr. Wade, you don't think... That he's mixed up in this? I don't know, Henry. Uh, Mr. Wade, let, let's contact the police. No, Henry, I think we're better off keeping this between ourselves for the moment. I don't want the police slapping at the Bureau if you're wrong. I don't know, Mr. Wade. Besides, I... there may be more danger than you realize. 
Let's keep it quiet. Shall we, Henry? Yes, sir. I didn't realize there was any danger. Clark. Friend Mr. Filer was late. Uh, he said he'd be here, sir. The moon is almost in direct phase. If you can't wait much longer, you'd better switch on the set. Yes, sir. I left a light in the hall for Mr. Filer when he comes. Are you getting anything? Well, just some foreign Tonight's stuff. Programming from Johannesburg, South Africa. We continue in Africa. Oh, no, dear. That's a very peculiar transmission sound. That sounds like something. See if I can work a selector here. The moon is in phase. Yes, sir. Hello. Sir, can you hear me? Uh, I'll try to return. Uh, hello. 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 Uh, uh, hello, do you hear me? I get you now. Thank God. Uh, who are you? Can you hear me? Who are you? This is Professor Cornelius Otterburn. Hello? Uh, go on, go on. I hear you. Not much time. They're on today. They've located my sending point. You hear me? Go ahead. Keep talking. I've only enough oxygen for a few minutes more. Well, where are you? I'm on the Earth side of the moon. You get that? The Earth side of the moon. A volcanic crater. Good Lord. Start that recorder, Mr. Wade. Go on. Explain, please. Explain, please. Closely. There's an Earth colony on the moon. There is an Earth colony on the far side of the moon. Made up of renegade scientists and criminals. Professor Ernst Holtzman. Holtzman? He died in an insane asylum in 1938. Professor Ernst Holtzman discovered nuclear rocket power in 1935. Turned his plans over to escape inmates of the asylum. They took off and set up a colony on the far side of the moon in 1938. Go ahead. We're recording you. Each year, they recruit new colonists from Earth. Slave labor, mostly. Some women, scientists. The oxygen pro problem is a big one. I was kidnapped in 1945. Yes, we know. Keep talking. They wanted me to work on atomic drive with their flying disc. Hello? We're still getting you. Go on, go on. Uh, speak louder. We pulled what little oxygen we had. The others, they got to arrest you. You've got to stop them. Stop them. Stop who? The moon colony, planning to take over the Earth. Listen, they have agents on Earth. Hear me? Agents on Earth? Where? Who? Hello? Hello? Agents in... Henry, look out. There's a light. Someone at the window. Get down. Henry, are you all right? I... I, I think so. Oh, his, his shot smashed the transmitter. Strike a match. Careful. Whew, that was close. I got a look at him. From the description, it was your Mr. Philo. Well, we got a recording anyway, but not the most important part of the message. Henry, we've got to get you out of here. You said they have agents. Philo's probably one of them. He'll be looking for you now, trying to kill you. The police, you Mr. Think the police would believe a fantastic story like this? People being kidnapped to the moon as slave labor? Moon colony planning an invasion of the Earth? Henry, believe me, they'd clap us into straitjackets before we could finish. We've got to do something. We need time. Time to get proof. But we can't walk out of here. Philo's probably waiting. We can only figure some way. Wait, I know. How? Listen. There's a service elevator that leads to the basement garage. My car is there. Mr. Wade, let's By the time the police. police get here, we'll be dead. You think Philo will wait outside all night? This is the basement. Come on. Keep to the side. Yes, sir. Shh. Here's the car. All right, Henry. You open the garage door, then jump into the car. We'll make a dash for it. But where can we go? I have a farm outside Chevy Chase. It's private, miles from the nearest neighbor, and completely hidden by trees. We'll run for that. Go ahead, start the door. All right, Mr. Wade. Quick, jump in. Yes, sir. All right, here we go. Cross your fingers, Henry. We made it out, all right. Anything doing? 
Well, there's a blue coupe behind us. It uh, seems to be following. I'll cut up Pennsylvania Avenue and out Route 1 toward Baltimore. It... It is following. He turned with us. Can you go faster? Not much faster. He... He's gaining on us. I've got an idea. Hang on, Henry. Yes, sir. Why did you stop? Turn off the lights, quick. It worked. He shot right past us. Now we'll double back and go out another route. I think everything is going to be all right now. We can be at my farm in less than an hour. This place is really out in the wilderness, Mr. Wade. You can stay here indefinitely until we figure out the next move. Just up this dirt road now, there's a big abandoned wheat silo on my grounds. It's down in a hollow where it can't be seen except from the air. And even then, the oak trees shield it. It hides you out there. Now we can leave the car here. We'll leave it the sink. Come on. How did you ever find this place, Mr. Wade? I've always liked seclusion. Came up here to get away from it all. There's the silo. Well, it's certainly well hidden. There's a small door around the side. Come on. Yes, sir. Oh, careful of those bushes. It's hard to see them in the dark. Do you suppose Philo will find us? I assure you, Henry, that Mr. Philo will never find us here. Not in a million years. Here's the door. It's pitch dark. Hold my arm. I know the way. Just a few steps up, then another door. Yes, sir. Steel. This is an unusual silo. Double walls, wood outside, steel inside. Completely uh... fire. An army couldn't wreck it. We're inside the inner shell. Careful. You're in a circular room. Stay here a moment. I'll go outside and see if the coast is clear. In a moment, your eyes will become accustomed to the darkness. I'll bring back some food and water. Well, uh, don't be long, Mr. Wade. Uh, this place gives me the willies. I'll just be a moment. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Wade... Uh, Mr. Wade. I swear I hear something. Mr. Wade. What's that? There is something. Good Lord. There's someone in here. It's locked. Oh, no. Oh, oh this, this must be a light switch. Oh, thank God. No, oh, no. People. 10, 15, 20 of them. Mr. Wade. Help. Shout, Henry. M M Mr. Wade, where are you? Outside, speaking over the intercom. Mr. Wade, there are people in here. Fifteen or twenty of them. They're, they're sitting like statues just staring at me. They won't hurt you, Henry. They've all been drugged. They're even more helpless than you. Yes, but, but who are they? Permit me to introduce them, Henry, since they're currently unable to introduce themselves. The gentleman seated before you is Dr. Paul Ahrens, the astromathematician. Ahrens? Next to him is Mr. Robert Simons, electronic engineer. Names on the list? Yes. They've all been recruited for work with Professor Halsman's group on the moon. On the moon? Then you, 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 you're one of them? Of course. If you'll turn around, Henry, you'll recognize the drugged form of your old friend, Mr. Philo. Philo? But I, I thought... I, that he was I, part I, of the conspiracy? No, on the contrary. His stooping made it necessary for me to include him. Yes, but the man in the window, the one who fired the shots. An agent of mine. The pilot of the ship. Ship? What, what, what ship? This silo is a camouflage for a rocket launching platform. In a moment, the roof will slide back for the rocket's takeoff. A, a rocket ship? In exactly 70 hours, you and your companion will join Professor Otterburn on the moon. But you, 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 you can't do this to me. We have done it, Henry. No! You see, there was another name omitted from that list, which no. I carelessly mixed up with your papers. That of Henry Timken. No! Bon voyage. No, I, I won't let you do this. A 
attention, attention. Missing since eight o'clock last night, the following persons. Timken Henry, age 45, height five feet eight, brown eyes, slightly balding. Tonight, Dimension X has presented The Man in the Moon, an original story by George Lefferts. Featured players were Louis Van Ruten as Henry Timken and Santos Ortega as Wade. Your narrator was Norman Rose. Music by Albert Berman, engineer Bill Chambers. Dimension X is produced by Van Woodward and directed by Edward King. In a moment, we'll tell you about next week's show. And now, here is your Wheaties man, Frank Martin. Everybody knows whole wheat has vitamins and minerals in quantities. Sure, no great trouble figuring that out. The trick is in making the whole wheat into crisp, toasty flakes like Wheaties, with all the good whole wheat things still in them, and with all the good, natural whole wheat taste. Well, do you know how the Wheaties people do it? Well, I'll tell you. It's simple. They use a whole kernel of wheat to make one Wheaties flake. You see? No wonder Wheaties are good for you. And you know how good they taste. Crisp, sweet as a nut, simply wonderful. How can you stand missing them, if you are missing them, when they're all that good, and all that good for you? Why don't you breakfast up to Wheaties tomorrow morning, huh? And see for yourself how Wheaties at 7 can help at 11. Breakfast of champions. Yes, yes. Next week, a strange and thrilling story of the foreign underground, of a brilliant young scientist and his wife whose only chance for escape from the secret police lay in a world that is beyond infinity, the world of... Dimension X. And this is the Wheaties man, Frank Martin, inviting you to listen tomorrow night to Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers on the Wheaties Big Parade. See you then. This program was transcribed. Theater 5 presents In Absence of All Intelligent Life. Siddons. No. You can't sleep either, I see. No. I'd close my eyes and I'd think, tomorrow, Jeffries, you make history. One of the first men to set foot on an inhabitable planet. And the next thing I know, my eyes are popped open and I'm just staring up into the darkness. So you came up here to have another look at it. How did you know? <laughs> I'm afraid buck fever isn't restricted to the young. Ah, <laughs> oh, but it's beautiful, isn't it? Yes, it is. Look at how it hangs there in space. Motionless like a huge ball or a giant pearl. Luminescent and gray-green. Rich against the blackness of space. And the light of the stars beyond. Red and green and yellow against the black. Look, here on the radar. The land masses show up quite clearly now through the cloud layer. Oh, well, it's mostly water. No, well, more than three quarters of X 37J surface is covered with water. Yes, I keep forgetting. You think the land will be firm enough to set down on? <laughs> as dry as the land at home. No, no, you think with all that water, it'll all be spongy. Catch hut! Eddie! Dr. Siddons, I was just going to send for you. Oh, what's up? I don't know. We just got a report from the con that there's a blanket of pure metal satellites orbiting this planet. 
From the size of a house to the size of needles. Pure metal. Now, they could be manufactured. Here, let's see. Yes, I see. They are pure metal. Have we hit me yet? We're in the field now. The ship's okay? Our hull's designed to withstand 300 bombardments per second. What do you make of it? I don't know. It's very unusual for this larger concentration of satellites to be in the magnetic field of a planet. You mean somebody could have put it there? No, I didn't say that. But it is possible that these satellites were put there to act as a, as a barrier to incoming rocket ships. Yes, it is possible. But remember, meteorites are frequently pure metal. And they become satellites. There's probably life there. Not necessarily. Of course, we know this planet is capable of supporting life. Well, that's why we're going to explore it. But to jump to the conclusion that it's intelligent life and hostile to our exploration, well, it's not only unscientific, it's completely unfounded at this point. It may be that the belt of satellites around this planet might be due to natural, entirely natural causes, one we, uh, ones we hadn't anticipated. But to say there are people down there such as ourselves is something we can't possibly know until we've landed. Well, I'm going to sensitize the ship's defense system and post orders for the landing party to carry weapons. A wise precaution. In the meantime, it's five hours till touchdown. I suggest you gentlemen get some sleep while you can. I have a feeling you're going to need it. Once we land. One hundred fifty thousand from touchdown. Rate of fall zero six six zero. So far, so good. One hundred forty five from touchdown. Rate of fall, zero. If they had any anti-rocket devices, eight, they would have sent three, them up by now. We're well into their atmosphere. Hmm? Yes, unless they're planning some sort of trap. Letting us land so they can capture us intact once we're on the ground. If anybody's down there. We've been monitoring the radio frequencies since last night. There hasn't been a sound. Whatever life is down there, I'm sure we'll be able to handle. 110,000 feet from touchdown. Rate of fall. I see you're zero, keeping to the edge six, of the landmass. Yes, I want you to be able to five. get your ocean samples without a lot of traveling. Uh, may I suggest you set down where that large river empties into the sea? That way I can take freshwater samples as well. See, uh, there on that peninsula. You think it's big enough? Why? Make it out to be about two miles wide. Plenty of room for us. Jeffrey's. What's the spectrographic reading for that peninsula? A solid mineral. Granite-like composition. Well, that should support us. Well, it's not a peninsula, sir. It's an island. See here how the river cuts around it at the north end, cutting it off from the main body of land? Well, that makes it all the better. And it's small enough, surrounded by water on four sides, makes it easier to defend if there are hostiles down there. 100,000 feet from touchdown. Rate of fall, zero, seven, nine... Zero. Collins, all to the course for that island. Aye, aye, sir. Uh, Dr. Siddons, there's something funny about that island. Look here on the spectrograph. Oh. What is it? Well, look. Now, the whole thing shows up gray, solid mineral, except for this square patch of green. The only spot on the whole island. Nothing unusual about that. See, the green is gray underneath, merely indicating vegetation covering the minerals grass or trees. Well, yes, but why this one spot and why so perfectly oblong? Look, the sides and corners are laid out sharp as a parade ground. He's right, you know. Nature couldn't lay out anything as geometric as that. It has to have been made by intelligent beings. You suppose it's some sort of uh, sacred ground, a place for religious ceremony? Uh, let's not let superstition run away with our better judgment. Well, yes, but look, Dr. Siddons, the whole island's cross-hatched into squares. That green patch is the only unmarked place on it. You're right. The island has been scored with lines following some sort of plan, like streets. 
See how they extend on the other side of the rivers. Perhaps this isn't the best place to land, Captain. 80,000 feet from touchdown. Rate of fall, zero, seven, nine, zero. We're too far down to blast up again. I can't waste the fuel. Captain, the radar altimeter is giving me a hodgepodge of readings for that island. The only level place is that green patch of ground. Maybe we should try to land on either side of the river, uh, on, the, on the mainland. That's just as bad. Nothing level over there either. Whatever that patch of ground is, sacred ground or what, we're going to be in the middle of it. Set your sights for the middle of that green, Collins. Man your stations, men. We're taking her in. Well, gentlemen, we made it. The new world. Keep your eyes open. See any movement? No. It looks like we've landed in the middle of a huge religious grounds. We're ringed completely by... What are they, Dr. Siddons? Monuments? No. No, they're too big for that. I imagine they're buildings of some sort. See all those little windows cut in them? They must be dwelling places. Hmm. Then there's no question that there are creatures on this planet. No. Then where is everybody? That's a good question. Well, they could have been scared away by the roar of our landing rockets. Maybe they evacuated this place when they saw us coming and they're waiting for us to get on the ground so they can attack us with whatever weapons they use. Mm. What are you going to do? The only thing we can do. Suit up and go outside. It's obvious they aren't coming to meet us, so we'll have to go out and see if we can make contact. Everybody be suited up and ready to leave the ship by 0800. Everyone carries a signed weapon. Please, Captain. You were the first person to set foot on this new world. I'd like to be the first one to breathe its air. Well, all right. But be careful. Come on in, boys. The water's fine. Hear that, Collins? We got it made. Boy, oh boy. I hear you, Lieutenant. All right, knock it off. This is a military reconnaissance, not a picnic. There's life on this planet, but until we make contact with it, it's the enemy. Lieutenant Jeffries? Yes, sir. You take the doctor and the two men and reconnoiter to the east as far as the river. I'll go as far as the river to the west. When you get through, double back here and report. Aye, aye, sir. You 
see anything, Doc? No. We've been lying here so long, staring at those empty openings so long. Windows. All right, all right, windows, you call them. I feel like there's a million pairs of eyes staring back at us. What do you suppose they look like? Who? The creatures we're after. Haven't any idea. Oh, it's weird hunting for a creature you don't know what they might look like. Yeah. Well, we could lie here forever. Such crude dwellings. They must have lived one on top of the other. Yeah, if we're ever going to see them, we're going to have to dig them out. Any volunteers to go with me? I'll go. All right. All right, the rest of you stay here. Now keep us covered. If anything happens, don't be afraid to shoot into us. Mm -hmm. Now, Doc, when I give the word, we'll run across this street and don't stop until we come to the wall of the first building, right? Right. Are you ready? Okay. Then now! So far, so good. Now, over there. Right. Just above your head, there's one of their windows. But it's filled with plastic. Uh, see if I can break it. You can shatter plastic. I can try. Boy, it's nothing but glass. Old-fashioned glass. Yeah. Hello in there. Anybody home? Move along the wall. There's a kind of doorway up ahead, I think. Hmm. It's unlocked. Push it open with your weapon. And careful. Yeah. Hello? Anybody home? Okay, Doc. Let's move in cautiously, but keep your eyes open. There's one. Where? Over there. Stop! Stop! What? It's an effigy of some sort. See, it isn't living. It's a statue of some kind. You see, it's... Made out of some sort of alloy. You sure? Yes. Suppose that's what they look like? Well, uh, I imagine so. Animals aren't given to making statues of themselves. Boy, what ugly-looking creatures. You suppose that's the head? Yes. You see, these must be the arms, and uh, these are clearly the legs. <laughs> look how close together the eyes are and those stick-like legs. I almost hope we don't run into one. I don't think we will. What do you mean by that? Not in this city, at least. Look at the gray dust on the floor. It's almost two inches thick. I noticed the same in the street. If there are any of these monstrosities left, they aren't here. This city hasn't been used for a long, long time. Maybe a thousand years. Lieutenant Jeffries reporting, sir. Go ahead, Lieutenant. We've completed the island reconnaissance, sir, as per your instructions. And you found? Nothing. No life of any sort. Not a thing? Uh-uh. Just miles and miles of twisted, stunted vegetation and a couple more of those huge radioactive burns. Same kind we found a hundred miles south and west of here. Collins, your receivers picked up anything yet? No, sir. We've been monitoring all frequencies since we've been here and not a sound. Nothing but random radio interference from outer space. What about the television satellites we sent up? They've covered the surface of this planet a hundred times, sir, and not a sign of movement anywhere. Well, Dr. Siddons, what do you make of it? It, um, it might be unethical for me to venture an opinion at this time. Oh, come on now, Doctor. You must have some idea. You've been poking around these ruins for the last ten days. You must have drawn some conclusion. Well, as you know, this planet was at one time inhabited by living creatures... Much like ourselves, no matter how repulsive they may appear to us. They were biped, carnivorous, possessed a certain amount of intelligence. Well, uh, what happened to them? 
Well, in order to understand what happened to them, you have to understand the creatures themselves. As I've said, they were very primitive and very superstitious. True, they had advanced from the Stone Age to the threshold of nuclear energy, but culturally and morally, well, they hadn't got much beyond the Iron Age. So then they discovered the tremendous power of nuclear energy. Exactly. The very first use they made of it was to blow a few million of their fellow creatures off the face of the planet. Savages. Yeah, but they didn't destroy everything. The city's still standing. Well, as far as I can figure out, it didn't hold any military targets. Well, but what happened to the creatures in it? They were killed off by radiation fallout. Well, it's still radioactive. Why didn't the radiation kill us off? Well, for one thing, it's cooled off considerably since then. And for another thing, we're used to it. They never had a chance. Well, that's it. We've got enough to make a report when we get back. Secure for blast off at 1,800 hours tonight. Got everything tied down and ready. That's all, gentlemen. Doctor, you were able to crack their language, weren't you? <laughs> I wasn't able to. My computers were. It was a relatively simple task. Well, what did they call this place? You mean the planet? The civilization? No, 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 no. I mean, this island, this city or whatever it was. Well, of course, it was a proper name, so it was meaningless to us. But I can reproduce the sounds they made as they spoke them. They called this place New York. Theater 5 has presented In Absence of All Intelligent Life, written by George Bamber, directed by Warren Somerville. In the cast, William Redfield, Cliff Carpenter, Guy Sorrell, and Peter Rattray. Script editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlastatsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Mr. Lee Bowman. We invite your comments. Write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. That's Theater 5, New York 23, New York. Fred Foy speaking. This has been an ABC Radio Network production.